Book 2. The Salamander of Lisieux. This Norman city, which boasts so many timbered houses with overhanging upper stories, offers, in its respect for the past, Lisieux, amongst so many other curiosities, a pretty and very interesting alchemist dwelling. A modest house, indeed, but which proves the concern for humility that the happy beneficiaries of the hermetic treasure had vowed to respect throughout their entire life. It is generally designated under the name of Manor of the Salamander and occupies the number 19 on the Rue Au Fevre, PL. 4. Despite our research, it has been impossible for us to obtain the slightest information about its first owners. They are unknown. No one knows, in Lisieux or elsewhere, by whom it was built, nor who were the artists that decorated it in the 16th century. Without a doubt, the salamander jealously guards its secret and that of the alchemist. However, in 1834, it was the subject of a notice, but this one was limited to the mere description of the subject sculpted on the tourist-attracting facade. This notice and the sculptures inspired an entry in the statistical monograph of the Calvados, by Mr. de Camon, Lisieux, Volume 5, representing all that has been published on the manner of the salamander. It is little, and we regret it, for the minuscule, yet delightful hotel, built by the will of a true adept, decorated with motifs borrowed from hermetic symbolism, to the traditional allegory, deserves better. Well known to the people of Lisieux, it is ignored by the general public, perhaps even by many art enthusiasts, although its decoration, partly by its originality, partly by the erudition and the vegetal decoration of certain motifs, deserve the attention of connoisseurs. The abundance and variety as well as its fine preservation, allow it to be ranked among the finest buildings of its kind. There is an annoying gap, and we shall try to fill it by emphasizing once more the artistic value of this elegant dwelling and the initiatory instruction that emanates from its sculptures. The study of the motifs on the façade allows us to assert, with the conviction born of patient analysis, that the constructor of the manor was an educated alchemist, having demonstrated the extent of his talent, among other terms, as an adept in possession of the philosopher's stone. We also assert that his affiliation with some esoteric center, having, with the scattered order of the Templars, numerous points of contact, is, revealed to be indisputable. But what could this secret fraternity be, which honored itself by counting among its members the learned philosopher of Lisieux? We are forced to confess our ignorance and leave the question open. However, and although we have an invincible repugnance for the thesis, the plausibility, the report of dates, and the proximity of certain places suggest certain conjectures, which we will expose under the most strict reserve. About a century before the construction of the manor of Lisieux, alchemist companions were laboring at Fleurs, Warn, and were working on the great work, in 1420. They were Nicolas de Grosparmy, a gentleman, Nicolas or Noel Valois, also called Le Valois, and a priest by the name of Pierre Vicot or Vicot. The latter also referred to himself as chaplain and domestic servant of the Lord of Grosparmy. Only de Grosparmy had some fortune, with the title of squire and that of Count of Fleurs. Yet, it was Valois who discovered the practice of the work and taught it to his companions, as he explains in his five books. He was then about 55 years old, which sets back the date of his birth to the year 1375. The three adepts wrote various works between the years 1440 and 1450. None of these books has ever been printed. According to a note attached to manuscript number 158, 125, of the Library of Rennes, it would be a Norman gentleman, Mr. Bois Geoffroy, who would have inherited all the original treatises of Nicolas de Grosparmy, Valois, and Vica. He sold the complete copy to the late Mr. the Count of Fleurs, for 1,500 pounds and a prized horse. This Count of Fleurs, Fleurs and Baron de Tracy as Louis de Pelve, died in 1660, great-great-grandson on the female side of Pelve, from whom the author Grosparmy claimed descent. But these three adepts, who resided and worked in Fleurs during the first half of the 15th century, are cited without any valid reason as belonging to the 16th century. In the Wren Library copy, it is, however, clear that they inhabited the Fleurs castle, of which Grosparmy was clearly the owner and proprietor, where they drew the philosophical work and composed their books. The initial error, whether conscious or not, came from an anonymous, author of notes titled Remarks, written in the margins of a few manuscript copies of the works. This Grosparmy, who belonged to the chemist Chevroil, without further checking the whimsical chronology of these notes, gave them as dates, systematically set back by a century, which all the authors, following his lead, repeated the error, and all, marching in his wake, perpetuated the unforgivable mistake. We will briefly re-establish the truth. Alfred de Kayaks died in 1660, 
after having said that Louis de Pelve died in the distress of Caix, adds, according to the document which proceeds, the Fleur's castle would have been acquired by Nicolas de Grosparmy, but the author of remarks is here in contradiction with Mr. de la Ferriere, who cites a deed of 1404 where Raoul de Grosparmy appears as lord of the place. Nothing is true, if not he was indeed the lord of Beauville and of Fleur's, and even though we don't know by what title he became the owner, this fact cannot be doubted. Raoul de Grosparmy, writes Count Hector de la Ferriere, must be the father of Nicolas de Grosparmy, who, from Marie de Roux, left three sons, Jean de Grosparmy, Guillaume and Mataron de Grosparmy, and a daughter, Guillemette de Grosparmy, married on January 8, 1496, to Germain de Grimouville. At that date, Nicolas de Grosparmy was dead, and Jean de Grosparmy, Baron of Fleurs, his eldest son, and Guillaume de Grosparmy, his second son, gave to their sister, in consideration of her marriage, 300 livres tournois, cash money, and an annuity of 20 livres per year, redeemable for the price of 400 livres tournois. So, it is clearly established from the dates indicated on the deeds that the manuscripts of Grosparmy and Valois are meticulously copied from various authentic and absolutely accurate originals. Hence, we could spare ourselves the search for biographical and chronological concordance regarding Nicolas Valois, since it has been demonstrated that this was the companion and commensal of the Lord Count of Fleurs. But it also helps to uncover the origin of the error attributed to the annotator, so poorly informed, of the manuscripts of Chevroil. Let us say immediately that it could arise from a regrettable homonymy, unless our anonymous person, by juggling all the dates, wanted to give honor to Nicolas Valois of the sumptuous Hotel of Caen, built by one of his successors. Nicolas Valois is reputed to have acquired, towards the end of his life, the four estates of Escaville, Fontaines, Mainil Guillaume, and de Monteville. However, this statement is not at all proven, no document confirms it, except for the gratuitous affirmation subject to caution by the aforementioned remarks. The old alchemist, the craftsman of the fortune of Lavalois and the lords of Escaville, lived wisely, according to the precepts of philosophical discipline and morals. He who wrote, in 1445, for his son, that patience is the philosopher's ladder and humility is the gate to their garden, could hardly follow the example and lead the life of the powerful without failing his convictions. It is therefore probable that at the age of seventy, devoid of any other material preoccupation than that of his works, he concluded at the castle of Fleurs a life of labor, calm, and simplicity, in the company of the two friends with whom he had accomplished the great work. His last years were, in fact, devoted to the writing of works intended to perfect the scientific education of his son, known only under the epithet of pious and noble knight, to whom Pierre Vicot provided oral initiatory instruction. It is indeed Vicot who is the effective author of the instruction in this passage from the Valois manuscript, in the name of God the Almighty, no, my beloved son, the intention of nature by the powerful statements here and after declared, when, at the end of my days, my body is ready to relinquish my soul, do not wait for the hour of the Lord and the last breath, wish me to leave you like a testament and last will, this paper by which are taught several very good things regarding our art. Nicolas Valois is reputed to have acquired, towards the end of his life, the four estates of Escaville, Fontaines, Mainil Guillaume, and de Monteville. This fact, however, is not at all proven, no document confirms it, other than the gratuitous affirmation which should be treated with caution by the author of the aforementioned remarks. The old alchemist, craftsman of the fortune of Lavalois and lords of Escaville, lived wisely, according to philosophical discipline and moral precepts. The one who wrote in 1445, for his son, that patience is the ladder of philosophers, and humility is the door to their garden, could hardly follow the example nor lead the life of the powerful without failing his convictions. It is therefore probable that at seventy years old, devoid of any other material preoccupation than that of his works, he ended at the castle of Fleurs an existence of labor, calm, and simplicity, in the company of the two friends with whom he had realized the great work. His last years were indeed devoted to the writing of works destined to perfect the scientific education of his son, known only under the epithet of pious and noble knight, to whom Pierre Vicot gave oral initiatory instruction. It is actually Vicot who is the direct author of the instruction in this passage from the manuscript of Valois, in the name of the all-powerful God, be aware, my very beloved son, of the intention of nature by the powerful teachings hereafter declared, when, at the end of my days, my body ready to abandon my soul, do not wait for the hour of the Lord and the final breath, wish me to leave to you as a testament and last will, this paper through which are taught several beautiful things concerning our very noble metallic transmutation. The five books of Nicolas Valois, 
at the beginning of which appears the passage dated 1445, doubtlessly the date of their completion, lead the author to believe that the alchemist, contrary to what the anonymous author of remarks suggests, did not die at an advanced age. One might suppose that he, learned and instructed according to the rules of hermetic wisdom, should elevate himself if he had inherited the property of a Scaville, or even just to touch the revenues of the lands engaged in writing does not come to us. Whatever the case may be, and although no written testimony comes to us to fill this gap, one thing remains certain, it is that the adept alchemist, himself, never had built all or part of the domain, there is no evidence of such a process for the care of his burial, and he did not, in the end, know if he lived at Fleurs, as he could have established his residence in Caen. It is probably at the first Manuel Guillaume and other places that the Lord of Escaville, from the Hotel du Grand Cheval, carried out the construction project by Nicolas Lavalois, his eldest son, in the city of Caen. In any case, we know of Nicolas Valois, first of the name, grandson of Nicolas, that he was on March 24, 1511, elegantly clad in brigandine and salad helmet, at the mount of the noble bailiwick of Caen, following a certificate of the lieutenant general of said bailiwick, dated the same year. Nicolas Lavalois, Lord of Escaville and of Manuel Guillaume, left Nicolas Lavalois, Esquire, Lord of Escaville, born in Caen on September 18, 1536, married on April 7, 1534 to Marie Duval, who gave birth to Louis de Valois, Esquire, Lord of Escaville, born in Caen and King's Councillor Secretary. So it is Nicolas Le Valois, great-grandson of the alchemist of Fleurs, who undertook the construction of the Hotel de Scaville, which required about 10 years, from around 1530 to 1540. It is the same Nicolas Le Valois whom our anonymous author, perhaps misled by the similarity of names, attributes the works of Nicolas Valois, his ancestor, by transferring to Caen what was in Fleurs for a theatre. According to De Bras, Les Recherches et Antiquité de la Ville de Caen, p. 132, Nicolas Le Valois would have died young, in the year 1541, on Friday, the day of the kings, the year 1541, writes the old historian, Nicolas Le Valois, Lord of Escaville, Fontaines, Mamille Guillaume at Monteville, the richest of the town lords, as he was about to sit at his table, in the hall of the pavilion of this beautiful and superb house, near the Carrefour Saint-Pierre, which he had built the preceding year, while eating an oyster at the fish stall, aged about 47 years, fell suddenly dead from an apoplexy that suffocated him. He died suddenly, in the locality, the Hôtel de Scaville under the name of Hôtel du Grand Cheval, according to the testimony of Vocalon de Avatos, Nicolas Lavalois, its owner, would have achieved the great work there, in the city where the hieroglyphics of Saint-Pierre still stand, which one can still see today, in the square where there is a large and beautiful stone fountain, and facing the science. So there would be hieroglyphs in that name, the Fountain of Beaupère, in the sculptures of the Hotel du Grand Cheval. It would then be possible that all these details, which seem incoherent, had a very precise significance for the author of the construction and for all the adepts of ancient Hermeticism, the formulas of the Hermetic philosophers, mages, and the Kabbalists. Unfortunately, of all the statues that decorated this elegant house, the main piece, from an alchemical point of view, the one which, placed above the door, captured the gaze of the passerby and had given its name to the house, the Grand Cheval, described and celebrated by all contemporary authors, no longer exists today. It was pitilessly broken in 1793. In his work titled Les Origines de Caen, Daniel Hewitt maintains that the equestrian statue belonged to a scene of the apocalypse, ch. 19, v. 11, against the opinion of Bardou, priest of Cormels, who saw Pegasus, and de la Roque, who recognized in it the effigy of Hercules. In a letter addressed to Daniel Hewitt by the keeper of the Duke Query, this one told him that the figure of the great horse which is at the frontispiece of the Maison of M. Le Valois de Scaville is not, as M. de la Roque thought, and after him several others, Hercules, it is a vision of the apocalypse. This is confirmed by the inscription that is underneath. On the thigh of this horseman are written these words of the apocalypse, Rex Regum et Dominus Dominantium, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, another correspondent of the learned man of Avranche, the Dr. Dubour, entered into these particularities. To answer your letter, he wrote, I must begin by telling you that there are two representations in bar relief. One is on top, where the great horse in the air, with clouds beneath its feet in front, is depicted. The man on top had a long sword in hand, nothing else, he holds in his right hand a bouquet of lilies, above and behind him, it seems in the air the sun. Under the round of the door, there is, 
underneath, an angel in the position of the man on horseback, small, on a pile of dead bodies that the birds eat. It is turned towards the east, opposite the horse, at its chest, is the false prophet represented, and the dragon has several heads, and the riders against whom the rider seems to go. It turns the head behind, as if to see the representation of the false prophet and the dragon, who enters into an old castle, from which flames come out, in which he is half and already. There is writing on the thigh of the great rider, and at several places, like the king of kings, the lord of lords, and others taken from chapter 19 of the Apocalypse. As these letters are not very deeply engraved, I believe that they were not written there long ago, but I think they have been engraved where it is written, and his name is the word of God. Our intention is not to undertake here the study of the symbolic commentary loaded with expressing or exposing the principal arcanas of science. This philosophical dwelling, very well known, subject to be described, may be the subject of personal interpretations by enthusiasts of the sacred art. We will limit ourselves to pointing out some particularly instructive and interesting figures. First of all, the dragon of the mutilated tympanum of the entrance door, on the left, under the peristyle which precedes the staircase of the lantern. On the side facade, two beautiful statues, representing David and Judith, must retain attention. The latter is accompanied by a handful of the epic. Our intention is not to undertake here the study of the symbolic commentary charged with expressing or exposing the main arcanas of science. This philosophical residence, well known and often described, may become the subject of personal interpretations by the enthusiasts of the sacred art. We will limit ourselves to pointing out some figures that are particularly instructive and worthy of interest. First, the dragon of the mutilated tympanum of the entrance door, on the left, under the peristyle that precedes the staircase of the lantern. On the lateral facade, two beautiful statues, representing David and Judith, must retain attention, the latter is accompanied by a verse from the era. Here is seen the portrayal of Judith the Virtuous as by a noble action she cut off the smoky head of Holofernes who had afflicted the fortunate Jerusalem. Above these large figures, two scenes are observed, one depicting the punishment of Europe, the other the deliverance of Andromeda by Perseus, both of which have an analogous meaning to that of the defeat of the fabulous creature of Degenera, followed by the death of Nessos, which we will analyze further while discussing the myth of Adam and Eve. In another pavilion, there is, on the intermediate rise of a window, Marsyas Victus Omnia Dissit. Here, at the foot of the Borpair Pavilion, near an automobile central office, between Apollo and Marsyas, in which figure, of compass quality, the instrument bearers we distinguished higher up. Finally, to top it all off, above the lantern, a small figure, today very frayed, in which Mr. Sauvagin, several years ago, believed he could recognize Apollo, god of day and light, and, below the dome of the great lantern, under the small open-air temple, the very recognizable statue of Priapus. We would be, for example, added the author, quite embarrassed to explain what precise significance must be attributed to the character with a serious physiognomy, wearing a turban, to the one who emerges so vigorously from a painted eye, while his arm crosses. The thickness of the entablature, to a very strong representation of Saint Cecilia playing the theorbo, to the ironwork at the bottom of the windows, missing several pieces, if not for a service decoration, with the motto, labor improvis omnia vincit. It may have been otherwise futile, for the sense of all these sculptures, to inquire into the tendencies of the spirit and the habitual occupations of the one who had so lavishly lavished them on his house. The Lord of Escaville was one of the richest men in Normandy, and what is less known is that for some time he had devoted himself with passionate ardor to the mysterious researches of alchemy. From this succinct exposition, we must especially remember that there existed in Fleurs, in the 15th century, a nucleus of hermetic philosophers, that these could have formed disciples, which is confirmed by the science transmitted to the successors of Nicolas Valois, the lords of Escaville, and created an initiatory center, that the city of Caen, being at a distance almost equal from Fleurs and Lisieux, it would be possible that the adept in retreat at the manor of the salamander, had received his first instruction. E.L. 1 Jewel. Champagne. Lisieux. Manoir de L.A. Salamandre. Port Dentry. 16 Slechel. Instruction from some master belonging to the occult group of Fleurs or Khan. In this hypothesis, there is neither material impossibility nor improbability, but we could not, however, attribute more value to it than what can be expected from this kind of suppositions. Therefore, we ask the reader to accept it as we present it, that is to say with all the desirable circumspection, and as a simple probability. Here we are at the entrance, long since closed, of the pretty manor, the beauty of the style, the happy choice of motifs, 
The delicacy of the execution make this little door one of the most agreeable examples of wood sculpture of the 16th century. It is a joy for the artist, as much as a treasure for the alchemist, that this hermetic paradigm exclusively dedicated to the symbolism of the dry path, the only one that the authors have reserved without providing an explanation, pl. v. But, in order to be more sensitive to the students of particular value, the first emblems analyzed, we will respect the order of work, without letting ourselves be guided by considerations of architectural logic or aesthetic order. On the tympanum of the door with sculpted panels, there is an interesting allegorical group composed of a lion and a lioness facing each other. They both hold, with their front paws, a human mask personifying the sun, surrounded by a vine rolled up as a mirror handle. Lion and lioness, male and female principles, reflect the physical expression of the two natures, of a semi-credible shape, as the art does at the beginning of the practice. From their union, achieved according to certain rules, comes this double nature, mixed material that the wise have named androgyne, their hermaphrodite or mirror of the art. It is this substance, both positive and negative, patient containing its own agent, which is the base, the foundation of the great work, of these two natures, carefully separated, the one that plays the role of the female material is alone signed and architecturally numbered. You see the carpenter during the framing, signed at the same time, under a beam of the upper floor. You see the figure of a dragon with a tail curled in a loop. This dragon is the image and symbol of the primitive and volatile body, the true and unique subject on which one must first work. The philosophers have given it a multitude of names, outside of that under which it is vulgarly known. This is what has caused and still causes so much embarrassment, so much confusion to beginners, especially those who care little for principles and are unaware of how far the possibilities of nature can extend. Despite the general opinion which holds that our subject has never been designated, we affirm, on the contrary, that many works mention it and that all describe it. But if it is cited by the good authors, one could not assert that it is emphasized or expressly shown. Often, it is even found classified among the rejected bodies, as inappropriate or foreign to the work. A classic process that the adepts use to keep away the profane and deny them entry to the secret of their garden. Its traditional name, Philosopher's Stone, depicts quite well the body to serve as a useful base for its identification. It is, indeed, a true stone, because it presents, at the exit of the mind, the character's exterior to all minerals, the chaos of sages, in which the four elements are confused. It's the tumult and disorder. This is not the old man and the father of metals, those before him must originate, since it represents the first metallic terrestrial manifestation. It is our arsenic, cadmium, antimony, bismuth, blend, galena, cinnabar, colcothair, oricalcum, realgar, orpiment, calamine, tutia, tartar, etc. All these materials, by the hermetic voice, have paid homage to their king. By the black dragon covered with scales, venomous serpent, daughter of Saturn and the most loved of her children, this primary substance has seen its uninterrupted evolution by the interposition and penetration of an infect and combustible sulfur, which by interlacing and penetrating pure mercury, retains and coagulates it. And, although it is entirely volatile, this primitive mercury, under the cicative action of arsenical sulfur, takes on the appearance of a solid, black, dense, fibrous, brittle mass, which becomes vile, abject and despicable in the eyes of men, of little use, poor parent of the family of metals. In the subject, however, there is a need for the artist to elaborate on this great work, because there is a need to begin and perfect it at the beginning and at the end of the work. Also, the ancient authors, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of creation, how do they compare it to the chaos of the elements and the principles? Confused, intertwined, darkness and light on each other, it is for this reason that they had to react to one another. That is why the artist depicts symbolically in his soil the first being under the figure of a symbolic assemblage of materials from Mother Earth, this hermetic globe, this mass assembled without order, without shape, our microcosm, mirror and reflection of the macrocosm, without rhythm or measure. The chaos of the primordial, destined, by divine will, to the renewal, profoundly elementary in the three kingdoms, but a sequence of mysterious constants has oriented and directed it towards the mineral kingdom. Thus informed and specified, subjected to the laws governing evolution and mineral progression, this chaos, having become body, contains indistinctly the purest seed and the closest substance there is of minerals and metals. The philosophical matter is therefore of mineral and metallic origin. However, it should only be sought in the mineral and metallic root, which, as Basil Valentine says in the Book of the Twelve Keys, was reserved by the Creator and promised to the generation of metals alone. Consequently, 
He who seeks the sacred stone of the philosophers with the hope of finding the small world and foreign substances to the mineral and metallic kingdom, that one will never reach the end of his designs. And it is to divert the apprentice from the path of error that the ancient authors teach him to always follow nature, because nature only acts in the species that is its own. It develops and perfects only within itself and by itself, without any heterogeneous thing coming to hinder its march or counteract the effect of its generative power. At the doorpost of the guardhouse, in the high reliefs, a subject catches and holds the attention. It depicts a man richly attired in purple with sleeves, wearing a type of mortarboard, and a chest emblazoned with a shield showing a six-pointed star. This figure, a person of condition, stands on the lid of a urn with sometimes repelled and sometimes raised decorations, indicating, according to the custom of the Middle Ages, the content of the vessel. It is the substance which, during the sublimations, rises above the water, that it overtops like an oil. It is the Hyperion and the vitriol of Basil Valentine, the green lion of Ripley and Jacques Tesson, in a word the true unknown of the great problem. This knight, of fair appearance and heavenly lineage, is no stranger to us. Several hermetic engravings have made him familiar. Solomon Trismason, in the Toysen door, shows him standing, his feet placed on the edges of two vases filled with water, which translate the origin and the source of this mysterious fountain, water of double nature and property, derived from the milk of the Virgin and the blood of Christ, igneous water and aqueous fire, virtue of the two baptisms about which it is spoken in the Gospels. For me, I baptize you in water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He has his fan in hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable, the manuscript of the philosopher Solidonius. The same subject is reproduced under the image of a chalice full of water, from which two figures emerge at half-body, in the center of a composition quite smothered summarizing the work of the Azoth, sufficiently evoking the parable of St. John's Eagle, which is an immense angel, one foot on the earth and the other on the sea, while the Apocalypse, which carries in the right hand the flame of fire and compresses, in the left, a large bellows of air, clear figures of the quaternity of the first elements, earth, water, air, fire. The body of this angel, whose wings replace the head, is covered by the seal of the open book, adorned with the cabalistic star and the seven-worded motto of the vitriol, visita interior terrae, rectificando, in venisa cultum lapidine, visit the innermost parts of the earth, by rectification, you will find the hidden stone, I then saw, says St. John, another strong and powerful angel descending from heaven, clothed with a cloud, with a rainbow upon his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like columns of fire. He had in his hand a little open book, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the voice which I had heard from heaven spoke unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. This product, allegorically expressed by the angel or man, dash, the attribute of Saint Matthew the Evangelist, is none other than the mercury of philosophers, of a double nature and quality, partly fixed and material, partly volatile and spiritual, which is enough to begin, complete, and multiply the work. This is the one and only material we need, without worrying about acquiring any other. But it is necessary to know, in order not to err, that it is from this mercury and its acquisition that the authors generally begin their treatises. It is he who is the mother and root of gold, and not the metal precious, absolutely useless and without application in the path we study. Irony Philolethe says, with much truth, that our mercury, barely mineral, is even less metallic, because it does not contain the spirit or the metallic seed, while the body tends to move away from the mineral quality. However, it is the spirit of gold, enclosed in a transparent oil, easily coagulable, the salt of metals, for every stone is salt, and the salt of our stone, because the stone of philosophers, which is this mercury we speak of, is the subject of it. From the Confusion
and called it niter or saltpeter, salpetri, salt of stone, and copied the symbol of one on the image of the other. Moreover, its crystalline structure, its physical resemblance to molten salt, its transparency allowed it to be assimilated with salts and has had all names attributed to it. It serves, in turn, according to the will or the fantasy of the scribes, as sea salt, and as the gem salt, the salt of sal ammoniac, the salt of Saturn, the salt of salts. It is also the famous green vitriol, the oil of vitriol, which Pantheus describes as being the chrysocala, others the borax or atankar, the Roman vitriol, because Romueta, the Greek name of the eternal city, signifies strength, vigor, power, domination, the mineral of Pierre-Jean Fabre, because in it, he says, there is or why vit, vitriol. It is also named Proteus, because of its metamorphoses during work, and also chameleon, chi alpha mu alpha iota lambda omega nu, lion rampant, because it has successively taken the colors of all these substances. Now, the last decorative subject of our door, it is a salamander serving as a capital to the twisted column of the right leg. She seems to us, in some way, the protected fairy of this pleasant dwelling, for we find her sculpted on the corbel of the median pillar, at the ground floor, and up to the dormer of the attic. It would even seem, given the deliberate, repetition of the symbol, that our alchemist had a marked preference for this heraldic representation. We do not pretend to insinuate by that, that it might have had the erotic and coarse sense so prized by Francois I. This would be to insult the artisan, to dishonor science, to outrage truth at the instar of the debauchee of high race, but of low intellectuality. But a singular trait of the human character carries man to cherish more than for which he has suffered and toiled the most. This reason would undoubtedly allow us to explain the triple use of the salamander, hieroglyph of the secret fire of the sages. It is indeed among the annex products entering the work as helpers or servants. None is of a search more thankless or identification more laborious than this one. Yet, in the preparations, in place of the required adjuvants, certain substitutes capable of providing a similar result may be used. However, in the elaboration of mercury, nothing could substitute for the secret fire, a spirit capable of animating it, of exalting it, and of making body with it, after having extracted it from the filthy matter. I would pity you greatly, writes Le Mojone de Saint Didier, if, like me, after having known the true matter, you spent fifteen whole years entirely in work, in study and in meditation, without being able to extract from the stone the precious juice that it contains within, for lack of knowing the secret fire of the sages, which causes this plant so dry and arid in appearance to produce a water that does not wet the hands. Without it, without this fire hidden under a saline form, the prepared material could neither be vivified nor fulfill its motherly functions, and our labor would remain forever chimerical in vain. Every generation asks for the aid of a proper agent, determined by the rain in which nature has placed it, and everything carries seed. Animals come from an egg or a fertilized ovule, plants from a grain made prolific. Similarly, minerals and metals have for seed a metallic liquor fertilized by the mineral fire. B.L. Lisieux, Manoir de la Salamandre, 16 siècle la salamandre et les deux dragons de la lucarne. So this is the active agent introduced by art into the mineral seed, and it is he, Philolethes tells us, who first turns the wheel and sets the wheel in motion. From this, it is easy to understand the utility of this metallic light, invisible, mysterious, and with what care we must seek to know it, to distinguish it by its specific, essential, and hidden qualities. Salamander, in Latin salmandra, comes from sal, salt, and from mandra, which signifies stable, and also rock cavity, solitude, hermitage. Salmandra is thus the name of the salt of the stable, salt of the rock or solitary salt. This word takes in the Greek language another meaning, revealing the action it induces. Sigma alpha lambda alpha mu nu delta rho alpha appears formed from sigma lambda omicron sigma, agitation, trouble, and from mu nu delta rho alpha, which doubtless stands for sigma lambda omicron sigma or sigma lambda eta, agitated water, tempest, fluctuation, and has the same meaning as in Latin. From these etymologies, we can draw the conclusion that the salt, spirit or fire, is born in a stable, a rock cavity, a grotto, that is enough, lying on the straw of his manger, in the grotto of Bethlehem, is not Jesus the new sun bringing light to the world? Is he not God himself, under his perishable and fleshy envelope, who then said, I am the spirit and I am the life, I have come to bring fire into things. This spiritual fire, incarnated in salt, is the hidden sulfur because during its operation it never becomes manifest nor sensible to our eyes. And yet this sulfur, as invisible as it is, is not a clever abstraction, a contrivance of doctrine. We know how to isolate it, 
extracted from the body that contains it, by an occult means and under the appearance of a dry powder, which, in this state, becomes impotent and without effect in the philosophical art. This pure fire, of the same essence as the specific sulfur of gold, but less digested, is, on the contrary, more abundant than that of the precious metal. This is why it easily unites with the mercury of imperfect minerals and metals. Philolethes assures us that it is found hidden in the belly of Aries, or of the ram, constellation traversed by the sun in the month of April. Finally, to designate it even better, we will add that this ram which hides in its fleece ostensibly on its shield the image of the hermetic seal, star with six rays. It is therefore in this very common matter, which seems to us simply useful, that we must seek the mysterious solar fire, subtle salt and spiritual sulfur, celestial light diffused in the darkness of the body, without which nothing can be accomplished and which nothing can replace. We have highlighted above the important place that occupies, among the emblematic subjects of the little hotel of Lisieux, the salamander, particular ensign of its modest and learned owner. We see up there, we find it, as we said, until the final, inaccessible and raised to the sky. She clutches the spike of the hat, between two sculpted dragons parallel to the ridge pole, PL. By, one wingless, the other with golden wings, are those spoken of by Nicholas Flamel in his hieroglyphic figures, and by Michael Meyer, Symbola. Aurea Mensi, Frankfurt, 1617, considered as being, with the globe surmounted by the cross, particular symbols in the style of the famous adept. This simple observation demonstrates the extensive knowledge the artist from Lee's Yu had of philosophical texts and of the symbolism unique to each of his predecessors. On the other hand, the choice of the salamander leads us to think that our alchemist must have searched and used many years in the discovery of the secret fire. The hieroglyph indeed conceals, in fact, the physico-chemical nature of the fruits of the Garden of Hespera, fruits whose late maturity pleases the sage only in his old age, and that he hardly picks up at the end of life, at the setting, eta sigma pi epsilon rho sigma, of a laborious and painful career. Each of these fruits is the result of a progressive condensation of solar fire by the secret fire, incarnate verb, celestial spirit embodied in all things of this world. And these are the gathered and concentrated rays of this double fire that color and animate our body, illuminate, clarify, regenerate, giving it brilliant luster and admirable virtue. Having reached this point of exaltation, the ignited principle, material and spiritual, through its universality of action, becomes assimilable to bodies composed of the three realms of nature. It exercises its efficacy as well among animals and within vegetables as within mineral and metallic bodies. It is there the magical rubies, agents endowed with energy, of ignited subtleties, and clothed with color and the multiple properties of fire. It is also the oil of Christ or of crystal, the heraldic lizard that attracts, devours, vomits, and feeds the flame, stretched over its patience like the old phoenix on its immortality. 3. On the central pillar of the ground floor, the visitor discovers a curious bar leaf. A monkey is busy eating the fruits of a young apple tree, barely taller than himself, pl. 7. In front of this subject, which translates for the initiate the perfect realization, we tackle the work by the end. The brilliant flowers, whose living and shimmering colors were the joy of our artisan, have faded and died one after another. The fruits have been taken shape and, from green as they were at the beginning, are now offered. The alchemist, in his patient work, must be the scrupulous imitator of nature, the monkey of creation, following the genuine expression of several masters. Guided by analogy, he achieves on a small scale and in a restricted domain, what God did on a large scale in the cosmic universe. Here, the immense. There, the minute. At these two extremes, the same thought, the same effort, the same seeming volition in its relativity. God makes everything from nothing. He creates. Man takes a part of this all and multiplies it. He prolongs and continues. Thus the microcosm amplifies the macrocosm. Such is his true mission, his reason for being. Such is salvation. Above, God. Below, the earthly man and the cause of his own perishable creature, all of nature. Between the immortal creator and his created creature, search, you will find nothing more, nor discover anything less, than the author of the first effort, connected to the mass of beneficiaries of the divine example, submitted to the same imperious will of constant, eternal labor. All the classical authors are unanimous in acknowledging that the great work is an abridgment, reduced to human proportions and possibilities, of the divine work. And, as the adept must bring the best of his qualities if he wants to lead it to good, it seems just inequitable that he gathers the fruits of the tree of life and makes his profit from the marvelous apples of the garden of the Hesperides. 
but since, obeying the fantasy or the desire of our philosopher, we are constrained to start from where our research ends and art and nature finish their task in concert, at the very point where we should be concerned first with what we are acting on and not act blindly, isn't it, despite the paradox, an excellent method to research? And is it not one that starts by the end? That one will find more easily what he needs, who clearly knows what he wants to obtain. There is much talk, in the occult circles of our time, of the philosopher's stone, without knowing what it is in reality. Many learned people qualify it as the hermetic gem of the mysterious body, they have for it the opinion of certain spagyrists of the 17th and 18th centuries, who ranked it among the abstract entities, qualified as non-beings or beings of reason. Let us inform ourselves so as to have, about this unknown body, an idea as close as possible to the truth. Let us study the descriptions, rare and too succinct for our liking, that some philosophers have left us, and see what is also reported by the following characters and faithful witnesses. Let us say, as a preamble, that the term philosopher's stone signifies, according to the sacred language, the stone that bears the sign of the sun. Now, this solar sign is characterized by the red coloration, which can vary in intensity, as Basile Valentine says, its color comes from red, either crimson or ruby on a grayish background. As for its weight, it weighs much more than it has quantity. This is about the color and the density. The cosmopolite, whom Louis Figuier believes to be the alchemist known under the name of Sethan, and others under that of Michael Sendivagius, describes its aspect as translucent, its crystalline form and its fusibility in this passage. If one saw our subject in its last state of perfection, made and composed by nature, it must be fusible like wax or butter, and its redness, its diaphaneity and clarity would shine forth. This would indeed be our blessed stone. Its fusibility is such, in effect, that all authors have compared it to that of wax, 64 degrees centigrade. It melts in the flame of a candle, they say, for this reason, they have even given it the name of Grande Sire Rouge, Great Red Wax. To its physical characteristics, the stone adds powerful chemical qualities, the power of penetration or of ingression, absolute fixity, and oxidizability that makes it indeclinable, an extreme resistance to fire, finally its irreducibility and its perfect indifference regarding chemical agents. This is also what we learn from Heinrich Conrath, in his Amphitheatrum Sapieni I Eternae, when he writes, finally, when the work has passed from ash color to pure white, then to yellow, you will see the philosophical stone, our king raised above the dominions, emerge from its vitreous sepulcher, rise from its bed and come onto the worldly scene in its glorified body, that is to say regenerated and more than perfect, in other words, the carbuncle shining, very radiant with splendor, and whose very subtle and very pure parts, by the peace and harmony of the mixture, are inseparably linked and assembled into one, equal, diaphanous like crystal, compact and very heavy, easily fusible in fire like resin, flowing like wax and more than living silver, but without emitting any smoke, piercing and penetrating as oil penetrates paper, soluble and dilatable in any liquid capable of softening it, friable like glass, of the color of saffron, it crumbles when ground, but stays red like the ruby it leaves in mass, this redness is the signature of perfect fixation and of fixed perfection, it colors eternally, even if it continuously fixes in the tribulations of all experiences, even in the strong persecution by the devouring sulfur and the ardent waters, by the very strong persecution of fire, always durable, unmeltable, and by the very salamander, permanent and judging rightly all things, for it is in its way all in all, and proclaiming, Behold, I will renew all things. The adventurer, an Englishman Edward Kelly, said Talbot, who had acquired, around 1585, from an innkeeper, the philosopher's stone found in the tomb of a bishop, which was said to be very rich, was red and very heavy, but without any odor. However, Beregard de P says that a clever man gave him a large, 3 grams 82, powder whose color was similar to that of poppy and which exhaled the odor of calcined sea salt. Helvetius, Jean Frederick Schweitzer, saw the stone, shown to him by a foreign adept, on December 27, 1666, in the form of a metallic sulfur color. This product, pulverized, therefore came, as Conrath said, from a red mass. During a transmutation made by Sethan, in July 1602, in front of Dr. Jacob Zwinger, the powder used was, according to the report of Dienheim, quite heavy, and of a second quality that appeared lemon yellow. A year later, during a second projection at the goldsmith Hans de Kempen, in Cologne, on August 11, 1603, it was of a red stone used by the same artist. According to several credible witnesses, the stone, obtained directly in powder form, 
could affect a coloration as vivid as the one that would be formed in a compact state. The fact is quite rare, but it can happen and is worth mentioning. This is how an adept who, in 1658, performed the transmutation in front of the Protestant pastor Gross, at the Goldsmith Bureau in Geneva, was using, according to the attending witnesses, a red powder. Schmeider describes the stone that Budisher received from Lascaris as a substance having the appearance of a red glass. However, Lascaris had given to Domenico Manuel, Gaetano, a powder similar to vermilion. The one from Gustenhofer was also very red. As for the sample given by Lascaris to Dierbach, it was examined under the microscope by Councillor Dippel, and appeared to be composed of a multitude of small grains or red crystals or orange. Jean-Baptiste van Helmont, recounting the experience he had in 1618 in his laboratory in Billboard, near Brussels, wrote, I have seen and I have touched more than once the philosopher's stone. Its color was that of saffron in powder form, but heavy and slippery like egg yolk when pulverized. This product, of which a quarter of a grain, 13 milligrams 25, provided 8 ounces of gold, 244 grams 72, exhibited considerable energy, about 18,470 times the unity. In the order of tinctures, that is to say liquors obtained by the dissolution of fatty metallic extracts, we possess the account of Godwin Hermann Braun, from Osnabrück, who transmuted, in 1701, with the help of a tincture having the aspect of a fairly fluid and dark brown oil. The famous chemist Henkel reports, after Valentini, the following anecdote. One day, a famous apothecary from Frankfurt am Main, named Saul Wei, a stranger who had a brown tincture, which had almost the odor of deer horn oil, with four drops of this tincture, he changed a large lead bar into 23 karat gold, seven grains and a half. This same man gave a few drops of this tincture to that apothecary, who housed him, and who afterwards did the same with gold, which he keeps in memory of that man, with the small bottle in which it was, and where one can still see the marks of this tincture. I have had this bottle in my hands and then bore witness to it to the whole world. Without contesting the veracity of these last two facts, we nevertheless refuse to place them in the rank of the transmutations performed by the philosopher's stone in its special state of projection powder. All the tinctures are there, their subjection to a particular metal, their limited power, the specific characters they present lead us to, consider them as mere metallic products, extracted from vulgar metals by certain procedures, called small specifics, which pertain to spagyric and not to alchemy. Moreover, these tinctures, being metallic, have no other action than that of penetrating the metals alone which have served as a base for their preparation. Let us therefore set aside these processes and these tinctures. What is important above all, is to retain that the philosopher's stone presents itself to us in the form of a crystalline, diaphanous, massy red body, yellow after pulverization, which is dense and very fusible, although fixed to any crucible. The text refers to the unique qualities of a substance, likely the philosopher's stone, described in alchemical terms. It is characterized as being deeply penetrating, irreducible, and unyielding to heat. Soluble in molten glass, it immediately vaporizes when thrown onto molten metal. These properties, combined in a single subject, distinguish it from natural metallic bodies and relieve the original nebulousness. The pursuit of alchemists is triple, seeking universal medicine or the true philosopher's stone, which is said to be only useful for human maladies, health conservation, and plant growth. Its solution, called potable gold, is thought to impact a magnificent yellow color. Its curative value and diverse therapeutic applications make it a precious adjunct in treating severe and incurable diseases. However, it has no effect on metals, hence useless for transmutation. This substance, remaining fluid like quicksilver and absolutely non-coagulating even when cooled, differs from an ordinary glowing stone. The universal medicine has become the perpetual light, and some authors have signaled it as found in ancient sepulchres. This radiant and liquid philosopher's stone, in our opinion, should not be pursued further. Amplifying its fiery virtue seems dangerous. At least we could be wary of volatilizing it and losing the benefits of a certain considerable seraph. In the end, if the universal medicine were contained in a capsule, solid, with pure gold or silver, then we would possess the projection powder, the third form of the stone, a mass either translucent, red, or white depending on the chosen metal, pulverizable at room temperature, possessing the aforementioned characteristics. Its temperature, and whose own qualities make it cutting, penetrating, irreducible in incalculable proportions. We add that it is soluble in glass infusion, but it volatilizes itself instantaneously once cast onto molten metal. Here are gathered, in a single subject, properties which singularly distance it from the metal nature and render it valuable and untroublesome. 
a little reflection removes us from embarrassment. The masters of the art teach us that the true medicine is triple. What they seek to achieve in the first place is the universal medicine, or the properly called philosopher's stone. Obtained in saline form, not, however, usable for the healing of human ailments nor for the preservation of health except for the increase of vegetables. Soluble in any spirituous liquor, its solution takes the name of potable gold, although it does not contain the smallest atom of gold, because it affects a magnificent yellow color. Its curative value and the diversity of its use in therapeutics make it a precious auxiliary in the treatment of severe and incurable diseases. It has no action on metals, except on gold and silver, with which it fixes itself and endows its properties, but, if exceeded, does not serve for transmutation. However, if one goes beyond the limited number of its multiplications, it changes its form and, instead of returning to a solid state upon cooling, it remains fluid like quicksilver and absolutely uncoagulable. In the darkness, it then shines with a soft, red, phosphorescent glow, whose brilliance remains weaker than that of an ordinary lamp. The universal medicine has become the inextinguishable light, the illuminating product of these perpetual lamps, which some authors have signaled as having been found in some ancient tombs. Thus radiant and liquid, the philosopher's stone, in our opinion, is susceptible to be pushed further. Wanting to amplify its igneous virtue would seem dangerous to us. The least that one could fear would be to volatilize it at the expense of considerable labor. Finally, if one melts the universal medicine, solid, with very pure gold or silver by direct fusion, one obtains the powder of projection, the third form of this stone. It is a mass transmutable, through choice, solely for metallic transmutation, oriented, determined and specified to the mineral realm. It is useless and without action for the other two realms. From the previous considerations, it is clear that the philosopher's stone, or universal medicine, despite its metallic origin, is not made solely of metallic matter. If in the past it was, and it was composed solely of metals, as it would remain subject to the conditions that govern nature and would have no need to be fermented to perform transmutation. On the other hand, the fundamental axiom which teaches that bodies do not act upon bodies would be false and paradoxical. Take the time to experiment, and you will recognize that metals do not act on other metals. Whether they are brought to the state of ashes, cinders, glasses or colloids, they will always retain their nature during tests and, in reduction, separate without losing their specific qualities. Only metallic spirits have the privilege of altering, of denaturing metallic bodies. They are the true promoters of all the extreme metamorphoses that one can observe. These subtle and volatile spirits require a vehicle, an envelope capable of enveloping them. The matter must be very pure, to allow the spirit to remain, and very fixed, to prevent its volatilization, it must remain fusible, to favor ingression, it is essential to have absolute resistance to reducing agents, and understand that the only metallic nature that can be sought in the single category of metals. This is why Vasile Valentin commands to take the spirit in the metallic vaccine and Bernard de Trevise defends using metals, minerals and the body itself. The reason is simple and imposes itself. If the spirit, composed of a metallic body and a metallic spirit fixed on this body, could coagulate on it as being of the same kind, the whole would take on the characteristic of the metal. One could, in this case, obtain gold or the characteristic of metal, because nothing more is required. This is what silver, even a metal because it is ignored, seeks to achieve, its universality and the essence that alchemists sought. It is not the union of a metallic body and spirit that we demand, with all the philosophers, but the condensation, the agglomeration of this spirit in a coherent, tenacious and refractory envelope capable of enveloping it, of impregnating it, resisting fire assembled, concentrated protection. It is this most resistant and most perfect coagulated in the purest gold that constitutes our stone, and we can certify that, whatever the terrestrial materials may be, the spirit alone as guide in this matter for base will never fail the proposed work. At the first level of the manor of Lisieux, carved in the left pillar of the façade, a man of primitive aspect lifts and seems to carry a heavy weight, of quite strong dimension, pl. 4. This symbol, which seems quite obscure, hides perhaps the most important of secondary arcanes. We would even say that, due to ignorance of this point of doctrine, and also for having followed too literally the teachings of the old authors, many good artists have not been able to collect the fruits of their labors. How many investigators, more enthusiastic than penetrating, have stumbled and still stumble today against the stumbling stone of specious reasoning. Let's not push human logic too far, so often contrary to natural simplicity. 
If we could observe more naively the effects that nature manifests around us, if we were content to control the results obtained using the same means, if we subordinated the search for the mystery of causes, its explanation by the probable, the possible or the hypothetical, many truths would be discovered that are still to be searched for. Beware of intervening, in your observations, what you believe to be born, for you might find out that it would have been better to have learned nothing rather than having to unlearn everything. These may be superfluous advice, because they require, in their practical application, the use of a stubborn will that the mediocre are incapable of. We know what it costs to exchange diplomas, seals, and parchments against the humble philosopher's vessel. We had to empty, at the age of forty, this chalice of bitter drink, the heart bruised, ashamed of the errors of our youth. We had to burn books and notebooks, confess our ignorance, and, modest neophyte, decipher a single alphabet on the benches of another school. Also, it is for those who have the courage to forget everything, that we take the trouble to study the symbol and to strip it of its esoteric veil. The breed that has taken hold of this craftsman from another age hardly seems to serve only his industrious genius. And yet, it is there our dry tree, the one which had the honor to give its name to one of the oldest streets of Paris, after having long been on a famous sign. Edward Fournier informs us that, according to Sauval, volume, I, P, 109, this sign was still seen around 1660. It pointed out to passers-by and in spoken of by Monstrelet, volume, Cluxvay, and had been well chosen for such a lodging, which, since 1300, had served to give shelter to pilgrims of the Holy Land. The arborist sect was a memory of Palestine. It was the tree planted by all, and which, after having been green since the beginning of the world green and leafy, lost its foliage the day our Lord died on the cross, and remained dry, but to turn green again when a Lord, Prince of the West, would take possession, with the Christians and would sing mass under that tree, planted in a dry place. This withered tree, rising from dry rock, is depicted on the last panel of the Art du Podier, but it is represented covered with leaves and fruits, with a banner bearing the motto, Sick and Sterile. It is also found sculpted on the beautiful door of the Cathedral of Limoges, as well as on the caterfoil of the base of Amiens. These are also two fragments of this mutilated trunk, which a cleric from the high stone above the large shell used as a holy water font, in the Breton church of Gimeliel, Finisterre. Finally, we find the tree again on a certain number of secular buildings from the 16th century. In Avignon, it surmounts the door in the shape of a basket handle of the old Collège de Ruhr. In Cahors, it serves as a frame to two windows, House Verdier, Rue des Boulevards, as well as a small door depending on the College Pellegrin, located in the same town, PL. 8. Such is the hieroglyph adopted by the philosophers to express the metallic inertia, that is to say, the special state that human industry has given to reduced and molten metals. Hermetic esotericism effectively demonstrates that metallic bodies remain alive and endowed with vegetative power, as they are mineralized in their ores. They are there associated with a specific agent, or mineral spirit, which ensures their vitality, nutrition, and evolution until the term required by nature where they then take on the appearance and properties of native gold and silver. Fixed at this point, the agent separates from the body which had given it activity and no longer intends to transform. If it remained on the earth for several centuries, it could not change its state nor abandon the characteristics that distinguish the metal from the mineral aggregate. But it is far from everything happening so simply within the metallic ores. Subjected to the vicissitudes of this transient world, a quantity of minerals have their evolution suspended by the action of. It is for these profound reasons. The depletion of crystalline nutrients, lack of external elements, fissures, influx of water, heat, etc., that the ores solidify then and remain mineralized with their qualities of power without being able to transcend the evolved state they contain. Others, younger, waiting to reach the state of solidity and consistency they will achieve, retain the liquid state and are perfectly uncoagulable. This is the case with mercury, which is often found in a native state, whether mineralized from its source, cinnabar, or in the same mine, outside of its place of origin. Under this native form, and although metallurgical treatment has not intervened, the metals are as insensitive as those minerals which have undergone grilling and fusion. More than them, they do not possess their own vital agent. The sages tell us that they are dead, at least in appearance, because it is impossible for us, under their solid and crystallized mass, to overturn the latent, potential, hidden life deep within their being. These are dead trees, even though they still hold some humidity, they will no longer give leaves, flowers, fruits, and especially no seeds. Therefore, it is with good reason that certain authors assert that gold and mercury cannot participate, in whole or in part, in the elaboration of the work. 
The first, they say, because its agent proper to it has been separated at its achievement, and the second, because gold, although sterile in solid form, can regain its lost vitality and resume its evolution, provided we know how to put it back in its first matter. But this is a misleading teaching if we take it in the vulgar sense. Let us pause for a moment on this contentious point and do not lose sight of the possibility of nature. It is the only means we have to recognize our path in this tortuous labyrinth. Most hermetists think that by the term of reinvigoration, the return of the metal to its primitive state is meant. They misinterpret the meaning of the term, which is extracted from the verb revivify. This conception is false. It is impossible for nature, and even more so for the effect of a secular work. What is acquired remains so, and that is the reason why the old masters affirm that it is easier to make gold than to return it to its dregs. No one will ever witness the reverse action of the role of fire. Personalities have tried in vain to regain the qualities they possessed before being acted upon by fire. Here, the analogy and the possibility of nature are the best and most sure guides. Nowhere in the world is there any example of regression. Other researchers believe that it is enough to bathe the metal in the primitive and mercurial substance which, by slow maturation and coagulation, gave it birth. This reasoning is even more special and true, assuming even that they concede this first matter and that they can put the great masters to the test, who ignore it, they could not, ultimately, obtain an increase of the gold used, and not a new body, of greater power than that of the precious metal. The operation, thus understood, boils down to, the mixing of the same body in two different states of its evolution, one liquid, the other solid. With a little reflection, it is easy to comprehend that such an enterprise could not lead to the goal. It is, moreover, in formal opposition with the philosophical axiom we have often stated, bodies do not have action on bodies, only spirits are active and aggressive. We must therefore understand, under the expression putting the gold back into its first matter, the animation of the metal, achieved through the use of that vital agent we have spoken of. It is that spirit which has escaped from the body when this manifestation on the physical plane takes place. It is that soul of the first material residence which no point wanted to designate otherwise, and which makes its residence within the virgin's tree. The animation of gold, symbolic vitalization of the dry tree, our resurrection from death, is allegorically taught by an Arab author. This author, named Xisos, who is very busy, tells us Burnett in his notes on the Gospel of Childhood. To collect oriental legends about the events related in the Gospels, narrates in these terms the circumstances of the delivery of Mary. When the time of deliverance approached, she left the mill at night to go to the city of David, and she set out for Jerusalem, and she saw a withered palm tree, and when Mary sat down at the foot of this tree, immediately it bloomed again and was covered with leaves and greenery, and it bore a great abundance of fruit by the operation of the power of God. And God caused a lively spring of water to gush next to her, and when the pains of childbirth tormented Mary, she embraced the palm tree with her hands. We could not say it better nor speak with more clarity. On the central pillar of the first floor, one notices a group interesting enough for enthusiasts and those curious about symbolism. Although it has suffered a lot and today presents itself mutilated, cracked, corroded, despite the damage, one can still discern the subject. It is a figure clasping between its legs a griffin whose claws, devoid of talons, are very visible, as well as the tail of the rump, details that allow, by themselves, a certain identification. On the left hand, the man directs the monster's head towards the top, and with the right, he gives the sign, PL. 9. We recognize in this motif one of the major emblems of science, the one that covers the preparation of the primary matters of the work. But, while the combat of the dragon and the knight indicates the initial struggle, the duel of the mineral products endangering their integrity threatened, the griffin marks the result of the operation, veiled moreover under myths of various expressions, but all representing the character of incompatibility, natural aversion and profound hatred that one has for the other, the substances in contact. From the combat of the night, or secret sulfur given to the arsenical old dragon, is born the astral stone, white, brilliant like silver, and which appears signed, bearing the imprint of its nobility, the griffin, esoterically translated by the griffin, a certain sign of union and peace between fire and water, between air and earth. All too often, we would hope to reach this dignity from the first conjunction. This raw stone, covered with the halos, as soiled by the impurities that it is very difficult to completely rid it of them. That's why it's important to subject it to several levigations, which are the washes of Nicolas Flamel, to cleanse it little by little of its filth, of the heterogeneous dregs and tenacious dirt that encumber it, and to see it take on, with each of them, more splendor, polish and brilliance. The initiates know that our science, although purely natural and simple, 
is by no means vulgar. The terms we use to continue matters are not chosen by chance. With an old bellows, we blow carefully on it, because we are the ones who chose them with care, to show the way, to mark the boundaries that it digs, hoping to enlighten the studious, by turning away the blind, the greedy and the indignant. Remember, you who know already, how many languages are silent, that yours speaks, that it is from the crow, as you were taught by the fire, that the way is taught. This is the reason why some authors have described these operations under the chemical title of calcinations, because the matter, long submissive to the action of the norm, lets its impurities and replaceable parts be carried away by the simple fire of the dragon. First lets flow a dark wave, smelly and venomous, whose smoke, thick and volatile, is extremely toxic. This water, which has for symbol the crow, cannot be clarified and whitened except by, through the medium of fire, and that's where the philosophers give us a lesson when, in their enigmatic style, they recommend to the artist to remove the black lead from his work. The lead, once stripped of its black color, takes on a bright whiteness. Water, frequent and prolonged, exhausts the soul and feathers of the bird, which is thus better able to defend its specific qualities in the air. Against this tyrannical Vulcan, it contracts, resists the influence of the fire, and is nourished by the fire, which aggregates the pure and homogeneous molecules, and finally becomes a dense, ardent body, so that the flame enhances it more advantageously. It is with this intention, unknown brothers of the mysterious solar city, that we have formed the plan to teach the various successive modes of purification. You will be grateful to us, we are sure, to have signaled to you those vats, retorts of the Hermetic Sea, against which so many inexperienced Argonauts have come to wreck. If, then, you desire to possess the griffin, which is our astral stone, by extracting from its arsenic blood, take two parts of virgin earth, neither dragon scales, and one of the fiery agent, the most valiant knight armed with the lance and the shield. Afterwards, more vigorous than Ares, must be the lancer of the powder. Reduce the fifth part of all this pure salt, white, admirable, crystallized, which you must necessarily know. Mix thoroughly, then, taking example from the painful passion of our Lord, crucified with three iron points so that the body may die and then be able to resurrect. This done, chase from the cadaver the grosser sediments, crush and grind the bones, mix it all on a soft bed with a steel rod, then throw into this mixture half of the second salt, drawn from the dew that, in the month of May, fertilizes the earth, and you will obtain a body clearer than the previous one. Repeat three times the same technique, you will have risen to the middle of Mercury, and you will have ascended the first step of the wise men's staircase. When Jesus rose, the third day after his death, a luminous angel and a white snow occupied the only tomb. But to combat the secret adversary, to discover its antagonist, it is indispensable to know by what means the wise use in order to limit, to temper the excessive ardor of the belligerent. For lack of the necessary mediator, we would never have been able to find the symbolic, symbolic experimenter, exposing himself to serious dangers. Spectator of the drama he would have recklessly unleashed, it is not from him that we should direct the phases nor regulate the fury. Fiery projections, even the brutal explosion of the furnace, would be the sad consequences of his temerity. That is why, aware of our responsibility, let us urgently ask those who do not possess this secret to refrain from it. They will thus avoid the unhappy fate of an unfortunate priest from the Diocese of Avignon, which the following notice briefly relates. Chape, abbot of Avignon, thought he had found the philosopher's stone, but, alas, he believed too strongly in it. The crucible having broken, the metal sprang against him, stuck to his face, his arms, and his robe. He ran thus through the streets of the infirmaries, writhing in the gutters like a possessed person, and miserably perished, burnt like a damned soul. 1706. When you perceive in the boiling vessel a noise similar to that of boiling water, a muffled rumbling from the earth whose fire tears the entrails, be ready to fight and conserve your sang froid. You will notice fumes and flames, blue, green, and violet, accompanying a series of precipitated detonations. Once the effervescence has passed and the calm is restored, you will be able to enjoy a magnificent spectacle. On a sea of fire, solid islets form, surging, animated by slow movements, take and leave an infinity of bright colors. Their surface swells up, bursts in the center and makes them resemble tiny volcanoes. They then disappear to give way to pretty green, transparent balls, which spin rapidly on themselves, roll, collide, and seem to chase each other, in the midst of the multicolored flames, of the iridescent reflections of the incandescent bath. In describing the painful and delicate preparation of our stone, we have omitted to speak of the effective contest that certain external influences must bring to it. We could, in this regard, mention certain names like Nicholas Grosparmi, 
adept of the 15th century, about whom we have spoken at the beginning of this study, Siliani, philosopher of the 19th century, and Cyprian Picopassi, Italian master potter, who have dedicated a part of their teaching to the examination of these conditions, without omitting a part of their savage massacre and their outrages, which are not within everyone's reach. Whatever the case may be, and to satisfy, as far as possible, the legitimate curiosity of researchers, we will say that, without the absolute concordance of the superior elements with the inferior ones, our matter, deprived of astral virtues, could not be of any use. The body we work on is, before its workmanship, more heavenly than earthly, art must render it, by helping it, more earthly than heavenly, the knowledge of the proper moment of nature, more heavenly than earthly, etc., is therefore essential for us, peace, time, place, season, secret production. Let us know how to predict the hour to ensure the success of this secret production. Let us know to predict the hour to ensure the success of this secret production. Let us know how to predict the hour as the stars reform, in the fixed heavens, the most favorable aspect, for they are reflected in the divine mirror which is our stone and imprint their mark. And the earthly star, hidden torch of our nativity, upon the precise hour of the union of heaven and earth, seals, on the mercury philosopher, the I receive under the auspices of the inferior things. You will have confirmation of this by discovering, within the ignited water, or from the earthly sky, following the typical pressure of Vincent's Lavinus of Moravia, the hermetic signature, and radiant, translucent manifestation, visible and patent. Capture a ray of the sun, condense it under a substantial form, nourish with elementary fire this spiritual body made flesh, and you will possess the greatest treasure of the world. It is useful to know that the short, fierce battle, delivered by the knight, named St. George, St. Michael, or St. Marcel in Christian tradition, Mars, Theseus, Jason, Hercules in the fable, does not cease except by the death of the two champions, in hermetic language, the eagle and the lion, and their assembly into a new body whose alchemical signature is the griffin. Recall that, in all the ancient legends of Asia and Europe, it is always a dragon who is appointed as the guardian of treasures. He watches over the golden apples of the Hesperides and on the suspended fleece of Caucasus. This is why it is necessary, in case of necessity, to reduce to silence the aggressive one if one wants to seize the riches he protects, a legend told about the learned alchemist Hujusman, numbered among the gods after his death. That man, having killed a horrible dragon which was ravaging the country, attached the monster to a column. This is exactly what Jason does in the Forest of Eats, and Siliani in his allegorical account of Hermes unveiled. Truth always seems to express itself with the help of similar means and analogous fictions. The combination of the two initial matters, one volatile, the other fixed, gives a third body, mixtion, which marks the first state of the philosopher's stone. As we have said, the griffin, half eagle and half lion, symbol that corresponds to the one we are considering that of Bacchus and the fish of the Christian iconography. We must indeed recognize that the griffin carries, in place of a lion's mane or a necklace of plumes, a crest of fish scales, of great significance, for if it is the sign of the fish scales, this detail and to dominate the fight, it is still necessary to provoke the meeting of the upper element, that is to say, of the body newly produced, the only one that is useful to us, that is to say, of Mercury of the Sages. The poets tell us that Vulcan, surpassing in cunning adulterous Mars and Venus, hurried to surround them with a net or a thin sheet, so that they could not escape from it. In the same way, the masters advise us to use also a delicate net or a subtle snare, to catch it at the very moment of its appearance. The artist fishes, metaphorically, the mystical fish, and leaves the water empty, inert, without a soul, the man, in this operation, is thus supposed to kill the griffin. It is the scene that our bar-relief must represent. If we inquire what secret meaning is attached to the Greek word griffin, which has as a neighboring root gamma rho psi, that is to say having the beak hooked, we find a word close. Gamma rho pi omicron sigma, which means an enigma and a net. Thus, the fabulous animal contains, in its image and in its name, the most ungrateful hermetic enigma to decipher, that of the philosophical Mercury, whose deep, hidden substance in the body, is caught like a fish in the water, with the help of an appropriate net. Basile Valentine, who is usually more explicit, did not use the symbol of the Christian 9 theta upsilon sigma, which he preferred to humanize under the Kabbalistic and mythological name of Hyperion. This is how he signifies the night presenting the three operations of the great work under an enigmatic formula comprising three succinct phases, thus stated. I am born of Hermogene. Hyperion has chosen me. Without Jamshuffle, I am doomed to perish. We have seen how, at the end of which reaction, is born the griffin, 
which comes from Hermogene, or from the prime mercury substance. Hyperion, in Greek Upsilon Pi Epsilon Rho Omega Nu, is the father of the sun, it is he who presides over the second white chaos, formed by art and figured by the griffin, the soul that it contains enclosed, the spirit, fire or hidden light that it carries above the mass, under the aspect of a clear and limpid water, spiritus domini ferabat or super aquas. Because the prepared matter, which contains all the elements necessary for our great work, is only a fecundated earth where some confusion still reigns, a substance that holds in itself the scattered light that art must gather by imitating the creator. This earth, we must mortify it and decompose it, which comes back to killing the griffin and fishing the fish, to separate the fire from the earth, the subtle from the dense, document, with great care. Such is the chemical role of Hyperion. His very name, formed from Pi Rho, above, and Omicron Nu, sepulcher, tomb, which has as its root Rho Alpha, earth, indicates that which rises from the earth, above the tomb of matter. One can, if one prefers, choose the etymology by which Pi Epsilon Rho Omega Nu would derive from Pi Rho, above, and Nu, violet, the two senses have among them a perfect hermetic concordance, but we only give this variant so as to enlighten the trainees of our order, following in this the word of the gospel, take heed therefore how you hear, for whosoever has, to him shall be given, and whosoever has not, from him shall be taken even that which he thinks to have. Chapter 6. Carved above the group of the man with the griffin, you will notice a huge grimacing head, adorned with a pointed beard. The cheeks, the ears, the forehead are stretched to give a rather unsympathetic aspect of exaggeration and flamboyant mask, with little sympathetic appendages, appears crowned and surrounded by appendages that are coiled, which rest on the twist of the cornice, pl. 9. With its horns and crown, the solar symbol takes on the meaning of a true Baphomet, that is to say the synthetic image where the initiates of the temple had grouped all the elements of high science and tradition. A complex figure, indeed, beneath simple features, a speaking figure, heavy with teaching, despite its rough and primitive aesthetic. If we first find there the mystical fusion of the natures of the work that the horns of the lunar crescent placed on the solar head symbolize, we are no less surprised by the expression of strangeness, a reflection of a devouring ardor, which exudes this inhospitable face, specter of the last judgment. He is not even up to the beard, hieroglyph of the luminous and fiery bundle projected towards the earth, which justifies the exact knowledge of our destiny the learned possessed. Would we be in the presence of the dwelling of someone affiliated with the sex of the illuminated or of the Rosicrucians, descendants of the old Templars? The cyclical theory, parallel to the doctrine of Hermes, is so clearly exposed that except for ignorance or bad faith, we could not suspect the knowledge of our adept. For us, our conviction is made, we are certain not to deceive ourselves with so many categorical assertions. It is indeed a deception to consider as a fact, before us, the Baphomet, removed from the Templars that we have under our eyes. This image, of which one only has vague indications or simple hypotheses, was never an idol, as some have believed, but only an emblem of the esoteric traditions of the order, used especially outside, as an esoteric paradigm, under the eyes of chivalry and sign of recognition. It was reproduced on the pediments of the commanderies and on the tympanum of their chapels. It consisted of an isosceles triangle with the apex pointing downward, hieroglyph of water, the first element created, according to Thales of Miletus, who maintained that God is the intelligence that has formed all things from water. A second triangle set against the first, but smaller and inverted, was inscribed in the center and seemed to occupy the space reserved for the human face. It symbolized the fire, and, more precisely, the fire enclosed in water, or the divine spark, the soul incarnated, life infused into matter. On the inverted base of the great water triangle rested a sign resembling the Latin letter H with a Greek eta, eta, with more width however, and whose central bar crossed the middle circle. This sign, in hermetic steganography, indicated the universal spirit, the creator, God, inside the large triangle, a little above and on each side of the triangle of fire, one could see to the left the lunar crescent inscribed, and to the right the central solar circle was evident. These small circles were arranged in the manner of eyes. Finally, welded at the base of the small inner triangle, the cross resting on the globe thus constituted the double hieroglyph of sulfur, the active principle, associated with mercury, the passive principle of all metals. Often, a more or less long segment, located at the point of the triangle, was furrowed by lines of a vertical tendency where the profane recognized not the expression of luminous radiation, but a sort of beard, Thus presented, the Baphomet took on a coarse animal form, 
imprecise, awkwardly identified. This is what would undoubtedly explain the diversity of descriptions that have been made of it, in which the Baphomet is sometimes seen as a haloed skull, or a bucranium, sometimes an Egyptian hoppy head, a goat, and, even better, the terrifying face of Satan himself. Simple impressions, far removed from reality, but alas, they have contributed to spreading, among the learned knights of the temple, the accusation of demonology and witchcraft which became one of the bases of their trial, one of the reasons for their condemnation. We have just seen what the Baphomet was, we must now try to extract the hidden meaning behind this denomination. In pure hermetic expression, corresponding to the work of the work, Baphomet comes from the Greek words beta phi eta sigma, dire, and psi, height, with the idea that one should not address a neophyte, but psi eta, moon, mother or matrix, which comes back to the same lunar meaning, since the moon is truly the mother or the mercurial matrix that receives the sulfur tint or semen, representing the male, the dire, beta phi eta sigma, in the metallic generation. Beta alpha phi has the sense of immersion and of dying, and one can say, without divulging too much, that the sulfur, father and dire of the stone, is impregnated by the lunar mercury through immersion, which brings us back to the symbolic baptism of Matis expressed again by the word Baphomet. This one indeed appears as the complete figure of science, elsewhere personified in the figure of the god Pan, mythical image of nature in full activity. The Latin word Baphis, dire, and the verb meadow, to reap, to gather, also signal this special virtue possessed by the mercury or moon of the sages, to capture, stealthily and as it is emitted, and this during the immersion or bath of the sun, the dye that it then gives and that the mother conserves in her bosom during the time required. It is the grail, which contains the Eucharistic wine, vegetative liquor, living and life-giving introduced into material things. As for the origin of the order, its filiation, the knowledge and beliefs of the Templars, we can do no better than to cite textually a fragment of the study by Pierre Dujols, the learned and scholarly philosopher, dedicated to the Knight Brothers in his general bibliography of occult sciences. The temple, says the author, we can no longer maintain the negative, we're truly affiliated to Manichaeism. Besides, the thesis of Baron de Hammer is in line with this opinion. For him, the followers of Mardek, the Ismailians, the Albigensians, the Templars, the Freemasons, the Illuminated, etc., are tributaries of the same secret tradition emanating from this house of wisdom, Dar el Hikmet founded in Cairo in the 10th century by Hakem. The German academician, Nikolai concludes that it comes from a similar meaning and adds that the famous baptism, which he claims brings forth fire, was also a Pythagorean symbol. We will not dwell on the various opinions of Anion, Herder, Munter, etc., but we will pause for a moment on the etymology of the word Baphomet, the idea of Nikolai, which, if we accept it, would give the word a slight variation, beta phi eta sigma, dire, and mu tau, Received by Matis baptism, it has been observed, precisely, a rite of the name among neophytes. Indeed, Matis was an androgynous deity representing Naturam Natrans. Proclus textually says that Matis, that is Nu Tau Upsilon Rho Alpha Epsilon Rho Mu Iota Nu Epsilon Alpha, or Nature Egeminens, is the mother herself, the worshipped Aphrodite of the serpent's adorers. We also know that the Hellenes designated by the word Matis, the prudence venerated as the spouse of Jupiter. In short, this philological discussion, contested in such a manner, tells us that the Baphomet was the painted expression of Pan. Now, like the Templars, the Ephites had two baptisms, one, the water or exoteric baptism, the other, esoteric, that of the spirit or of the fire. This last one was called the baptism of Matis. Saint Justin and Saint Irenaeus refer to it as the illumination. It is the baptism of light of the Freemasons. This purification, the word is very topical here, is indicated on one of the Gnostic idols discovered by Mr. De Hammer, and of which he has given the design. She holds it in her lap, note the gesture, she speaks, a basin full of fire. This fact, which must have struck the learned Teuton, and with him all the symbolists, seems to have given rise to the origin of the famous myth of the Grail. Precisely, the learned Baron dissertates abundantly on this mysterious vase, whose exact significance is still sought. No one is ignorant. In the old Germanic legend, Tichel built a temple to the Holy Grail at Montsalvat, and entrusted it to the care of the Templar knights. Mr. De Hammer sees there the symbol of the Gnostic wisdom, a conclusion hastily reached after having burned it a long time ago. Let us be forgiven if we dare to suggest another point of view. The Grail, who doubts it today, semicolon is the highest mystery of the mystical chivalry and of the Masonic lore in the Enri. It is the voice of the Creator Fire, the deus ex machina that we no longer need to have with the wooden cross of the Rosicrucians. 
Titral thus built a mystical temple. It is to light the holy fire of the Vestals, the Mazdeans, and even the Hebrews, because the Jews maintained a perpetual fire in the Temple of Jerusalem. The twelve custodians recall the twelve signs of the zodiac, the twelve anointed Templars, the type of living fire. The vase of the idol of the barren hammer is identical to the vase pyrogen of the Parsis, which is represented full of flames. The Egyptians also possess this attribute. Serapis is often depicted with, on his head, the same object, namely Garal on the banks of the Nile. It was in this Garal that the priests conserved the material fire, as the pretrasses preserved the celestial fire of Ptah. For the initiates of Isis, the Garal contained the divine fire. Now, this fire god, which eternally incarnates in every creature, possesses, in the universe, its vital spark. It is the Agno immolated since the beginning of the world, that the Catholic Church offers to its faithful under the species of the Eucharist enclosed in the Siborium, as the sacrament of love. The Siborium, heaven forbid who thinks badly of it, semicolon just as the grail and the sacred craters of all religions, represents the female organ of generation, and corresponds to the cosmogonic base of Plato, to the cup of Hermes and of Solomon, to the arcanum of the mysteries. The Garal of the Egyptians is thus the key of the grail. In short, it is the same word. Indeed, by deformation, Garal has become Graal, then, with a kind of aspiration, grail. The blood that boils in the holy chalice is the fiery fermentation of life or of the generative mixture. We could only deplore the blindness of those who stubbornly refuse to see in this symbol, stripped of its veils to nudity, a profanation of the divine. The bread and the wine of the mystical sacrifice, it's the spirit or the fire in the matter, which, through union, propels life. That is why the Christian initiatory manuals, through the Gospels, allegorically speak to Christ, I am the vine, I am the living bread, I am going to put the fire into things, and I envelop it in the two signs of the food par excellence. Seven. Before leaving the lovely manor of the salamander, we will point out some more motifs placed on the first floor, which, without being as interesting as the previous ones, are not devoid of symbolic value. To the right of the pillar bearing the image of the woodcutter, we see two paired windows, one blind, the other glazed, at the center of the mullioned arch. On the first one, we discern a heraldic fleur-de-lis, emblem of the sovereignty of science, which later became an attribute of royalty. The sign of the adept and of the sublime knowledge by birth, represented in the royal armories at the time of the institution of the coat of arms, it has not lost the meaning given to it by tradition to designate superiority, preponderance, the value and dignity acquired. This is the reason why the capital of the kingdom added to its coat of arms three silver fleur de lis on a blue field. We also find, moreover, the significance of this symbol clearly explained in the annals of Nangis. The kings of France customarily bear on their arms a flower of the lily, sign and symbol of purity, if they say to all the world, faith, peace and full foliage are under the provision and by the grace of God, more abundantly in our kingdom than in any others. The two leaves of the lily, which are alone, signify sense and chivalry which guard faith. On the second window, a small porcine, round and lunar head, surmounted by a phallus, does not fail to pique curiosity. We discover there a very expressive indication of the two principles, whose conjunction generates the philosophical matter. This hieroglyph of the agent and patient, of sulfur and mercury, of the sun and the moon, philosophical parents of the stone, is eloquent enough to dispense us from further explanation. Between these windows, the middle column, serving as a capital, is similar to the one we described when studying the motifs of the entrance door. We therefore do not have to renew the interpretation already provided. On the column opposite, continuing to the right, a small angel with a clouded forehead is fixed, hands joined in the attitude of prayer. Further on, two windows, paired as the previous ones, bear above the lintel the image of two shields in the field decorated with three fleur-de-lis, which are the emblem of the threefold reiteration of each work, on which we are frequently elaborating in this analysis. The figures holding the place of capitals on the three columns of the window display respectively, from left to right, a man's head, which we believe to be the alchemist himself, the gaze directed toward the group of the philosopher's stone. In front, a single vertical crest surmounts this figure which bears on its chest a quartered shield, the distance and the smallness of the relief do not allow us to detail. Finally, a second angel exhibits the open book, the hieroglyph of the matter of the work, prepared and susceptible to manifest the spirit of the content. The pages open and reveal the substance Liber, the book, because its crystalline texture and lamellar material are composed of overlapping leaves like the pages of a book. Finally, carved from the mass of the extreme pillar, a kind of Hercules, 
completely nude, supports with great effort the enormous mass of an inflamed solar baphomet. Of all the sculpted subjects on the happy facade, this is the most rudimentary, whose execution is the least refined. Despite being from the same period, it appears certain that this little man, squat, misshapen, with a swollen belly, with disproportionately small general organs, had to be rough-hewn by some unskilled artist in second order. With the exception of the face, of a neutral physiognomy, everything else violently clashes in this ungracious caryatid. She stomps her feet on a curved mace, adorned with numerous teeth, like the mouth of a cetacean. Our Hercules could thus be meant to represent Jonah, this little prophet miraculously saved after having stayed three days in the belly of a whale. For us, Jonah is the image of the green lion of the sages, which remains three philosophical days enclosed in the mother substance, before rising by sublimation and appearing upon the waters. BL. X. Le Mans, Maison de Dame ETF. Bar relief du 16 degrees siècle. The dogma of the fall of the first man, says Dupiny de Verpierre, does not belong to Christianity alone. It also appears in Mosaism and the religion of the patriarchs. It was that belief, although altered and disfigured among all peoples of the earth, which is preserved in this decay of man through his sin. This fundamental dogma of Christianity, Moses wrote, Genesis, chap. 2 and 3, was not unknown in ancient times. The neighboring peoples of the origin of the world knew, by a uniform and constant tradition, that the first man had prevaricated, and that his crime had dressed in infamy all his lineage, and that his posterity would bear the burden of it. The fall of man, says Voltaire on the same subject, is the foundation of the theology of all ancient nations. According to Philolaus the Pythagorean, 5th century BC, the ancient philosopher said that the soul was buried in the body, like in a tomb, in punishment for some sin. Plato taught the same doctrine as the Orphics, and even more precisely. But, as it was recognized that man had come from the hands of God, and that he had been in a state of purity and innocence, Dicaeurtus, Plato, it was necessary to admit that the crime for which he was serving his sentence was posterior to his creation. The age of the Greek and Roman mythologies evidently comes from the idea of man's degeneration issuing from the hands of God. The monuments and traditions of the Hindus confirm the history of Adam and his fall. This tradition also exists among the Tibetan Buddhists. It was taught by the Druids, as well as by the Chinese and the ancient Persians. According to the books of Zoroaster, the first man and the first woman were created pure and subjected to Ormazd, their author. Araman saw them and was jealous of their happiness. He approached them in the form of a serpent, presented them with fruits and persuaded them that he was himself the creator of the universe. They believed him, and from then on, their nature became corrupted, and this corruption infected their posterity. The mother of our flesh or the woman as a serpent is celebrated in Mexican traditions, which represent her as fallen from their primitive state of happiness and innocence, as in Yucatan, in Peru, the Canary Islands, etc. The tradition of the fall existed also among the indigenous nations when the Europeans discovered these countries. The explorations that took place among various peoples to purify the infant soon after its birth bear witness to the widespread belief in the existence of this general belief. Ordinarily, says the learned Cardinal Gusset, this ceremony took place on the day a name was given to a child. Among the Romans, it was the ninth day for boys and the eighth for girls. On this day the lustralis aqua, the purifying water, was employed to purify the newborn. The Egyptians, Persians, and Greeks had a similar custom. At Yucatan, in America, on an important temple day, the priests saw water destined for this use on the child's head and gave it a name. In the Canary Islands, it was the women who performed this function in place of the priests the same expiations prescribed by the law among the Mexicans. During these ceremonies, on all altar garments that touched the child, the gesture was made to pass the child through the flame, as to purify both by water and by fire. The Tibetans, in Asia, have similar customs. In India, when giving a name to the child, after writing his name on his forehead and having plunged him three times into the water, the Brahmin or priest exclaims aloud, O oh God, pure, unique, invisible, and perfect, we offer you this child, born of a holy tribe, a vessel of your incorruptible and purified essence, through the water. Thus, as Bergier points out, this tradition necessarily goes back to the cradle of the human race, for if it had arisen among a particular people after dispersion, it would not have spread from one end of the world to the other. This universal belief in the fall of the first man was, moreover, accompanied by the expectation of a mediator, an extraordinary character who was supposed to bring about harmony and reconcile them with God. Not that this liberator was awaited by the patriarchs and by the Jews alone, 
who knew that he would appear among them, but also by the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Hindus, the Sumwa, the Arabs, the Persians, and by all the nations of Africa and America. Among the Greeks and Romans, this hope was shared by a few men, as Plato and Virgil testify. Moreover, as Voltaire points out, it was, since time immemorial, a maxim among the Indians and among the Chinese that the Savior would come from the West. Europe, on the contrary, said that he would come from the East. Under the biblical tradition of the fall of the first man, the philosophers, with their customary skill, concealed a secret alchemical order. It is, no doubt, what has brought us and allows us to. BL. 11. Chan. Vite, Ile et Vilaine, Port de Maison, Rue Notre Dame, 15 siècle, to explain the representations of Adam and Eve that we discover in some old lodges of the Renaissance. It's the scientific character of this intention that served as a type for our study. This demi philosophical figure, situated in Le Mans, shows us, on the first floor, a male figure bearing in his arms the branch for gathering the fruit of the tree of science, while Eve attracts the same branch towards her, helping herself by a cord. Both hold phylacteries, attributes laden with the expression of the characters, of an occult significance, different from that of Genesis. Coats of arms, generosity, are not spared by the great biblical masses, are adorned with a crown of foliage, of flowers and fruits, hieroglyphs of nature fecund, of abundance and of production. To the right and above, one distinguishes among the leprous rings, the image of the sun, while on the left appears that of the moon. These two hermetic stars come to accentuate and further specify the scientific quality and the expressive nature of the subject borrowed from the Holy Scriptures, pl. x. Let us note, in passing, that the laic scenes of the temptation are opposed to those of religious iconography. Adam and Eve are always separated by the trunk of the paradisiacal tree. In the majority of cases, the serpent, coiled around the trunk, is figured with a human head, hence this part of our bar-relief Gothic and the ancient Fontaine saint Maclou, in the church of that name, in Rouen, and on another large scene decorating a wall of the house called of Adam and Eve, in Montferrand, Puy de Dume, which seems to date from the end of the 14th century or the beginning of the 15th. At the stalls of Saint Bertrand de Cominges, haute Garon, the reptile uncovers a mammalian bust, endowed with arms and a woman's head. It is also a woman's head that the serpent of Vitre, sculpted on the arch of a pretty 15th century gate, Rue Notre Dame, PL. 11. By contrast, the group in massive silver of the Cathedral of Valladolid, Spain, remains in the realistic note. The serpent is represented in its natural aspect and holds, from its widely open mouth, an apple between its claws. Adamus, the Latin name of Adam, means made of red earth. It is the premier man of nature, the soul among human creatures who has been endowed with awareness by God. No previous basic compound, as far as Hermeticism is concerned, comparable to the basic matter joined to the spirit within the very substance created, immortal and indestructible. But God, according to Mosaic tradition, gave birth to the woman by individualizing, in separate and distinct bodies, these faculties which represent, in the tradition of the East as in the West, our original association with the unique body, the first Adam, becoming divided into an essential part in its original constitution and becomes effaced, the specific part, imperfect and mortal. The principal Adam, of whom we have never discovered any part which is figured, is represented by the Greeks Delta Alpha Mu Alpha Sigma or Delta Mu Eta Sigma, which means indomitable and still virgin, from the roots Alpha, privative, and Delta Alpha Mu Omega, to tame, which characterizes well the profound nature of the celestial first man as we perceive him in the profound substratum of his soul and in the terrestrial body, as the men we are, named Delta Mu Alpha Sigma, which philosophers talk so much about. Plato, in his Timaeus, gives us the following explanation. Of all the waters that we have called fusible, he says, the one which has the thinnest and most equal parts, the one that is the most dense, the one whose color is a sparkling yellow, the most precious of goods, gold, finally, is formed in such waters by the force of the heat of the sun, and, by reason of the density, is called adamant. Another body, similar to gold because of the smallness of its parts, but which has several spaces, where the density is less intense, which makes it less heavy than gold and at the same time lighter, thanks to the excesses that it contains, is also called larane. When the portion of earth it contains is separated by the action of time, it becomes visible by itself, and it is given the name bronze. This passage of the Great Initiator teaches us the distinction between the two successive qualities of the symbolic atom, which are described under their mineral expression proper to the steel and the bronze. Now, the neighboring substance adamant, or indomitable arane ore, is the second atom, 
considered in the organic kingdom as the true father of all men, and in the mineral kingdom as the agent and creator of metallic individuals as geological constitution. Anonymous gives us the sulfur and mercury, generative agents of metals, which were originally only one and the same matter, and it is only later that they acquire their individuality in nature, as the powers in us keep us bound in their union. And although this is maintained by a powerful cohesion, art can nevertheless break and isolate the principle and ensure it under the form which is most appropriate. The sulfur, active by itself, is disguised by the oblique agent and by the second atom, and the mercury, passive element, by its female Eve. This last element or mercury, recognized as the most important, is also the most difficult to obtain in the practice of the work. Under the title science should owe its name, since the hermetic physique is founded on the knowledge of the mercury, in Greek epsilon rho mu sigma. This is what the bar-relief expresses, accompanying and bordering the pano of Adam and Eve on the man's house. We notice Bacchus there, draped in his tharsis, a large bunch of grapes emerging from a pot, and standing on the cover of a large vase opening onto the lands. Now, Bacchus, emblematic divinity of the sage's mercury, carries the significance of the secret attributed to Eve, mother of the living. In Greece, the same association was established with Eve, mother by her root Epsilon Alpha, Epsilon Alpha Nu, surname of Bacchus. What, but you who were destined to contain the wine of philosophers, or mercury, they are quite eloquent enough to dispense us from highlighting the esoteric meaning. But this explanation, logical and conforming to the doctrine, is however insufficient to provide the reason for certain peculiarities of experimental and some obscure points of practice. It is indispensable that the artist cannot pretend to the acquisition of the original matter, that is to say of the first atom formed of red earth, and that the subject of the sage's prime matter, the primitive motive of art, is far removed from the simplicity inherent in that of the second atom. This subject is, however, properly the mother of the work, as Eve is the mother of men. It is she who dispenses to bodies more exactly what is revived, vitality, vegetability, the possibility of mutation. We therefore say, and we address those who already have some tincture of science, that the common mother of alchemical metals does not enter into substance in the grand work, although it is impossible, without her, to produce or undertake anything. It is indeed through her intervention that the vulgar metals, real and only agents of the stone, are transformed into philosophical metals. It is through her that they are dissolved and purified. It is she who retrieves and returns to the earth the dead, as dead they were, and become living again. It is she who nourishes them, makes them grow, fructify, and allows them to multiply. It is, finally, by returning to the maternal bosom that once formed and revealed them, that they are reborn and recover the primitive faculties of which human industry had deprived them. Eve and Bacchus are the symbols of this philosophical and natural substance, not however primary in the sense of the unity or the universality, commonly called by the name of Hermes or Mercury. Now, we know that the messenger God served as an intermediary between the powers of Olympus and humans in the mythological role analogous to that of Mercury in the Hermetic labor. This better explains the special nature of his action, and why it does not mix with bodies which are suited to engender animals, and it is no surprise given that it corresponds with pure Basile Valentine, when he assures that the metals are twice born of Mercury, children of a single mother, regenerated by it. And we can better reconcile the dispute, or rather avoid it entirely, that one side casts across the chessboard, when they agree, almost unanimously, that Mercury is the unique matter of the work, while the necessary reactions are only provoked by him, whether it is said metaphorically or considered from a particular point of view. It is not useless to learn that, if we need the Phyllis of Sibel, of Ceres, or Bacchus, it is only because it contains the mysterious body which is the embryo of our stone. If we need a vessel, it is only to place the body, and no one ignores that, without proper earth, any seed would become futile. Thus, we cannot do without a vessel, although the content is infinitely more precious than the container, the latter being doomed, sooner or later, to separate from it. Water has no shape in itself, although it is capable of embracing all forms and taking on the shape of the vessel that contains it. That is the reason for our need of the vessel and its necessity, and why philosophers have so recommended it as the indispensable vehicle, the obliged excipient of our bodies, and this truth finds its justification in the image of Bacchus' child standing on the cover of the hermetic vessel. From what proceeds, it is especially important to retain that the metals, liquefied and dissociated by mercury, regain the vegetative power they possessed at the moment of their appearance on the physical plane. The dissolving agent acts somehow for them as the office of a true fountain of youth. It separates from them the heterogeneous impurities imported by their imperfections, gives them back the infirmities contracted over the centuries, it revives them, rejuvenates them and refreshes them. 
Thus the vulgar metals find themselves renewed and almost returned to a state close to their original state, that is to say, philosophical living metals. Now, since they resume, thanks to the mercury, their mother, their primitive faculties, we can assure that they have approached her and have taken on a nature analogous to her own. But it is obvious on the other hand, that they would not know, because of this extraction, a conformity of complexion, engendering new bodies with their mother, she having only a renovating power and not a generative one. Hence, we must conclude that the mercury we speak of, which is represented by Eve of the Mosaic Eden, is not the one that the sages have designated as being the matrix, the receptacle, the suitable vase to the raw metal, qualified as sulfur, son of the philosophers, seed metallic and father of the stone. Mercury, the first, which the masters, with the aim of perfecting, make it equally difficult to name mercury, and the differentiation of these two mercuries, one an agent of renovation, the other of procreation, constitutes the most thankless study that science could reserve for a neophyte. It is with the intention of helping him to overcome this barrier that we have dwelt on the myth of Adam and Eve, to try to shed light on these obscure points, voluntarily left in the shadows by the best masters themselves. Few among them have been content to allegorically describe the union of sulfur and mercury, generators of the stone, which they name sun and moon, father and mother philosophical, fixed and volatile, agent and patient, male and female, eagle and lion, Apollo and Diana of which some have made Apollonius of Tiana, Gabricius, and Bea, Irv met them in, the two columns of the temple, Jacob and Boaz, the old man and the young virgin, finally, brother and sister, more precisely, the brother and the sister. Because they are truly brother and sister, holding each other being of one nature, real adversaries because of the contrariety of their temperaments rather than the difference of age and evolution than by their affinities. The anonymous author of the ancient War of the Knights, in a discourse he makes pronounced by the metal reduced to sulfur under the action of the first mercury, teaches that the sulfur needs a second mercury, with which it must be conjoined in order to multiply its species. Among the artists, he says, who have worked with me, some have carried their work so far, that they have come to the point of separating me from the lion, which contains my nature, and by melting me with other metals and minerals, they have managed to communicate some of my virtues and some of my strength to the metals that have some affinity and some friendship with me. However, the artists who have succeeded on this path and who have surely found some part of the art are indeed a very small number, but as they have not, it has been impossible to determine the origin of the tinctures, it has proved impossible to push their work further, and they have not found the end of their endeavors very beneficial to their process. But if these artists had extended their research further, and if they had properly examined what is the woman most suitable for me, whom they sought and to whom they should be joined, it is then that I would have stained a thousand times more. In the Entretien du Doxet de Pyrophile, Limojon of Saint Didier writes about this commentary, the woman who is proper to the stone and who must be united to it is this living water fountain whose source, entirely celestial, which particularly centers itself in the sun and in the moon, produces this clear and precious stream of the sages, which flows into the sea of philosophers, which envelops the whole world. It is not without foundation that this divine fountain is called by this author the woman of the stone. Some have represented her under the form of a celestial nymph, Others give her the name of the chaste Diana, whose purity and virginity are not soiled by the spiritual link that unites her to the stone. In a word, this magnetic conjunction is the marriage of heaven and earth, of which some philosophers have spoken. It is so that the secondary source of the physic tincture, which operates such great marvels, takes birth from this mysterious conjugal union. These two mothers, or Mercuries, that we have just distinguished, are represented under the emblem of the two roosters on the stone panel located on the second floor of the house in Le Mans, pl. 12. They accompany a vase filled with leaves and fruits, symbol of their capacity to animate, generate and vegetate, of the fecundity and the abundance of the productions that result from it. On each side of this motif, seated characters, one blowing into a horn, the other plucking a kind of guitar, perform a musical duo. This is the translation of this art of music, conventional epithet and alchemy to which the various sculpted subjects on the façade relate. But before continuing the study of the motifs of the house of Adam and Eve, we believe we should warn the reader that, under very veiled terms, our analysis contains the revelation of what is commonly called the secret of the two Mercuries. Our explanation, however, would withstand examination, and whoever will take the trouble to follow it will not be disappointed by the result. It has been impossible to determine the origin of the tinctures. It has proved impossible to push their work further and they have not found the end of their endeavors very beneficial to their process. But if these artists had extended their research further, and if they had properly examined what is the woman most suitable for me, 
whom they sought and to whom they should be joined, it is then that I would have stained a thousand times more. In the Entretien Judax et de Pyrophile, Limojon of Saint Didier writes about this commentary. The woman who is proper to the stone and who must be united to it is this living water fountain whose source, entirely celestial, which particularly centers itself in the sun and in the moon, produces this clear and precious stream of the sages, which flows into the sea of philosophers, which envelops the whole world. It is not without foundation that this divine fountain is called by this author the woman of the stone. Some have represented her under the form of a celestial nymph. Others give her the name of the chaste Diana, whose purity and virginity are not soiled by the spiritual link that unites her to the stone. In a word, this magnetic conjunction is the marriage of heaven and earth, of which some philosophers have spoken. It is so that the secondary source of the physic tincture, which operates such great marvels, takes birth from this mysterious conjugal union. These two mothers, or Mercuries, that we have just distinguished, are represented under the emblem of the two roosters on the stone panel located on the second floor of the house in Le Mans, pl. 12. They accompany a vase filled with leaves and fruits, symbol of their capacity to animate, generate and vegetate, of the fecundity and the abundance of the productions that result from it. On each side of this motif, seated characters, one blowing into a horn, the other plucking a kind of guitar, perform a musical duo. This is the translation of this art of music, conventional epithet and alchemy, to which the various sculpted subjects on the façade relate. But before continuing the study of the motifs of the house of Adam and Eve, we believe we should warn the reader that, under very veiled terms, our analysis contains the revelation of what is commonly called the secret of the two Mercuries. Our explanation, however, would withstand examination, and whoever will take the trouble to follow it will not be disappointed by the result. Discard, it will encounter certain contradictions, manifest lapses of logic or of judgment. Now, we loyally recognize that there is but one Mercury at the base, and that the second, is necessarily derived from the first. It is convenient, however, to draw attention to the dualities they involve which affect, in the manner of the Mercury, the price of a twist of the reason or an improbability. How can we distinguish them, identify them, and how is it possible to extract, directly, the proper wife of sulfur, mother of the stone, from the womb of our primitive mother, allegory of the Kabbalistic doctrine and the allegory of tradition? Our goal, having chosen to come to the aid of the workers not familiar with parables and metaphors, the use of allegory and Kabbalah was forbidden to us. Would it have been better to act like many of our predecessors and not say anything? We do not think so. What would we have written, if we had already found it written by others? We have therefore preferred to provide, in clear language, a demonstration ab absurdo, through which it became possible to unveil the arcanum that has until now remained obstinately hidden. The process, moreover, does not belong to us, the authors, and they are numerous, among whom we find no similar eloquences, throw us the first stone. Above the roosters, the guardian bird fructifying, there is a panel in high relief of large dimension, unfortunately very mutilated, which figures the abduction of Dionyra by the center Nessos, pl. 12. The fable recounts that Hercules, having obtained from Aeneas the hand of Dionyra for having triumphed over the river god Achelous, our hero, in the company of his new spouse, wanted to cross the river of Venus. Nessos, who was in the vicinity, offered to transport Dionyra to the other bank. Hercules was wrong to consent and quickly realized that the centaur was trying to take her away from him. An arrow, dipped in the blood of the hydra and launched with a sure hand, stopped him in his tracks. Nessos, feeling that he was dying, then handed Dionyra his tunic soaked in his blood, assuring her that it would serve to recall her husband if he were to leave her for other women. Later, the credulous wife, having learned that Hercules was searching for the centaur Nessos who had attempted to carry her off, sent to her father the news of her victory over the river god Achelous. She could not be convinced that she should resist the atrocious pains. But not being able to resist so much suffering, she threw herself into the flames of a pyre lit by herself and lit by her own hands and died of despair. Dionyra, by carrying out the last operations of the magisterium, it is this which is referred to as the fermentation of the stone by gold, in order to orient the work towards the metallic regime and to limit its use to the transmutation of metals. Nessos represents the philosophical stone, not yet determined or affected by one of the great natural genres, whose color varies from a brilliant scarlet. New Sigma Sigma Omicron Sigma, in Greek, means clothing or garment, and the bloody tunic of the centaur, which burns more than infernal fire, indicates the perfection of the product achieved, mature and filled with tincture. Hercules symbolizes the raw gold which the refractory virtue of the agents most incisive cannot be conquered except by the action of a fiery red garment, or blood of the stone. 
The gold, which pays the penalty for the perfection that the stone and it gives in exchange for the tincture, takes back what the work has made him lose. Juno, queen of the work, thus secures the reputation and glory of Hercules, whose mythic apotheosis finds its material realization in the fermentation. The very name of Hercules, Rho Alpha Kappa Lambda Sigma, indicates that he assures the celebrity of the succession of works which were indeed the roots and to spread his renown, Rho Alpha, Juno, and Kappa Lambda Omicron Sigma, glory, reputation, renown. Deonyra, wife of Hercules, personifies the mercurial principle of gold, which struggles with the sulfur to which it is conjoined, but nevertheless succumbs under the ardor of the fiery tunic. In Greek, Gamma Omega Nu Zeta Omicron Mu Alpha Iota derives from Gamma Nu, hostility, struggle, agony, on the face of two engaged pillars bordering the mythological scene which we have come to study the esotericism, their figures on one side a lion's head with wings, on the other a head of a dog or bitch. These animals are also represented in their complete form on the lion, hieroglyph of the fixed principle, and the eagle which symbolizes volatile sulfur, bear wings so that the dissolving agent, sulfur, by reducing the metal, provides to sulfur the volatile quality without which its conjunction with mercury would become impossible. Some authors have described the important operation of the allegory of the fight of the eagle and the lion, of the volatile and the fixed, a battle sufficiently explained elsewhere. As for the symbolic dog, the direct successor of the Egyptian Sinocephalus, it is the philosopher Artephius who gave it the right of citizenship among the figures of alchemical iconography. He speaks, indeed, of the dog of Khorasan or of the bitch of Armenia, emblems of sulfur and mercury, parents of the stone. But while the word Rome U Epsilon Nu Iota Omicron Sigma signifies that which has a disposition prepared and disposed of towards the work at hand, indicating the passive and feminine principle, the dog of Khorasan, whose name is derived from the Greek Kappa Rho Alpha Sigma, equivalent to crow, a word which still served to designate a certain voracious fish upon which, if we had the license, we could say curious things. The sons of science that their perseverance has led to the threshold of the sanctuary know that after the knowledge of the dissolving universal mother we call Eve, and it is not the least important, the metallic sulfur, the first son of Adam, effective generator of the stone, which receives the name of Cain. Now, Cain signifies acquisition, and what, the artist acquires first is the black and enraged dog spoken of in the texts, the crow, the first witness of the magistery. It is also according to the version of the cosmopolite, the fish without a, echinus or venom, which in our mother tongue means a provoked fish. Jean Joachim Distingel of Engrofont asserts that possessing once the little fish called remora, which is very rare, to say the least unique in this great sea, you will not need to fish, but only to think of the preparation and the cooking of this small fish. And, although it is preferable not to extract it from the milieu in which it lives, leaving it with enough water to maintain its vitality, those curious enough to purely and simply control the exactitude of the asserted philosophical ideas. This is our microcosmic, minute volume from the mass from which it comes, having the external appearance of a biconvex lentil, often circular, sometimes elliptical. From a more earthy than metallic aspect, this light, invisible but very soluble, hard, brittle, crumbly, black on one face, whitish on the fracture of the other, violet in its breakage, has received various names relative to its form, its coloration, or certain chemical peculiarities. It is the secret prototype of the popular ben the soldier's cake, beta mu mu omega sigma, paranum of kappa 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 omicron sigma, noisy bleeder, it is also the caucus, beta sigma sigma iota nu omicron nu, and its sound, of which the Greek name, beta sigma sigma omicron sigma, which resembles so much that of the clog, has for root beta sigma sigma omicron sigma, which expresses, precisely, the noise of a spinning top. It is also the little pea fish called Chabot, from which Perot derived his puss in boots, the famous Marquis de Carabas, from Kappa Rho Alpha, Head, and Beta Alpha Sigma Iota Lambda Epsilon Sigma, King, of the heroic legends where the Korea or final youth are gathered under the title of the Counts of our Mother Wa. It is, finally, the Basilic of the Fable, the Basiliscus, the little regular, Regulus, little king, or the toilet, Beta Alpha Sigma Iota Lambda Iota Sigma Kappa Omicron Sigma because of the white and gray of the humble Cinderella, the soul, the flat fish whose each face is differently colored and whose name is related to the sun, Lot, Saul, Solis, etc. In the spoken language of the adepts, however, this body is hardly designated otherwise than by the term violet, the first flower that the wise man sees born and bloom, sprouting from the pot of the work, transforming a new color the green of his garden. But here, 
We believe we must suspend this teaching and keep the prudent silence of Nicholas Valois and of Cursetinus, the only ones, to our knowledge, who revealed the verbal epithet of sulfur, or the hermetic sun. Louis Destisic Governor of Poitou and of Saint-Ange Grand Officer of the Crown and Hermetic Philosopher Part 1. It is the mysterious side of a historical figure who revealed himself through one of his works. Louis Destisic, a man of high standing, indeed turns out to be a practicing alchemist and one of the most educated adepts in Hermetic Arcana. Where did he get his knowledge? Who gave it to him? Certainly the first elements. We do not know exactly. But we like to believe that the learned doctor and philosopher Francois Rabelais could well have been involved in his initiation. Louis d'Estissac, born in 1507, was the own nephew of Geoffroy d'Estissac, and lived in the house of his uncle, the superior of the Benedictine Abbey of Malesais, which had established its priory not far from Liguge, Vienne. Now, it is well known that Geoffroy d'Estissac had long maintained with Rabelais relations marked by the most lively and cordial friendship. In 1525, we learn from H. Clouseau, our philosopher was at Liguge, in the capacity of an attaché in service of Geoffroy d'Estissac. Jean Boucher, adds Clouseau, the prosecutor poet who informs us so well about the life led at Liguge, in the prayer of the Reverend Bishop, does not specify, unfortunately, the functions of Rabelais, secretary of the prelate? It is possible. But why not preceptor of his nephew, Louis d'Estissac, who was not yet 18 years old and would not marry until 1527? The author of Gargantua and of Pantagruel gives such developments on the education of his hero, whom we must assume his tradition is not purely theoretical, but also the fruit of an earlier practical endeavor. Moreover, Rabelais seems to have never ceased to remind us of this, but not in a noticeable manner, to Madame d'Estissac, in 1536, about the medicinals and a thousand little wonders, objects of curiosity, a good market where we brought Cyprus, of the order of St. John. He echoes an anecdote of the Cordeliers from Lotais, called Coulon Le Yo in the fourth book of Pantagruel, that our philosopher, pursued by the hatred of his enemies, would, around 1550, seek refuge with Louis d'Estissac, heir of the protector of Rabelais, the Bishop of Malesais. Whatever the case may be, this leads us to believe that the search for the philosophical stone, in the 16th and 17th centuries, was more active than one might think and that certain successes of the spagyric operation would have been credited to the cross, which the small minority is inclined to grant them. If they remain unknown to us, it is much less because of the absence of documents relating to their science, than our ignorance of some traditional knowledge, which was not put down in writing. It is probable that by forbidding, by his letters patent of 1537, the use of printing, Francois I was the determining cause of this lack of works which we mark as from the 16th century, and the promoter therefore of an oral symbolism which dates back to the beautiful medieval period. The stone substitutes for parchment, and the ornamental carving comes to the aid of the prohibited printing. This temporary aid to thought, from the allegory written in the form of a parable read by the masses at times, deserves particular interest for the study of the artistic versions of the old alchemy. Already at a young age, the masters from whom we possess the treaties love to provide for their disciples signs and coded hieroglyphs. At the time when Jean Estruc lived, the doctor of Louis XV, that is to say around 1720, there existed in Montpellier, in the street of Canal, facing the Capuchins, a house which, according to tradition, would have been the retreat of Arnold de Villeneuve, around 1280, and had been built for him. There, sculpted on its door, two bari leaves representing one a roaring lion, the other a dragon biting its tail, emblems recognized by the great work. This house was destroyed in 1755. Son of disciple, Raymond Lola, returning from Rome, settled in Milan, then in Paris, Raymondus comes to the same conclusion at the convent of the Jacobins. There, he who had called Pantagruel by his real name gives his lessons. In this town, even into the 18th century, the house where Lola had lived still stood. The entrance was decorated with hieroglyphic figures pertaining to science, as resulted from a passage of the treatise of Berichius on the origin and the progress of chemistry. It is known that the houses, Churches and hospitals built by Nicolas Flamel served as a medium for the diffusion of images of sacred art. His own house, called Flamel, built in 1376 on the street of Marivaux near the Saint-Jacques Tower, said the Chronicle, was completely adorned with historical paintings and contemporary emblems. Louis d'Estissac, contemporary of Rabelais, Denis Zachaire, and Jean Lalemant, also wanted to dedicate to science a residence worthy of it. He formed, 30 years later, 
The project of a symbolic interior where the carefully distributed and concealed secret signs guided his work. The subjects well established, suitably unveiled, so that the profane could not discern the mysterious essence. The main lines of the halted architecture, he entrusted the execution to an architect who may have been. This is at least the opinion of M. de Rochebrun, Philibert de Lorme. Thus was born the superb chateau of coulon sur lautaise du Sèvre, whose construction demanded 76 years, from 1542 to 1568, but which today offers nothing more than an empty interior with stripped walls. The furniture, the porches, the sculpted stones, the ceilings and even up to the turrets of the corner, everything has been dispersed. Some of these pieces of art were acquired by the celebrated aquafortist, Etienne Octave de Guillaume de Rochebrun, and served to reflect on and beautify his property of Fontenay-le-Comte, Vendée. It is indeed in the Chateau of Terre-Neuve, where the models are still preserved, that we can admire and study them at leisure. This, moreover, by the abundance, the variety, the originality of the artistic pieces it contains, seems rather like a museum than a bourgeois residence of the time of Henry IV. The most beautiful ceiling of the Chateau of Coulon, which once adorned the vestibule and the treasury room, now covers the Grand Salon of Terre-Neuve, denominated the Auteur. It is composed of large coat of arms, variants, among them those bearing the date of 1550 and the monogram of Diane de Poitiers as encountered at the Chateau d'Annette. This detail has led to the supposition that the plans of the Chateau of the Long Walls could belong to the Charentais architect, Pontus. We will investigate further on the ancient monogram adopted by Lorme. A secret evolution that so many magnificent logs, on the high rafters, were falsely attributed to Diane de Poitiers. First, simple wood, then, in 1595 by Jean Morrison, for the account of Nicolas Rapin, vice seneschal of Fontenay le Comte and the manuscript tinged, thus we learn a manuscript written by Mr. de Rochebrun of Terre Neuve Castle, probably composed under the porch, was composed. The inscription, in green, which is under the porch, was composed by Nicolas Rapin himself. We give it here with its layout and orthography maintained, in Old French. Fence. Sofles. N. Toth. Saison. QBE. Bon. Air. N. Set. Mason. BN. Jamais. Ni. Fief. Ni. Este. Ni. Lay. Mavox. QBI. Bien. Dixes. Envy. Varel. Of. Process. Sevels. QBI. Psi. Tiendrant. Ni. Moleste. In English that is. Winds. Blow. In. Every. Season. That. Good. Air. In. This. House. Never. Fever. Nor. Pestilence. Nor. The. Evils. That. Come. From. Excess. Envy. Quarrel. Or. Lawsuit. Those. WHO. Stay. Here. Be. Not. Troubled. But it's thanks to the aesthetic sense of the poet by Seneschal, and especially the taste of Mr. de Rochebrun's successors, that we owe the incredible survival of so many artworks. It is not our intention to provide a catalog of the rich collections. We randomly mention, for the argument, some curiosities at houses, amorous and provocative paintings, high-quality tapestries from Vendée, Louis XIII doors, coming from Shalini, near St. Hermina, a door porter of the Grand Salon, original from Poitiers, the chair of door porters of Mr. de Mercy, Bishop of Lucin in 1773, wooden boiserie styles of Louis XV and Louis XVI, eagle consoles on this door at Chambord, a panelled tapestry of the Gablon, 1670, donated by Louis XIV, very beautiful wood sculptures, 16th century, from the library of the Chateau of the Hermeau, Vendée, tapestries of Henri II, trios of little paintings under a slate entitled Triumphs of the Gods, representing the triumphs of Venus, Bologna, and Minerva, woven in silk in the Flanders and attributed to the Bachelier family. E.L. 12. Le Mans, Maison de Dame ETF, 16 siècle, L'On Levement de Dejanire. E.L. 13. Nampain, fontenay le Comte, Chateau de Terre-Neuve, Cheminet du Grand Salon. Furniture, Louis XIV furniture very well preserved and sacristy furniture. Engravings from the best masters of the 17th and sacristy series almost complete from the 15 and 17 centuries. It can still be seen. Complete set of arms of the 16th and 17th centuries. Chinese plates enameled with the arms of Abasso, 
Florentine bronzes, the library containing the works of the most famous architects as books that are still sought after. Du Cerceau, Dieterlin, Bullant, Lepiter, Philibert de Lorme, etc. The one that interests us the most, without contradicting it, is the monumental fireplace in large cut stone, rebuilt at the Terre Nueve Castle in 1868. Plus the end of the execution, the exactitude of the hieroglyphs which decorated, the finish of the execution, the rectitude of the cutting sometimes pushed to the point of force and its surprising conservation as much by its artistic aspect, it constitutes for the disciples of Hermes a precious and very useful document to consult. PL. 13. Certainly, art criticism would have some reason to address this stone work, common to the decorative productions of the Renaissance, of being heavy, inharmonious and cold, despite its sumptuous aspect and the spread of a luxury too ostentatious. There would be a need to relieve the excessive heaviness of the mantle bearing on thin legs, the surfaces poorly balanced between them, the paucity of shape, of invention, painfully masked under the brilliance of the ornaments, the moldings, the arabesques lavished with a vain ostentation. As for us, we will voluntarily set aside the sentimental aesthetic of a brilliant but superficial era, where affectation and mannerism replace the absent thought and the failing originality, to occupy ourselves only with the initiatory value of the symbolism to which this chimney serves at once as a pretext and support. The mantle, architectured in the manner of an entablature loaded with intertwining and symbolic figures, rests on two stone pillars, cylindrical and polished. On their abacuses rests a lintel, fluted, under a quarter round of ovolo and flanked by three acanthus leaves. Above, four caryatids embraced, two males and two females, support the cornice, the females, their hair adorned with a garland, while the male presents a lion mask, biting, in the form of a ring, the lunar crescent. Between the caryatids, three panels of frieze develop various hieroglyphs in decorative form, intended to better conceal. The cornice is horizontal, divided into two stages, the first adorned with carved and pierced meadow peas, the second with four panels bearing, engraved, the date of execution, Mars 1563. They frame the four seasons, each represented by an emblematic figure. Three parts of a Latin phrase, nascento quotidi morimar, in English that is every day we are born, we die. Finally, the upper part shows six small panels, arranged in pairs, from the extremities towards the center. On them one can see shield-shaped panels, bucraniums, and near the median axis, hermetic shields. Such are, briefly described, the most interesting emblematic pieces for the alchemist. It is these that we will now analyze in detail. The first of the three panels separated by caryatids, the one on the left, features a central flower, our hermetic rose, two shells of the kind called penya or cockles of Compostela, and two human heads, one of an old man at the bottom, the other of a cherub at the top. We discover there the formal indication of the materials necessary for the work and the result that the artist expects. The mask of the old man is the emblem of the primary mercurial substance to which, the philosophers say, all metals owe their origin. You must not ignore, writes Limojon de Saint Didier, that our old man is our mercury, that this name suits him because he is the primary matter of all metals. The cosmopolite says that he is their water, to which he gives the name of steel and diamond, and he adds, for a greater confirmation of what I am about to reveal to you, see undecis coit orum cum eo, emitit suum semen, et debilitator usque ad mortem usque, concipit chalubs, et generate filium patre clarirum. One can see, at the western portal of the Chartres Cathedral, a very beautiful 12th century statue where the same esotericism is luminously expressed. It is a large stone old man, crowned and aureoled, which already signs his hermetic personality, draped in the ample mantle of the philosopher. From the right hand, he holds a cythera. Standing between the two seashells with human faces as if it were the calabash of pilgrims, one finds, issuing forth like the dual spouts of a monstrance with a human head, a throne, and bird's claws, P.L. 14. These monsters of which one is covered with feathers and the other with scales, and the composition and assembly under another rough form, provide that secret substance we call mercury, and which alone suffices to complete the entire work. The calabash, which is the only vessel capable of carrying out the full operation, the dissolving virtues of this mercury, the image of the peregrinating and noble cabalist, denoted pilgrim or voyager. It is, in the motifs of our hermetic chimney, the figure of the shells of St. James, also called benediers because they hold the holy or blessed water, qualifications that the ancients applied to mercurial water. But here, in a pure chemical sense, 
These two shells teach the investigator that the regular and natural proportion requires two parts of dissolvent against one of the fixed body. From this operation, done according to the art, a new body comes forth, regenerated, a volatile essence, represented by the cherub with the angel who dominates the composition. Thus, the death of the old man gives birth to the child and ensures its vitality. Philolethes was not wrong when he insisted, to reach the goal, to kill the living in order to resuscitate the dead. In taking, he says, the gold which is dead and the water which is living, one forms a compound in which, by a brief decoction, the seed of the gold becomes living, while the living mercury is killed. The spirit coagulates with the body, and both are purified in the form of lemon, until the members of this compound are reduced to atoms, such is the nature of our magistery. This substance, this double compound, perfectly dead, augmented and multiplied, becomes the agent of wonderful. Transformations that characterize the philosophical stone, the hermetic rose, according to the firm, artisanal or horrific philosophy, it must first give the white rose, the rose that is sometimes white and sometimes red. They are the two flowers on the same philosophical rose bush, which Flamel describes to us in the book of hieroglyphic figures. They also embellish the frontispiece of the Mutus Liber and we see them flowering, in a crucible, where the engraving of Gobil illustrates the twelfth key of Basile Valentine. We know that the heavenly virgin bears a crown of white roses, and it is not ignored that the red rose is the signature reserved for the initiated ones. In the higher order, or rose qua, and it is the term of rose qua that allows us, by explaining it, to complete the description of the first panel, beyond the alchemical symbolism, whose meaning is already quite transparent, we discover another hidden element, that of the high degree held, in the initiatory hierarchy, by the man to whom we owe the motifs of this hieroglyphic architecture. It is without doubt that Louis de Stissic had obtained the title through excellent merit of hermetic nobility. The central rose, indeed, emerges in the middle of a St. Andrew's cross formed by the elevations of stone banderoles that we can suppose to have first covered and enclosed it. This is the great symbol of manifested light, which is indicated by the Greek letter X, Chi, the initial of the words Chimia, Chrysos and Kronos, the crucible, the gold and the time, triple unknown of the great work. The cross of St. Andrew, Chi Iota Alpha Sigma Mu Alpha, which has the form of our X French, is the hieroglyph, reduced to its simplest expression, of the radiant and divergent emanations of a single ray. It thus appears as the graphic of the spark. On one can multiply the ray, it is impossible to simplify it further. These inner cross lines give the schema of the sparkle of the stars, of the radiant dispersion of all that shines, lights up, radiates. Also, we have made the seal, the mark of illumination and, by extension, of the spiritual revelation. The Holy Spirit is always represented by a dove in full flight, its wings spread according to an axis perpendicular to that of the body, that is to say, in the form of a cross. For the Hermetic cross and that of St. Andrew have, hermetically, exactly the same significance. We frequently encounter the image of the dove completed by a glory which comes to specify the hidden meaning, just as we can see on the religious scenes of our primitives and on pure alchemical sculptures. The Greek X and the French X is the writing of light by the light itself, the trace of its passage, the manifestation of its movement, the affirmation of its reality. It is the true signature. Until the 12th century, one did not use any other mark to authenticate old charters. From the 15th century, the cross became the signature of the illiterates. In Rome, it is the complete number of a white cross and the incomplete figures of a black cross. It is the complete and perfect number of the work, because unity, the two natures, the three principles that the student must dominate, the double quintessence, the two V's joined in the center give the number 10 the number of the absolute, which forms the X. In this figure is found the base of the Kabbalah of Pythagoras, the universal language, of which a curious paradigm can be seen on the last page of the alchemy book. The gypsies use the X as a sign of recognition, of reincarnation, guided by the graphic traced on a tree or somewhere, they always return exactly to the place occupied by their predecessors, next to the sacred spring they call Patria. One might think this word of Latin origin, because nomads apply this maxim to cats, living objects of art, who practice it. Patria est ubicum guest beni, because it is good there, that is the homeland. But it is a Greek word, pi alpha tau rho sigma, which claims their emblem, in the sense of family, race, tribe. The cross of the Romanicals or Gypsies thus indicates the place of refuge assigned to the tribe. It is singular, moreover, that almost all the significations revealed by the sign of X have a transcendent or mysterious value. X is the algebra where the unknown quantities are, it also poses the problem to be solved, the solution to be found, 
It is the Pythagorean sign of the multiplication of the element of the proof by arithmetic 9. It is the popular symbol of the mathematical sciences in which they are superior or abstract. It comes to characterize what, in general, is excellent, useful, remarkable, chi rho sigma iota mu omicron sigma. In this sense, and in the slang of the students, it serves to distinguish the Ecole Polytechnique, by assuring it a superiority that dunces and dear comrades would not admit to debate. The first, the candidates at the school, are united, in each promotion or class, by a cabalistic formula composed of an X and the angles opposed to a tope, where the chemical symbols of sulfur and the hydrate of potassium are represented as SX Co. And SX Co is as expressed, in agric jargon of course, sulfur and potash for X2. The X is the emblem of the measure, mu tau rho omicron nu, taken in all its senses, dimension, extent, space, duration, rule, law, limit or boundary. Such is the hidden reason for which the international prototype of a meter, made of iridium-plated platinum, is preserved in the pavilion of the weights and measures. Bertoy, at Sevra, sports the profile of X without its lower transverse stroke. All the bodies of nature, all beings, whether in their structure or in their aspect, obey this law. The law of the Gnostics is the application and supreme rule. And Jesus Christ, the incarnate spirit, Saint André at Saint Pierre embody the glorious and painful image. Have we not noticed that the aerial organs of vegetables, whether it's trees altered or tiny herbs, present with their roots the divergence characteristic of the branches of X? How do the leaves, the flowers, the plant lice, the vegetal tissues, appear, visually, the brightest, the most marvelous microscopic views, without confirming this divine will? Diatoms, bears, starfish will provide you with other examples, but, without looking further, open a consumable shell, the bivalve, on a plane, the shell of Saint-Jacques, and the two convex surfaces provided with grooves of the mysterious double fan of X. These are the cat's whiskers that gave it its name. One hardly doubts that they conceal a high point of science, and that this secret reason was worth the precious feline the honor of being raised to the rank of Egyptian deities. We recall the cat at the base of the famous Chat Noir, which brought back so many memories under the famous sign of Rodolphe Salas. But how many know what esoteric and political center was concealed there? What international masonry was hidden behind the sign of the artistic cabaret? On one hand the talent of a fervent youth, idealists, esthetes in search of glory, reckless, blind, incapable of suspicion, on the other, the confidences of a science exposed to the crude light of diplomacy, the double-faced painting, the design mixed with mysterious senaglossa. The table tourne des grands dukes, signed by the cat with scrutinizing eyes under its nocturnal livery, with the X-shaped whiskers, rigid and oversized, and whose heraldic pose gave the wings of the Montmartre mill a symbolic value equal to the sign, was not that of gutter princes. The founders of the Zeus, who makes Olympus tremble and seeds terror in humanity whether he throws lightning from his hand or strikes with his foot, or whether they fall from the talons of the eagle, spouse of the celestial ether, source of the radiance. This is the terrestrial translation of the potential or virtual fire that composes or disassembles, engenders or kills, vivifies or disorganizes son of the sun that generates, serves, and sustains him, the divine fire, fallen, decayed, imprisoned in heavy matter to determine the evolution and direct redemption, it is Jesus on his cross, the image of the igneous, luminous and spiritual irradiation incarnated in all things. It is the Agnus immolated since the beginning of the world, and it is also the Agni, Vedic god of fire, but if the Agno de Dieu carries the cross on his shoulder, it is like Jesus carries it on his shoulder, if he supports it with his foot, it is because he has the sign engraved in the foot itself, the image outside, reality within. Those who thus receive the spirit of the sacred fire that they carry within them and are marked by its sign, have nothing to fear from the elemental fire. These elect, disciples of Elijah and children of Helios, modern crusaders guided by the star of their elders, set out for the same conquest with the same cry from God Lavo. It is this superior and spiritual force, acting mysteriously within the heart of concrete substance, which compels the crystal to take on its aspect, its immutable characteristics, it is this which is the pivot, the, the generative energy, the geometrical will which, based on the cross, is the unlimited, albeit organized variation through condensation and rarefaction into a single form, the organized spider web captures the first manifestation of the soul, spirit, or fire. It's thanks to their corollary cross that spider webs retain insects, birds and fish in their nets without injuring them that metallic sails seize without wounding, that fabrics become flame-resistant to the inflammation of gases. In the vastness of space and in time, the immense cross cuts into the flames and ages, 
the eternal ide fix of the 24 centuries of the cyclical year, chi xi sigma comma that is the Greek number 666, which divide the 24 veiled old men of the apocalypse into four age groups, while the 12 types sing the praises of God, the other 12 have fallen away from man. What do we know of the decrepit ones who remain enclosed in this simple sign that Christians renew every day for themselves, always trying to understand the hidden virtue of the word, but for those who have the cross it is a toil, it is the instrument of the power of the Savior, a postulate of our faith. This is why it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will discard the knowledge of the learned. What have the wise become? What about the doctors of the law? Is it not believed that the leafy folio of the science of the century? How many know more than the onager that gave birth to the message? In Bethlehem, the humble child God, carried him, triumphing, to Jerusalem, and erected, in memory of the King of Kings, the magnificent black cross he carries on his spine? In the alchemical domain, the Greek cross and the cross of San Andre are signs that the artist must know. These graphic symbols, reproduced in a great number of manuscripts, and which in certain prints, are the object of a special nomenclature, represent, among the Greeks and their successors of the Middle Ages, the crucible of fusion, that the potters always made from a certain clay, kappa epsilon rho alpha mu iota kappa beta beta lambda omicron sigma that is the Greek term for potter's document or a book, an index of the born firmness and of the proven voice. But the Greeks also used a similar sign to designate an earthen crucible. We know that this vessel, given its very material, had a use that was necessarily different from that of the crucible. Moreover, the word matris, used in the same sense in the 13th century, comes from the Greek mutal rho iota xi, matrix, going to the maturation of the compound. Nicholas Flamel, a 15th century Parisian scribe, gives a figure of this secret vessel served for alchemy, and he calls it by the same matrix. The X translates the lateral all memoriate, that is, the salt of Ammon, mu mu omega nu iota chi chi sigma, that is to say, that he realizes the harmony, rho mu omicron nu alpha, assemblage, because of the assembly, the harmony of fire, that he is the mediator through the water and the earth, the spirit and the body, the volatile and the fixed. It is the sky and the earth, the qualification, the seal that reveals to man, by the sign, without any superficialities, the intrinsic virtues of the prime philosophical substance. Finally, the X is the Greek hieroglyph of the glass, pure matter above all, assure us the masters of the art, and the one who approaches perfection the most. We believe we have sufficiently demonstrated the importance of the cross, the depth of its esotericism and its preponderance in symbolism in general. It offers no less value or teaching when it comes to the practical realization of the work. This is the first key, the most considerable and the most secret of all, which can open to man the sanctuary of nature. Now, this key is always shown in apparent characters, traced by nature itself obeying the divine wills, on the cornerstone of the work, which is also the foundational stone of the church and of the Christian truth. Thus, in religious iconography, a key to St. Peter, has a particular attribute allowing to distinguish among the apostles of Christ, the one who the humble sinner Simon, Cabal, Chi, Mu Omicron Nu Omicron Sigma, the sole ray slash the single ray, and should become, after the death of the Savior, his representative, both spiritual and earthly. This is how we find it depicted on a very beautiful 16th century statue, carved in oak wood and preserved in the church of St. Ethel in London, P.L., 15. St. Peter, standing up, holds a key and shows the Veronica, a singularity which gives this remarkable image a unique, exceptionally interesting work. It is certain that from a hermetic point of view the symbolism is doubly expressed, since the meaning of the key is repeated in the holy face, a miraculous seal of our stone. Besides, the Veronica is offered here as a veiled replica of the cross, a major emblem of Christianity and signature of sacred art. Indeed, the word Veronique does not come as some authors have claimed, from the Latin vera iconica, true and natural image, which teaches us nothing, but from the Greek phi epsilon rho epsilon nu iota kappa omicron sigma, which brings victory, from phi rho omega, porter, that is to carry, produce, and nu kappa eta, victory. Such is the meaning of the Latin inscription in signo vincis, you will conquer by this sign, placed under the chi rho of Constantine, which corresponds to the Greek formula n tauto nika. The sign of the cross, the monogram of Christ and the X of St. Andrew and the key of St. Peter are two replicas of equal esoteric value, is thus indeed this mark, which is capable of ensuring victory through the certain identification of the unique substance exclusively affected by philosophical labor. St. Peter holds le clefs or the keys of paradise, although a single one would suffice to assure access to that celestial abode. 
But the cleft premier or the first key splits and these two interlaced symbols, one silver, the other gold, constitute, with the triregnum, the arms of the sovereign pontiff, heir to the throne of Peter. The cross of the Son of Man, reflected in the keys of the Apostle, reveals to men of good will the arcana of universal science and the treasures of hermetic art. It alone allows he who possesses the sense to open the door of the enclosed garden of the Hesperides and to gather, without fear for his salvation, the rose of the adept. From what we have said of the cross and the rose, which is at the center, or more exactly, liqueur or the heart, this bleeding, radiant and glorious heart of the Christ matter, it is easy to infer that Louis d'Estisic bore the exalted title of Rose Qua, a mark of higher initiation, a brilliant testimony of a positive science, substantiated in the substantial reality of the absolute. However, if no one can contest our adept's quality of Rose Qua, it should not be deduced from this fact that he belonged to the pathetic brotherhood of the same name. To conclude in this sense would be to commit an error. It is important to know how to discern the two rose qua so as not to confuse the true with the false. We will probably never know what obscure reason guided Valentin, Valentin Andrea, or rather the German author covered by the pseudonym, when he had printed, at Frankfurt on the Oder, around 1614, the pamphlet titled Fama Fraternitatis Rosicrucis. Perhaps he pursued a political goal, or he was looking for a counterbalance, by a fictitious occult power, the authority of the Masonic lodges, so that he wanted to provoke the grouping into a single fraternity, the depository of their secrets, of Rose Qua scattered a little everywhere. Whatever the case, the manifesto of the Brotherhood could not realize any of these senses, if it contributes to spreading in public the new doctrine of an unknown sect, endowed with the most extravagant attributions. To the testimony of Valentin Andrea, these embers, linked by an inviolable oath, submitted to a severe discipline, possessed certain truths and were able to accomplish all wonders. They called themselves invisible, said they were capable of making gold, silver, precious stones, to heal the paralytics, the blind, the deaf, all the contagious and all the incurables. They pretended to have the means to prolong human life beyond its natural limits, to converse with superior and elementary spirits, to discover hidden treasures, etc. Such a display of prodigies necessarily seized the imagination of the masses and justified the assimilation that was soon made of Rose Qua thus presented to magicians, sorcerers, Satanists and necromancers. A reputation quite discreditable that they shared, moreover, in some provinces, with the Freemasons themselves. Let us add that these were eager to adopt in their hierarchy this new title, whose degree, without seeking to know the symbolic significance in its real origin. In short, the mystical brotherhood, despite the benevolent affiliation of some learned personalities of which the manifesto surprised the good faith, has never existed anywhere except in the desire of its author. It's a fable and nothing more. As for the Masonic degree, it also has no philosophical importance. Finally, if we point out, without entering, these little chapels where one lazily takes on rank. Under the Rosicrucian banner, we will have embraced the various modalities of the apocryphal Rose Qua. As for the rest, we will not maintain that certain philosophers, more enthusiastic than sincere, who ascribe a lot to the extraordinary virtues of the universal medicine. If they attribute to the brothers what could only belong to the magistery, at least we find proof that his conviction was made on the reality of the stone. On the other hand, his pseudonym clearly shows that he knew well the occult truth contained in the symbol of the cross and the rose, an emblem used by the ancient magi and known throughout antiquity. By such a sign, we are led to see, after reading the manifesto, that a simple treatise on alchemy, no more awkward nor less expressive than so many other writings of the same order. The tomb of the knight Christian Rosenkreutz, the Christian Kabbalist and Rose Qua, presents a singular identity with the allegorical lair, furnished with a leaden chest, inhabited by the formidable guardian of the hermetic treasure, that fierce genie that the Sanj Verd calls Saganis Ajib. A light, emanating from a golden sun, illuminates the cavern and symbolizes this incarnated spirit, a divine spark trapped in things, of which we have already spoken. In the tomb are enclosed the multiple secrets of wisdom, and we cannot be otherwise surprised since, the principles of the work being perfectly known, the analogy naturally leads us to the discovery of truths about related facts. A more detailed analysis of this obscure pamphlet would teach us nothing new, except for a few conditions indispensable for prudence, discipline, and silence for the use of the adepts, judicious advice, no doubt, but superfluous. The true rose qua, the only ones who could carry this title and provide material proof of their science, have nothing to do. Living isolated, in their austere retreat, they are not afraid to be known, not even by their brethren. Some, however, 
occupy brilliant situations. Despondent, Jacques Kerr, Jean Lomon, Louis Destisic, the Count of Saint-Germain are among them. But they knew how to mask the origin of their fortune so well that no one could recognize the rose croix under the traits of the gentleman. What biographer would dare to certify that Philolethes, this friend of truth, made the pseudonym of the noble Thomas Vaughan and under the epithet of Seton, Le Latour, was hiding an illustrious member of a powerful Scottish family, the Lords of Winton. By attributing to the brothers this strange and paradoxical privilege of invisibility, Valentine Andrea recognizes the impossibility of identifying them, such as great travelers voyaging incognito under the habit and in the bourgeois equipment. They are invisible because they are unknown. Nothing characterizes them, except modesty, simplicity and tolerance, virtues generally despised in our vain civilization, carried to the ridiculous exaggeration of personality. Alongside personalities of the condition that we come to describe, other learned men preferred to wear without ostentation their Rosicrucian dignity among the laborious people, in a wanted modesty and in the daily exercise of humble jobs such as that of the unassuming Lariche, humble farrier, adept of the hermetic gem. This good man, of an exceptional modesty, would be a total stranger if Cambriel hadn't taken the trouble to name him, recounting how at a moment's notice he left to rekindle the Lyonnais candy, a young 18-year-old man that a lethargic crisis was about to carry away, 1774. Lariche shows us what true blood of his kind must do to live. If all the Rose Croix had held to that reserved manner of prudent living, we would not have had to mourn the loss of quality artists, carried away by clumsy zeal, a blind confidence, or pushed by the irresistible desire to attract attention. This vain desire for glory led to the Bastille. In 1640, Jean du Châtelet, Baron of Beausoleil, and there he died five years later, Pacol, Livonian philosopher, transmuted in front of the Senate of Stockholm and sees himself. Condemned by Charles XII to decapitation, Vinicky, man of the people, knowing neither how to read nor write, but knowing by heart the great work down to its smallest details, cruelly expiates his, also, insatiable thirst for luxury and notoriety. It is to him that René Vieille de Palmy d'Argenson addresses to manufacture the gold that the financier Samuel Bernard destined to the payment of the debts of France. The operation completed, Palmy d'Argenson, in recognition of his services, takes hold of Vinicky, on February 17, 1704, throws him into the Bastille, orders that his throat be slit the following day, comes in person to ensure the execution of the murder, then has him clandestinely interred at six o'clock in the evening, under the name of Etienne Durand, aged sixty years, while Vinicky was only thirty-eight, and covers up the crime by publishing that he died of apoplexy. Who, after this, would dare to find strange that we, the so-called fraternity of the Rose Croix has never had an existence. The bearers of the title are only brothers through the social lens. The adepts of the true cross have never been linked by any mason's oath or the success of their work. No oath binds them, no statute lies between them, no rule other than the discipline of hermeticism freely accepted, voluntarily observed, influences their free will. All that has been written or told, after the legend attributed to the school of call, is apocryphal and worthy, at most, of alimenting the imagination, the romantic fantasy of a Bulgarian novel. The Rose Croix did not know each other. They had no place of meeting, no social headquarters, no temple, no ritual, no external mark of recognition. They did not pay dues and would never have accepted the title, given to certain other brothers, of stomach tied. The banquets were unknown to them. They were and are still isolated, workers dispersed in the world, cosmopolites according to the narrowest acceptance of the term. As the adepts recognize no hierarchical degree, it follows that the Rose Croix is not a grade but the sole consecration of their secret works, that of experience, positive light of which a vivid faith revealed the existence. Certainly, some masters were able to gather around them young aspirants, accept the mission to counsel them, to direct, to orient their efforts and to form small centers of initiates of which they were the sole, sometimes recognized, often misunderstood. But for us to assert that there were permanent links between the possessors of the title, another bond than that of scientific truth confirmed by the acquisition of the stone, if the Rose Croix are brothers by the discovery, the work, and the science, brothers by acts and works, it is due to the manner of the philosophical concept, which considers all individuals as members of the same human family. In summary, the great classical authors who have taught, in their literary or artistic works, the precepts of our philosophy and the arcana of the art, those also who left undeniable proofs of their mastery, all are brothers of the true Rose Croix. And it is to these scholars, famous or unknown, that the anonymous translator of a reputed book addresses himself when he says in his preface, as it is only by the cross that the true
believers, must be tested faithfully, it's to you, brothers of the true rose qua, who possess all the treasures of the world, it's to you whom I resort. I submit entirely to your pious and wise counsel, I know they can only be good, because I know how much you are above the rest of men, endowed with virtue by science, and that consequently I owe you what I know, if I can say to know something, I want, according to the institution that God has established in nature, that things return to where they came from. Ad locum, or to the place, says the Ecclesiastes, unde exerunt flumina revertuncture, ut eterum fluent or from where the rivers come forth, they return to flow again. All is yours, everything comes from you, everything therefore returns to you. May the reader please excuse this digression that has taken us further than we wished. But it seemed necessary to us to establish clearly what is the true and traditional rose qua hermeticism, to isolate it from other vulgar groups placed under the same teaching and to allow to clearly distinguish the rare initiates from the impostors taking vanity from a title that could not justify the acquisition. Louis de Stissic and Hermetic Philosophy Continued Part 3 let us now resume the study of the curious motifs imagined by Louis de Stissic for the hermetic decoration of his fireplace. In the right panel, opposite the one we have just analyzed, we notice the mask of an old man, previously identified, holding in its jaws two vegetal stems provided with leaves and each bearing a floral bud on the verge of opening. These stems enclose a kind of open almond, inside of which is seen a vase decor de cai, or a vase decorated with scales and containing floral buds, fruits, ears of corn. Here we find the hieroglyphic expression of vegetation, nutrition, and the growth of the body which we have spoken of. Corn alone, voluntarily placed next to flowers and fruits, is a very telling symbol. Its Greek name, Zeta X, derives from Zeta X Omega, Vivra, to live, subsister, to subsist, exister, to exist. The vase with scales is a figure representing the primitive substance with which nature provides the artist, coming out of the mind, and with which he commences his work. It is with it that he extracts the various elements according to their need. It is with it and by it that all the laborer's work is accomplished. It is with it that the philosophers have depicted under the image of the black dragon covered with scales, which the Chinese name Long, and whose analogy with the hermetic monster is perfect. Like it, it is a kind of winged serpent, spitting fire and flame through its nostrils, with a black body and four squat legs armed with five claws each. The gigantic dragon of Scythian banners was called Apophis. Now, the Greek pi omicron phi iota sigma, which comes from the root pi phi upsilon omega, with the sense of to grow, to sprout, to push forth, to produce, to give birth to, has the vegetative power indicated by the fruitfulness of its own nature. This is therefore expressly confirmed in the mythical dragon, which is divided into common mercury or the first solvent. Subsequently, this primitive mercury, when combined with some fixed body, makes it volatile, living, and vegetating fruitfully. It then changes its name as it changes in quality and becomes the wisest mercury. It becomes, in mercury, the humid radical metallic, the celestial salt or volatile spirit. In mercury is everything which the sages seek, all that which the wise seek is desiring mercury, as our old authors repeatedly say. One could not better express the nature and function of this vase than so many artists have done with their stone, to know what it is capable of producing. Without it, without mercury drawn from our magnesia, Philolethe assures us, it is pointless to light the lamp or the furnace of the philosophers. We will not say more about this here because we will have the occasion to come back to this subject and to develop further the major arcana of the great art. In front of the central panel, the observer cannot help but feel an instinctive movement, of surprise, so singular does its decoration appear. PL. 16. Two human monsters support a crown made of leaves and fruits, which encircles a simple French shield. One of them has the horrible face of a hare lip on a hairless and mangled torso. The other has the lively look of a mischievous and cheeky child, but with the hairy chest of anthropoids. If the arms and hands do not have any particularity other than their excessive thinness, the lower limbs, covered with long and bushy hair, and in one case in feline claws, in the other in bird of prey talons. These beings, troubled by a long curved tail, are wearing headdresses among the improbable helmets, one scaly, the other striated, whose summit curls into the shape of an ammonite. Between these stephanophores of repulsive aspect, and placed above the water in the axis of the composition, a grimacing man's mask, with low brow, round eyes, frizzy hair weighing down the forehead, holds in its open and bestial jaw the central shield by a slight cord. Finally, a bucranium, occupying the lower part of the panel, ends on a macabre note this apocalyptic quarter. 
As for the shield, the bizarre figures it bears seem to be drawn from some old grimoire. At first glance, one would believe them taken from the somber clavicules de Salomon, images traced with fresh blood on virgin parchment, and which indicate, in their disturbing zigzags, the ritual movements that the forked wand must execute under the sorcerer's fingers. Such are the symbolic elements offered to the sagacity of the student and cleverly concealed under the decorative harmony of this strange subject. We will attempt to explain them as clearly as possible, even if it means calling upon the verb of philosophical language, or resorting to the language of the gods when we judge we cannot, without overstepping the measure, push further this teaching. The two gnomes, which stand face to face, the reader will have guessed, are two metallic principles, bodies or natures first, with the help of which the work is begun, is perfected and is completed. They are the sulfurous and mercurial geniuses appointed to guard the underground treasures, nocturnal artisans of the hermetic work, familiar to the wise whom they serve, honor, and enrich with their labor without ceasing. They are the possessors of the terrestrial secrets, the revealers of the mineral mysteries. The gnome, a fictitious creature, deformed but active, is the esoteric expression of metallic life, of the dynamism of the crude bodies that art can condense into a pure substance. The rabbinic tradition reports, in the Talmud, that a gnome cooperated in the building of Solomon's temple, which means that the philosopher's stone had to enter into it in some part. But, closer to us, are our Gothic cathedrals not indebted to the inimitable color of their stained glass windows? Our stone, writes an anonymous author, has still two very supreme. Thus, the obscure, latent, and potential life of the two primitive mineral substances develops through contact, struggle, the union of their contrary natures, one igneous, the other aqueous. These are our elements, and there are no others. When philosophers speak of three principles, in writing and distinguishing them within, they use a subtle artifice intended to throw the neophyte into the most cruel embarrassment. We therefore certify, with the best authors, that two bodies suffice to accomplish the magistery from beginning to end. It is not possible to acquire possession of our stone, as described in the Ancienne Guerre des Chevaliers, otherwise than by the means of two bodies, one of which cannot receive without the other the perfection that is required. If we must admit a third, we will find it in the one that results from their assembly and is born from their mutual destruction. For you can search, multiply the trials, you will never find other relatives of the stone than the two aforementioned bodies, called principles, from which the third, inheritor of the mixed qualities and virtues of its begetters, comes. This important point deserved to be clarified. Now, these two principles, hostile because contrary, are so expressively presented on the fireplace of Louis de Stissic, that even a novice will recognize them without difficulty. We find there, humanized, the hermetic dragons described by Nicolas Flamel, one winged, the monster with the hair lip, the other wingless, the gnome with the hairy chest. Contemplate well these two dragons, says the adept, for they are the true principles of philosophy, which the sages have not dared to show to their own children. He who is below without wings, that is the fixed or the male, and he who is above, that is the volatile or the dark and obscure female, who will take domination for several months. The first is called sulfur or also dryness and dry heat, and the latter quicksilver or wetness and humidity. These are the sun and the moon, of mercurial source and sulfurous origin, which, by continuous fire, adorn themselves with royal ornaments to conquer, being united, and then changed. In quintessence, everything solid, lasting, and strong is a metallic serpent or dragon. These are the serpents and dragons that the Egyptians have painted in a circle, head-biting tail, to indicate that they are self-contained and self-sufficient, and that from the same they perfect themselves. These are the dragons that the ancients saw in circulation guarding the golden apples in the gardens of the Hesperides. These are the ones over which Jason, in the adventure of the Golden Fleece, poured the juice prepared by the beautiful Medea, of whose philosopher's books have never been written, since no philosopher has ever written anything since Hermes Trismegistus, Orpheus, Pythagoras, Artephius, Morianus, and others down to me. These are the two serpents sent and given by Junon, which is the metallic nature, which the strong Hercules, that is to say the sage, must strangle in his cradle, that is to say conquer and kill, to make rot, corrupt and engender, at the beginning of his work. These are the two serpents wrapped around the caduceus and rod of Mercury, with which he exercises his great power and transforms himself as he wishes. That one, says Haley, which will kill one, will also kill the other, because one cannot die but with its brother, those which Avicenna calls the bitch of Corsica and dog of Armenia, these two being then united together in the vessel of the tomb, they bite each other, cruelly, and by their great venom and furious rage, have never since the moment they were seized. 
These are the two sperms, masculine and feminine, described at the beginning of my rosary philosophique, which are engendered, as Richard of England, Avicenna, and Abraham the Jew say, from the entrails, from the operations of the four elements. These are the humid of metals, sulfur and quicksilver, not the common and sold by merchants and apothecaries, but those that are given to us by these beautiful and precious bodies that we love so much. These two sperms, said Democritus, are not found on the land of the living. Serpents or dragons, the hieroglyphic forms indicated by the old masters as being ready-made materials present, on the work of art from fontenay le comte some very remarkable peculiarities, due to the cabalistic genius, to the extended science of their author. What specifically esoterically defines these anthropomorphic beings are not only their griffin feet and their furry members, but especially their helmet. This coiffure, ending in the shape of an ammonite, and which is named in Greek Kappa Rho Upsilon Sigma, because it covers the head and protects the skull, Kappa Rho Alpha Nu Omicron Nu, allows us to identify them. Already, the Greek word that serves to designate the head, Kappa Rho Alpha Nu Omicron Nu, gives us a useful indication, for it also marks the location of the Calvary. Indeed, the Golgotha where Jesus, Redeemer of men, had to suffer the passion in his flesh before transfiguring into spirit. Or, our two principles, one bearing the cross and the other the lance that will pierce his flank, are an image, a reflection of the passion of Christ. Just as he, if they must be resurrected in a new, clean, glorious, spiritualized body, they must together climb their calvary, endure the torments of fire and die of slow agony, at the end of a harsh struggle, gamma omega nu alpha. We know, on the other hand, that the blowers called their alembic homo galatus, the man wearing a helmet, because it was composed of a cucurbit covered by its chapiter. Our two helm geniuses therefore can only figure something other than the alembic of the sages, or the two bodies assembled, the container and the content, the material itself and its own vessel. For if the reactions are necessarily provoked by one agent, they only act by breaking the balance of the other, patient, which serves as a receptacle and base for the energy contrary to nature adverse. In the present motif, the agent is identified by a striated helmet. Indeed, the Greek word beta o omega sigma eta, striated, streaked, grooved, has for its root beta delta omicron sigma, rod, staff, wand, scepter, caduceus, spear shaft, dart. These different meanings characterize most of the attributes of the active matter, masculine and fixed. It is first and foremost the wand that Mercury throws between the viper and the serpent, Rhea and Jupiter, upon which they entwine, creating the caduceus, emblem of peace and reconciliation. All hermetic authors speak of a terrible fight between two dragons, and mythology teaches us that such was the origin of the tribute of Hermes, who brought about their agreement by interposing his rod. It is the sign of the union and concord that must be achieved between fire and water. Now, fire being represented by the hieroglyph delta, and water by the same graphic inverted V, the two superimposed form the image of the star, a certain mark of union, pacification and creation, for star, Stella, signifies the fixation of the sun. And, in fact, the sign only appears after the battle, when everything has become calm and the first effervescences have ceased, the seal of Solomon, the geometric figure resulting from the assembly of the triangles of fire and water, confirms the union of heaven and earth. It is the messianic star announcing the birth of the king of kings. Moreover, Kappa Eta Rho Sigma Sigma Omega, a Greek word meaning to publish, to announce, reveals that the distinctive emblem of Mercury is the sign of good news. Among the Indians of North America, the calumet they use in their civil and religious ceremonies is a symbol analogous to the caduceus, both in its form and in its meaning. It is, we are told by Noel, a large smoking pipe, made of red, black, or white marble. It somewhat resembles a war hammer, the head is well polished, and the pipe, two and a half feet long, is a fairly strong cane, adorned with feathers of all kinds of colors, with several mats of braided women's hair and are woven in various ways. Two wings are attached to it, which makes it quite similar to the caduceus of Mercury, or to the wand that the ambassadors of the septentrional peace carry. The wand of Hermes is truly the scepter of the sovereign of our art, the hermetic gold, vile, abject and despised, more sought after by the philosopher than natural gold, the rod that the great priest Aaron changed into a serpent, and that which Moses, Exodus, 17, 5, 6, following Jesus, strikes the rock, that is, the passive matter, and from it springs forth pure water hidden within. It is the ancient dragon of Basilius Valentinus, whose tongue and tail end in dart, which brings us back to the symbolic serpent, serpents out Draco key caught am devour of it or a serpent or dragon that has devoured its tail. 
As for the second body, patient and feminine, Louis de Stisic has represented it under the aspect of a gnome with a hair lip, endowed with breasts and wearing a scaly helmet. We already knew, from the descriptions left by the classic authors, that this mineral substance, as extracted from its mine, is scaly, black, hard and dry. Some have called it the leprosy. In Greek, lambda pi rho alpha, lepra, scaly, has among its derivatives the word lambda pi iota sigma, lepus, scale, because this dreadful infection covers the epidermis with pustules and scales. Also, is it not essential to chase the impurity gross and scaly from the body by stripping it of its scaly and superficial envelope? Lambda epsilon pi delta omega, an operation that we easily realize with the help of the active principle, the agent with the striped helmet. Taking the example of the gesture of Moses, it is enough to strike rudely in three times this rock, lambda epsilon pi alpha sigma, of arid and dry appearance, to see the mysterious water it contains spring forth. This is the common mercury of the sages, the faithful servant of the artist, the only one he needs and that nothing can replace. Indeed, highlighted on our bar leaf by the small lepidopter in wings, gr, lambda epsilon pi delta omicron sigma, pi tau epsilon rho nu, the Greek words lambda epsilon pi delta omicron sigma, lepidos, meaning scale and pi tau epsilon rho nu, teron, meaning wing, fixed to the shoulders of the symbolic monster. However, the best denomination that the authors have given to their mercury seems to be that of spirit of magnesia, because they call magnesia, from the Greek mu gamma nu eta sigma, magnet, the raw feminine matter, which attracts by a hidden virtue, the rough bark enclosed within the wise men's steel. This one, penetrating like a burning flame the body of the passive nature, burns, consumes its heterogeneous parts, chases away the arsenical sulfur, or leprous, and animates the pure mercury that it contains, which appears in the conventional form of a liquor both moist and igneous, water fire of the ancients, which we qualify as spirit of the sages. Finally, an unnecessary detail for the work, but which we point out because it supports our examination, a term akin to lambda epsilon pi sigma, lepus, the word lambda pi omicron rho iota sigma, leporis, designated in the Aeolian dialect, the hair, Latin lepus, leporis, from which comes this buccal deformity, inexplicable at first, but necessary to the cabalistic expression, which imprints on the face of our gnome its characteristic physiognomy. Having reached this point, we must pause for a moment. The path, overgrown and covered with thorns and spines, becomes impassable. A few steps away, instinctively, we surmise. Indeed, this is where the authors, already quite dogmatic in the preparation of the dissolvent, fall silent obstinately. Covering with a silence the operations of the second operation, they pass directly to descriptions concurrent to the third, that is to say directly to the regimes of coction. Then, resuming terminology used earlier, they let the beginner believe that the common mercury, just as it is, must fill everything equally in the rebus vase, although well sealed under the same discipline in a closed vessel. Philolethes, like his predecessors, in the introduction, we see no break, only, false manipulations supplement the defect of the true ones. They fill the gaps of the series so that the ends meet without showing any trace of artifice. One follows the other in such a way that it is impossible without revealing the task of separating the wheat from the chaff, the bad from the good, the error from the truth. We scarcely need to affirm how much we disapprove of such abuses, which, despite the rule, allow so many disfigurements to slip through. That being said, in spite of a wealth of resources to express what should not be understood by so few, we prefer silence, on the other hand, to the loquaciousness that presents itself too habitually. We have not established such a severe judgment on a part of the work of the famous adept, but others, before us, have not been afraid to make the same reproaches to him. Tolius, Naxagoras, Limjohn of St. Didier especially, unmask the insidious and perfidious formula, and we are in perfect agreement with them. It is the mystery that covers our second operation is the most important of all. It touches, indeed, on the elaboration of philosophical mercury, which has never been and never will be found but in the centuries of centurion which has never resorted to allegory, enigmas, parables, but most of the masters have refrained from dealing with this delicate question. It is true, writes Limjohn of Saint Didier, that there are philosophers who, although appearing very sincere, nevertheless throw artists into this error, seriously sustaining those who do not know that the philosopher's gold can sometimes be found in the common, cooked with the philosopher's mercury. Philolethes is of that opinion that Trebizond, Zachaire, and Flamel have followed this journey, he adds, however, that it is not the true and only path of the sages, since each one has his own. But these assurances, which appear convincing, 
Do not deceive the artists, who, desiring to follow the same philolethe and purification and the animation he teaches of Mercury commit a very gross error under Mercury of philosophers. What is the secret of the sages Mercury, embarking on a very laborious and absolutely impossible work? Also, after a long toil full of annoyances and dangers, they have only a slightly more impure Mercury than they had before. A regrettable error, which has misled and still misleads a great number of artists. And yet, there are those seekers who, having successfully overcome the first obstacles and drawn the living water from the ancient fountain, possess the key capable of opening the doors of the hermetic laboratory. They mellow and multiply their attempts without discovering a happy outcome, if they doubt what they have not acquired sufficient knowledge of the doctrine. Let them not despair too soon. Meditation, study, and the blessing of heaven will crown their efforts with success. Truly, I tell you, writes Jesus, Matthew, 17, 19, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. For faith, this attitude of the spirit toward a truth not yet demonstrated, presumes a formidable spiritual lantern that God has placed in us. In the name of this flame of fearlessness, let us never go astray, it illuminates, guides, instructs, and elevates. Faith alone, writes an anonymous philosopher, never deceives us. Doubt alone makes us inert. Faith, on the other hand, forms our positive will. Doubt renders it neutral and skeptical. To believe before knowing is cruel to the learned. But what can you do? Nature will not reconstruct itself even for them. And it has the pretension to impose on us faith, that is to say confidence in it, in order to grant us its graces. I confess, for my part, that I have always found it generous enough to pass this faith on to others. Let the researchers learn, then, before committing to new expenses, what distinguishes the first mercury from the philosophical mercury? When one knows well what one is searching for, it becomes easier to direct one's steps. Let them know that their dissolving agent, or common mercury, is the result of the work of nature, while the mercury of the sages remains a production of art. In the making of the latter, the artist, applying natural laws, knows what he wants to achieve. It is not the same with common mercury, for God forbids man to penetrate its mystery. All philosophers admit, and many acknowledge, how the initial matters, once in contact, interact, interpenetrate, finally veiling themselves under a veil of darkness that envelops them from the start, leaving no room for procreation. This explains why writers have been so reserved about the philosophical mercury, whose operator can follow, understand, and manage at will the successive phases. If the technique requires a certain amount of time and some trouble, it is, on the other hand, of extreme simplicity. Any layman, knowing how to maintain a fire, will execute it as well as an expert alchemist. It requires no special manual skill, no professional dexterity, but only the knowledge of a curious trick, which constitutes this secretum secretorum, which has not been revealed and probably never will be. Concerning this operation, the success of which assures the possession of the philosophical rebus, Jacques Latessin, citing Damascene, writes that this adept, at the moment of undertaking the work, looked all around the room to see if there were no flies in it, wanting to signify thereby that one could hold the secret, as dangerous as it is sovereign. Before going further, let's talk about this unknown trick, which from a chemical point of view should be labeled as absurd, preposterous, or paradoxical, because its inexplicable action defies any scientific rule, marking the crossroads where alchemical science diverges from chemical science. Applied to other bodies, it yields, under the same conditions, unexpected results of substances endowed with supernatural qualities. This unique and powerful means allows for the development of an unexpected scope, by the multiple new simple elements and the derived compounds of these same elements, but whose genesis remains an enigma to chemical reasoning. This, evidently, should not be taught. If we have penetrated this reserved domain of hermeticism, if we have been bolder than our predecessors in pointing it out, it is because we wish to show, first that alchemy is a true science, capable of expansion and progress, and not the empirical acquisition of a simple craft skill. These are indeed two exact sciences, albeit distinct from each other, the science of fabricating precious metals, that alchemy is the chimera of the secret production of metals, that alchemy and chemistry are two sciences both positive and exact, though different from each other, both in practice and in theory, that chemistry could never, for certain reasons, claim an alchemical origin, that the innumerable properties, less marvelous but more probable than those attributed to the philosopher's stone, appertain to each unknown substance obtained from materials and chemical bodies, but treated according to the secret technique of our master. It is not appropriate to teach what the artifice utilized in the production of the philosophical mercury consists of. 
To our great regret, and despite all the care we bring to the daughter of science, we must imitate the wise who have deemed it prudent to reserve this mystical word. We will borrow a date from Mercury combined, that agent of the work, is the result of the reactions of two bodies, one fixed, the other volatile. The first, shrouded under the epithet of philosophical gold, is by no means common gold. The second is our living water previously described under the name of common mercury. It is by the dissolution of the metallic body in the living water that the artist comes into possession of the metal's humidity or permanent water, also known as the salt of wisdom, the essential quintessence of the dissolved metal. This solution, executed according to the rules of art, with all the required dispositions and conditions, is far removed from analogous chemical operations. They do not resemble them at all. Besides the length of time and the knowledge of the average iodine, it requires numerous and painful repetitions. It is an arduous task. Philalethes himself proclaims when he says, not one, among the alchemists, proclaims, I have performed the operation successfully, although certainly there is no labor more arduous than that of our first preparation. That's why Morian warned King Khaled that many sages always complained of the ennui caused by this work. This is what caused the famous author of the Hermetic Secret to say that the work required for the first operation was a labor of Hercules. Here one must follow the excellent advice of the Hermetic Triumph, and not be afraid to often saturate the earth with its water, and to desiccate it just as many times. By these lixiviations, according to Flamel, these immersions and successive desiccations, we arrive at the true philosophical dissolution. Through repeated renewal, one progressively extracts the viscous, oily, and pure humidity of the metal in which, assures Le Mojone de Saint Didier, resides the energy and great efficacy of the philosophical mercury. The living water, more celestial than terrestrial, acting on the heavy matter, softens it, solubilizes it little by little, adheres to the only pure parts of the disintegrated mass, leaves behind the rest, and rises to the surface, dragging along what it could seize that conforms to its ardent and spiritual nature. This significant character of the ascent of the subtle by the separation of the thick is what warranted the operation of the mercury of the sages to be called sublimation. Our solvent, all spirit, plays the symbolic role of the eagle snatching its prey, and that is the reason why Philolethe, the Cosmopolite, Siliani, Dispagnet, and several others recommend us to give it flight, by insisting on the necessity to make it fly. For the spirit rises and the matter precipitates. What is cream, if not the best part of milk? Now, Basile Valentin teaches us that the philosophical stone is made in the same way that villagers make butter, by churning or agitation of the cream, which represents, in this similitude, our philosophical mercury. Also, the artist's attention must concentrate on the extraction of the philosophical mercury, which is collected on the surface of the dissolved compound, by eliminating the viscous and metallic oiliness gradually during its production. This is indeed what the two characters of the Mutus Liber symbolize, where we see the woman skimming, with the aid of a spoon, the liquid contained in an earthenware pot that her husband holds within reach. Such is, writes Philolethe, the order of our operation, and such is our entire philosophy. Hermes, identifying the basic and fixed matter by the solar glyph and his solvent by the lunar symbol, explains it in a few words. The sun, he says, is its father, and the moon its mother. One will also understand the secret sense implied by these words of the same author. The wind carried it in its belly. The wind or air are epithets applied to the living water, whose volatility causes it to nourish the fire without leaving any residual trace. And as this water, our hermetic moon, penetrates the fixed nature of the philosophical sun, retaining and assembling its most noble particles, the philosopher has reason to assert that the wind is the matrix of our mercury, the quintessence of the sages and pure mineral seed. The one who softens the dry sun, says Henkel, by means of the moist moon, has found the point of conjunction. One has become similar to the other and they remain united, has found the holy water flowing in the garden of Hesperides. It is thus that the first term of the axiom solvet coagula is achieved, by the regular volatilization of the fixed and by its combination with the volatile. The body has been spiritualized, and the metallic soul, abandoning its soiled garment, has donned another of greater value, to which the ancient masters gave the name of philosophical mercury. This is the water of the two champions of Basile Valentin, whose fabrication is the subject of our work in the form of a double eagle. One of them carries an eagle on his sword, the fixed body, the other hides behind his caduceus, dissolving. The whole bottom of the design is occupied by two large spread wings, while at the center, standing between the combatants, appears the god Mercury in the aspect of a crowned adolescent, completely nude and holding in each hand a caduceus. The symbolism of this figure is easily penetrated. The large wings, which serve as planks for the fencers, 
mark the goal of the operation, that is to say, the volatilization of the pure parts of the fixed, the eagle indicates how it must proceed, and the caduceus designates the one who must attack the adversary, our dissolving mercury. As for its nudity, it is the translation of the total stripping of impure parts, the crown, the index of its nobility. It finally symbolizes, with its two kata k, the double mercury, an epithet that some adepts have substituted for philosophical, to better differentiate from the simple or common mercury, our living and dissolving water. This is the double mercury that we find represented, on the fireplace of Terra Nova, by the symbolic human head, which holds between its teeth the cord of the escutcheon charged with emblems. The animal expression with ardent eyes, his energetic physiognomy, devoured by appetites, makes sensible the vital power, the activity of the generator, of all these faculties of production that our mercury has received from the reciprocal course of nature and of art. We have seen that he wore a collar above the water, which occupies the surface and the highest place. It is this that caused Louis de Stissic to have his image placed at the top of his metal. As for the bicornate, sculpted on the same axis, but at the bottom of the composition, in dirty and sterile matter, that caput mortuum of the world, coarse, terrene damned of the body, impure, it is the caput mortuum of the action of the dissolving separates, rejects, precipitates as an unusable and valueless residue. The philosophers have interpreted the union of the fixed and the volatile, of the body and the spirit, by the figure of the serpent that devours its tail, the Ouroboros of the Greek alchemists, Omicron Rho, Q, tail, Beta Omicron Rho, Bora, devouring, Delta Rho Omicron Sigma, Deros, devouring, reduced to its simplest expression, thus takes the circular form, a symbolic trace of eternity, as well as the perfection, in the representation of Mercury. It is the circled serpent, decorated with leaves and graphic notations, and the same fruitful table and power, on which to indicate the vegetative surplus, the sign is not complete, despite the sun we study. If we examine it carefully, we will see that our adept has a crown on his brow, which shows that the upper curve of the two expansions as well as the boo crane, complete the circle represented by the horns and the frontal axis of the neat Mercury. We must not dissect the central escutcheon, which we have seen to be the human head, and consequently placed under its dependence, the image of the philosophical Mercury, dominating the various motifs of the panel. This relationship between the mask and the shield shows quite well the essential role of hermetic matter in the cabalistic expression of these singular armorial bearings. These mysterious characters, so to speak, all the philosophical labor, not by means of borrowed shapes but by means of graphic notation figures, this paradigm thus constitutes a true alchemical scale. First, we note three stars, characteristic of the degrees of the work or, if preferred, of three successive states of the same substance. The first of these asterisks, isolated towards the lower third of the escutcheon, denotes our first mercury, or that living water of which the two gnome stephanophores have taught us the composition. By the solution of the philosophical gold, which nothing here nor elsewhere indicates, one obtains the philosophical mercury, composed of fixed and volatile, not yet radiantly white, this symbol of the coagulation. This second mercury is expressed by the two verses intertwined at the point, the alchemical sign known from the alembic. Our mercury is, as we know, the alembic of the wise, whose cucurbit and cap represent the two spiritualized and assembled elements. It is with the philosophical mercury alone that the wise undertake this long work, made up of numerous operations. Infinity and eternity, like the perfection represented by the distillation of mercury, mark it out. It is the circle we denote, adorned with leaves and graphical notations, and the same fecund table and power for indicating the vegetative surplus, the sign is not complete, in spite of the sun that we study. If we observe carefully, we will see that our adept has a crown at the top of his head, which signifies that the upper curve and the two expansions that frame it, as well as the bucranium, complete the circle formed by the horns and the frontal axis of the neat mercury. We must not dissect the central escutcheon, which we have seen to be carried by the human head, and consequently placed under its dependence, image of the philosophical mercury, dominating the various motifs of the panel. This connection between the mask and the shield shows quite well the essential role of hermetic matter in the cabalistic expression of these unique coat of arms. These mysterious characters summarize, so to speak, all the philosophical labor, not through borrowed shapes addressed to flora or fauna, but through figures of graphical notation. This paradigm thus constitutes a true alchemical formula. We note first three stars, characteristic of the degrees of the work, or, if one prefers, of three successive states of the same substance. The first of these asterisks, isolated towards the lower third of the escutcheon, denotes our first mercury, 
or that living water which the two gnomes with Stephans taught us the composition. By the solution of philosophical gold, which nothing here or elsewhere indicates, we obtain the philosophical mercury, composed of fixed and volatile, not yet radiantly white, this symbol of coagulation. This second mercury is expressed by the two verses interlaced at the tip, the alchemical sign known of the alembic. Our mercury is, as we know, the alembic of the wise, whose cucurbit and capital represent the two elements spiritualized and assembled. It is with the philosophical mercury alone that the wise undertake this long work, made up of numerous operations, which they called coction or maturation. Our compound, subjected to the slow and continuous action of fire, distilled, condenses, rises, falls, swells up, becomes porous, contracts, decreases in volume, and, as a result of its own cohabitations, gradually acquires a solid consistency. Thus elevated by a degree, this mercury, made fixed by the habit of fire, again needs to be dissolved by the first water, hidden here under the sign I, followed by the letter M, that is to say spirit of the magnesia, another name for the solvent. In our alchemical notation, that vertical bar signifies, on the graphic scale, the second stage of the graphic representation of the spirit, which deserves to be retained if we wish to determine which body is concealed under the epithet of golden philosophical, father of the mercury and son of the work. The capital M serves to identify our magnesia of which it is, moreover, the initial letter. This second liquefaction of the coagulated body aims to increase and strengthen it, by nourishing it with the mercurial milk it must be, life, the vegetative power. It becomes a second time volatile, but to regain, upon contact with fire, the dry and hard consistency it had previously acquired. And thus we arrive at the summit of the staff of the character, which points out to us the number four, which figure, in reality, the voice, the path that it must follow us. Harris, at this point, a third solution, similar to the first two, leads us again, always by the straight path of the regimen, and the linear way of the fire, to the second seal of the perfect and coagulated matter that will suffice to cook by continuing the required degrees without ever deviating from this linear way which terminates the bar of the spirit, fire or incombustible sulfur. Such is the sign, ardently desired, of the stone or medicine of the second order. As for the branch flowered with a star, placed outside of work, it demonstrates that, by repetition of the same technique, the stone can multiply in quantity and in quality, thanks to the exceptional fecundity it has received from nature and art. Now, as its exuberant fertility comes from the primitive and celestial water, which gives to the metallic sulfur, activity and movement, in exchange for its coagulative virtue, we understand that the stone differs from the philosophical mercury only in perfection and not in substance. The wise, therefore, are right to teach that the philosopher's stone, or our mercury, and the philosophical stone are one and the same thing, of one and the same kind, although one is more mature and more excellent than the other. Concerning this mercury, which is also the salt of the wise and the cornerstone of the work, we will quote a passage from Conrath, very transparent despite his emphatic style and the abuse of incidental phrases. The philosopher's stone, says our author, is Ruach Elohim, which floated, incubabat, over the waters, Genesis, I, conceived by the mediation of the very pure, very simple, and very pious God, God willing it, and made corpus vile and falling under the senses, crafted from the virginal tear of the major progenerated world, or from chaos, or from the dross, empty and vain, and the water, it is the filiation deformed and almost infinite, vile aspect, to the eyes of the foolish, consubstantial with its author, parens, small world, do not imagine that it simulates a man or any other thing, or through him, Catholic, three in one, hermaphrodite, visible, sensible to touch, to hearing, to all faction and to taste, self-manifesting regeneratively through itself, and by means of the hand, obstetrical from the part of physico-chemistry, glorified in its body from its assumption, the one who has provided us with almost infinite uses and most salutarily salutary to the commodities of the macrocosm in the Catholic Trinity. O you, son of perdition, thus certainly the living silver, delta omega rho rho gamma upsilon rho omicron nu, and with it all things, whatever they may be, magnificently prepared by you, you are the fisherman's type of the Savior, you can and must be delivered and not delivered by him not as the figure of the mediator who leads to truth, to growth, and to life. He reigned, reigns, and will reign naturally and universally over natural things. He is the Catholic son of nature, the salt, know this, of Saturn, fusible according to his particular constitution, permanent everywhere and always in nature by himself, and, by his origin and his virtue, universal. Listen and be attentive, this salt is the very ancient stone, 
It's a mystery. Whose nucleus, nucleus, is in the denarius? Do this for yourself, not sapienii, not. He who can understand, comprehend. I have said, the sal armoniac, which is quite serious, has been praised by the sages of well of Sermoms. They said that there was nothing more in the world than he and the sun. Study this. But before going further, we allow ourselves to make a mark of some importance, for the intention of our brothers and men of good will. For our intention is to give here the compliment of what we have taught in a previous work. The most learned among us in traditional Kabbalah have undoubtedly been struck by the relationship existing between the path, the way traced by the hieroglyph that takes the form of the number four, and the mineral antimony, clearly indicated under this topographic term, in Latin or stibium, clearly indicated under this topographical term. In fact, the natural antimony oxysulfide was called, among the Greeks, sigma tau mu mu iota, stimi, or sigma tau beta iota, stibi, now, sigma tau beta iota, stibble, is the path, the trail, the way that the invigilator sigma tau iota beta epsilon sigma, stibius, or pilgrim travels in his journey, it is the one he tramples underfoot sigma tau iota beta epsilon nu, stibium. These considerations, based on an exact correspondence of words, have not escaped the old masters nor the modern philosophers, who, by lending their authority, have contributed to spreading this fatal error that common antimony was the mysterious subject of the art. A regrettable confusion, an insurmountable obstacle against which hundreds of researchers have stumbled. Since Artephius, who begins his treatise with the words, antimony is part of Saturn. Until Philolethes, who entitles one of his works, experiences on the preparation of the philosophical mercury by the martial antimony star and silver, passing through the triumphal chariot of antimony by Basile Valentine, and the dangerous assertion, in his hypocritical positivism, by Batsturf, the number of those who have let themselves be taken by this gross trick is simply prodigious. The Middle Ages saw blowers and alchemists volatilize, with no result, tons of mercury amalgamated with antimonial gold. In the 18th century, the learned chemist Jean Frederick Henkel admits, in his treatise on appropriation, which he has long devoted to these costly and vain experiments. The regulus of antimony, he says, is regarded as a means of union between mercury and metals, and here is the reason. It is no longer mercury and it is not yet perfect metal, it has ceased to be one and has begun to become the other. However, I must not fail to mention that I have undertaken in vain very great works to more intimately unite gold and mercury by means of the regulus of antimony. And who knows if some good artists do not follow today the deplorable example of the medieval spagirists. Alas! Each has his hobby horse, each clings to his idea, and what we can say will not prevail against such a tenacious prejudice. Our duty being above all to help those who do not nourish themselves on chimeras, we write for those alone, without concerning ourselves further with the others. Let us recall, then, that a similar wordplay might also allow us to infer that the philosopher's stone could come from antimony. We know that the alchemists of the 14th century called their universal medicine coal or kahal from the Arabic words al kol, which mean fine powder, a term that later took on in our language the meaning of water of life, alcohol. In Arabic, coal is, as it is said, the pulverized oxysulfide of antimony used by Muslim women to darken their eyebrows in black. Greek women used the same product, which they called pi lambda alpha tau upsilon phi theta lambda mu iota omicron nu, that is to say wide eye because the use of this artifice made their eyes appear larger, from the Greek words pi lambda alpha tau sigma, wide, and phi theta alpha lambda mu sigma, i. So, one might think, based on suggestive relationships, that we would certainly be of the same opinion, if we were unaware that the smallest molecule of stibine in the Greek. Latoptihamon did not enter into the coal of the Arabs and the coal or coal of the Turks. The latter, in effect, was obtained by the calcination of a mixture of granulated tin and gallnut. Such is the chemical composition of the coal used by Oriental women, which the ancient alchemists used as a term of comparison to teach the secret preparation of their antimonial isolar that the Egyptians called alja. It is at the center of a triangle. This symbol has the same meaning surrounded by glory as the letter G, the seventh of the alphabet, initial of the same meaning as the sages, figured in the middle of a radiant star vulgar name of the subject which is the Saturnine antimony of Artephius, the Regulus. It is this material that is the true and only stibium of Michael Meyer and of all the adepts. As for mineral stibium, it possesses none of the required disguises, and no matter how one wants to treat it, one will never obtain either the secret dissolvent or the philosophical mercury. And if Basile Valentine gives it the nickname of pilgrim or traveler, sigma tau iota beta epsilon sigma, because it must, 
He tells us, cross six celestial cities before fixing its residence in the seven. If Philalethe assures us that he alone is our way, Sigma Tau Iota Beta Iota, these are not sufficient reasons to invoke that these masters pretended to designate common antimony as the generator of philosophical mercury. This substance is too far from perfection, from purity and spirituality that possesses the radical humidity or metallic seed, which could not be found on earth, to be truly useful to us. The antimony of the sages, primary matter directly extracted from the mind, is not properly mineral and even less metallic, as Philalethe teaches us, but, without participating in these two substances, that it holds the middle between one and the other. It is nonetheless not corporeal, since it is entirely volatile, it is not spirit, since it liquefies in the fire like a metal, it is therefore a chaos that serves as mother to all metals. It is the metallic flower, nu theta omicron sigma, anthos, the first rose, black in truth, which has remained here below as a parcel of the elementary chaos. It is from this flower of flowers, flos florum, that we will first draw our white jelly, sigma tau lambda eta, style, in which is the spirit that moves upon the waters, and the white garment of angels, reduced to this sparkling whiteness, it is the mirror of art, the torch, sigma tau lambda eta, style, the lamp or the lantern, the brightness of the stars and the splendor of the sun, splendor salis, it is still she who, united with the philosophical gold, will become the metallic planet Mercury, sigma tau lambda beta omega nu sigma tau rho, still von Aster, the nest of the bird, sigma tau lambda alpha sigma, stylus, our phoenix and its small stone, sigma tau alpha, stia, it is finally the vaccine, the pivot, lot, stipes, stips, of the grand work, and not the common antimony. No, therefore, brothers, in order not to err, that our term of antimony, derived from the Greek nu theta mu omega nu, anthemon, designates, by a play on words familiar to philosophers, the helm timber, the guide that leads, in the Bible, the Jews to the fountain. It is the Alboran the mythical gulf, lambda iota, phi rho omicron sigma, ali foros, the horse of the sun. One word more, you should not ignore that, in the primitive language, Greek Kabbalists were accustomed to substituting numbers for certain consonants in order to veil the ordinary sense under a hermetic sense. They knew how to make use of the episemen, pi sigma eta mu omicron nu, of the kappa, of the sampi, the digamma, to which they attached the conventional value. The names, modified by this process, constituted real cryptograms, although their form and pronunciation seem not to have undergone alteration. Now, the term antimony, nu tau mu omicron nu iota, was always written with the episemen, pi sigma eta mu omicron nu, equivalent to the two assembled consonants sigma and tau, sigma tau, when it was used to characterize the hermetic subject. Written in this way, nu tau mu omicron nu iota is no longer the stibnite of mineralogists, but rather a matter signed by nature, or better a movement, dynamism or vibration, sealed life, sigma tau, iota mu omicron nu iota, in order to allow man the identification, a very particular signature and submission to the rules of the number six. I sigma eta mu omicron nu comma a word formed from epi, on, and sigma mu alpha, sign, indeed signifies marked with a distinctive sign, and this sign must correspond to the number six. Moreover, a neighboring term, frequently, the term employed for the assonance in phonetic Kabbalah, the word apostrophe pi sigma tau eta mu omicron nu comma epistemon, indicates he who knows, who is instructed, skilled. It is the signature witness, and it is the craftsman Pontoc rule, the man of science, called epistemon, and it is the Greek apostrophe pi sigma tau eta mu omicron nu comma enclosed in the raw substance, alone, capable of executing and perfecting the entire work, without any other aid than that of elementary fire. It would be easy for us to complete what we have said about the philosophical mercury and its preparation, but it is not for us to fully unveil this important secret. The written teaching cannot surpass that which the neophytes received in the mysteries of Agra, and if we willingly bend to the ungrateful task of the old hydronos, on the contrary, the esoteric domain of the great Eleusinian mysteries is formally forbidden. It is that before receiving the supreme initiation, the Greek mists swore, on their life and on the presence of the Hierophant, never to reveal the truths that were entrusted to them. Now, we are not speaking of a few disciples, sure and proven, in the shadow of a closed sanctuary, before the divine image of venerable Ceres, a black stone imported from Pesanandi, or of Isis herself, seated on the cubic block, we discourse in the open-air temple, under the peristyle and before the crowd, without demanding any prior oath. In the presence of such contrary conditions, how can we not be surprised to see ourselves use prudence and circumspection, 
Indeed, we deplore that the initiatory institutions of antiquity have disappeared and that a narrow exotericism has substituted for the broad spirit of the mysteries of yore, for we believe, with the philosopher, that it is more worthy of human nature, and more instructive, to admit the marvelous by seeking to extract the true, than to treat it from the outset as a lie, on the pretext of recognizing a miracle to escape the explanation. Time, with its acid, has leveled the great ancient civilizations. What remains of them? Today, if not the historical testimony of their grandeur and their power, a memory buried in the depths of papyrus or piously exhumed from arid soils, populated by their ruins? Alas! The last mystagogues are no longer. It is only to God, Father of the light and dispenser of all truth, that we must now ask for the grace of high revelations. It is the advice we allow ourselves to give to sincere investigators, sons of science in favor of whom we write. Alone, divine illumination will bring them the solution to the obscure problem. Where and how to obtain this or that mysterium, body unknown yet capable of animating and fertilizing water, the first element of metallic nature, the ideographic sculptures of Louis d'Estisic are mute on this essential point, but our duty being oriented towards respecting the will of the adept, our solicitude must be signaled above all in the student's practical application. Before examining the higher motifs, we must say another word about the central escutcheon, laden with hieroglyphs, which we must analyze. The monograph cited by Mr. de Rochebrun, thought to have been drafted by Mr. de Chaudy, contains a rather singular passage concerning the symbols in question. The author, after a brief description of the fireplace, adds, it is one of the beautiful stone works executed by the masons of Louis d'Estisic. The lesson given in the middle of the Lord's beautiful castle is decorated in its center with the master tailor's monogram. It is surmounted by the four, a symbolic figure which is almost always associated with all the monograms of artists, engravers, and varnish painters, etc. We are still looking for the key to this strange companionship sign. Here is, in truth, a thesis at least surprising. It is possible that its author sometimes encountered a sigil in the form of a four, serving to classify or to identify certain pieces of art. As for us, we have noticed that on numerous curious objects, of a distinctly hermetic character, enameled objects, goldsmith work, etc., we cannot admit that this figure can constitute a figure of companionship. It does not belong to corporative coats of arms, because in that case, they should present, in that case, the tools and special insignia particular to the considered guilds. One must not even consider placing this category of signs in the range of talking coats of arms, nor of the testimonies of nobility, since they do not follow the heraldic rules, and they are devoid of the image sense that characterizes rebuses. On the other hand, we know for certain that the artist to whom Louis d'Estisic entrusted the decoration of some locks and turrets, their names have not been preserved for us. This gap allows the hypothesis of a personal artist's mark, while these same characters, devoid of precise meaning, are commonly found in alchemical symbols. Moreover, how to explain the insignificance of such symbolism, the adept of the coulanges, content with a modest shield, when, giving free rein to his craftsmen, he offers them a waiting table more spacious than his own? For what reason would the organizer, the creator of such a harmonious hermetic paradigm, conform to the pure up to its smallest details? Could the application of foreign hieroglyphs be tolerated if they were in blatant disagreement with the rest? We conclude that the hypothesis of some sign of companionship cannot be sustained. There is no example where the thought of a work has been concentrated in the very signature of the craftsman, despite the error committed by a defective interpretation of analogy. Louis de Stisic and Hermetic Philosophy Part.5, a Latin inscription, which occupies the entire width of the panel, up to the symbolic panels, currently completes our materials for study. They have been provided to us by the other parts by two pyrogenic bases and form the following epitaph. Nascendo quotidi morimar, in being born, we die each day. A philosopher's axiom that one would hardly expect to encounter in Seneca. It is clear that this profound truth, although discordant and without direct moral order, holds a value. What value can it take, directly with the symbolism that surrounds it? The severe exhortation to meditate on the miserable lot that fate has reserved, on the implacable destiny that imposes death on humanity as a reflection of existence, the march to the sepulchre as the essential condition of the earthly sojourn, the reason for being of water. Is it simply to remind us, derivative of dilution, that it is useful to keep in mind the image of anxieties, of supreme certainties, of the fear of the turbulent unknown, necessary breaks on our passions and our excesses? The creator of the monument, by incidentally provoking this reflection, by inviting us to reflect, 
to look straight in the face what we fear most, did he want to persuade us of the vanity of our desires, our hopes, of the impotence of our efforts, thus meaning that the latter do not belong to the country? For if expressed, they could be, for the common, the literal sense of the inscription, it is certain that we must discover another, adequate and conforming to the esotericism of this magisterial work. We believe, indeed, that the Latin axiom borrowed by Louis de Stisic from the Stoic preceptor, Nero did not speak ill about it, it is the only word written in this mutus liber. There is no doubt that it is consequential, and placed there expressly to teach what the image could not translate. A simple examination of the inscription shows that, of the three terms that contribute to its formation, two are preceded by a special sign, the words quotidian and morimar. This sign, a small lozenge, was called by the Greek psi epsilon delta omicron sigma, pseudos, from phi epsilon gamma omega, fugo, to deceive, to err, to turn around. The indication of a misleading sense, likely to mislead, is therefore very clear. And two signs have been used to mark that there are two senses mu phi iota delta omicron sigma, m phytos, in this diplomatic phrase. Consequently, if one determines which of the three members presents a double acceptation, one will easily discover the secret sense veiled under the literal sense. However, the same character engraved before quotidian and morimur attest that these words remain invariable and retain their ordinary value. Nascent, on the contrary, stands alone. Is it therefore by chance that the engraver made a mistake in the order of the Latin word? On the contrary, being devoid of any index, ordinary value, or meaning. Using the gerundive it invokes, without possible orthographic error, the idea of production, of generation, nascent which must be read, from birth, from generation. It is the hermetic mystery, freed from its sheath, that allows production, to generate, thus the amphibological axiom is born and the superficial form that gives man his mortal origin is erased and disappears. It is now the hermetic symbolism, in its figurative language, which addresses the reader and the child, to produce we die each day. These are the parents and the hermetic child who speak. And their language is true, they really die together, not only to give him being, but also to assure his growth and develop his vitality. They are there all the days, that is to say each of the six days of the work which govern the augmentation and multiplication of the stone. The child is born from their death and nourishes itself on their cadavers. We see how much the alchemical sense reveals itself explicit and luminous. Limojon of Saint Didier thus enunciates a primordial truth when he assures that the philosopher's stone is born from the destruction of two bodies. We will add that the philosopher's stone, our next subject, is also born from the combat, from the mortification, from the material ruin of two contrary natures. Thus, in the essential operations of the art, we see that there are always two principles that produce a third, and that this generation depends on a decomposition prior to its agents. Furthermore, the philosophical mercury itself, unique substance of the magister, can never be anything by itself, whether in power or in quantity, as long as they remain in their mercurial state, neighboring the original rebus and, as such, tending towards corruption. For it is a fundamental law in hermeticism that the old adage expresses, corruptio unias est generatio alterius. Huginus Abarma tells us in the chapter of the Hermetic Positions that whoever ignores the means of destroying the bodies, ignores also the means of producing them. Elsewhere, the same author teaches that if the mercury is not colored, it will not color. Now, philosophical mercury inaugurates with the black, seal of its mortification, the chromatic spectrum of the philosophical spectrum. It is the favorable indication of its first tincture, and thus also the success, the one that seals the technique. The sign of on courier Nicolas Flamel in the book of hieroglyphic figures acknowledges the mastery of the craftsman. Certainly, he writes, who does not see this darkness at the beginning of his operations, during the days of the stone, whatever other color he may see, he completely lacks the magistery and cannot with this chaos complete. For it does not work well, does not putrefy, as much, as if one does not putrefy, one does not corrupt, does not engender, and consequently the stone cannot take vegetative life to sprout and multiply. Further on, the great adept states that the solution of the body is the multiplication. The great adept states that the solution of the compound and its liquefaction under the influence of fire provoke the disintegration of the assembled parts, whose black color is certain proof. Therefore, he says, this color and heart clearly teach that in this beginning the matter, whole and compounded, begins to rot and dissolve into powder finer than the atoms of the sun which afterwards change into permanent water. And this dissolution is called by the envious philosopher's death, destruction and perdition, because the natures change form. From there have sprung so many allegories on death, tombs and sepulchres. 
Others have named it calcination, denudation, separation, trituration, assation, because the confections are changed and reduced into very fine pieces and parts. The others, reduction into first matter, mollification, extraction, commixtion, liquefaction, conversion of elements, subtiliation, division, humation, impastation, and distillation, because the confections are liquefied, reduced to seed, anomalies and circulate in the madras. The others, zir, putrefaction, corruption, comical shades, gufra, hell, dragon, generation, ingression, submersion, complexion, conjunction, and impregnation, because the matter is black and aqueous, and the natures mix perfectly and retain each other. A certain number of authors, Philolethe in particular, demonstrated the necessity, the utility of death and mineral putrefaction by means of a similarity drawn from the grain of wheat. Doubtless they took up the idea in the evangelical parable recorded by St. John, chap. 12, v. 24, the apostle transcribes these words of Christ, Verily, I say unto you, if the grain of wheat does not die after it has been cast into the earth, it remains alone, but when it is dead, it bears much fruit. We think we have sufficiently developed the secret meaning of the epitaph, Nascento quotidi morimur, and shown how this classical axiom, skillfully employed by Louis de Stissic, sheds new light on the lapidary work of the learned Hermetist. Louis de Stissic and Hermetic Philosophy P.T. Vi. From the symbolic chimney, there remains nothing more for us to discuss than the cornice. It is divided into six oblong coffers, decorated with repeating motifs in pairs, summarizing the main points of practical work. Two eagles with renewed strength occupy the corners and have their edges in the shape of a shell. Their field presents the image of a head of Medusa, with her hair of serpents, from which two thunderbolts spring. These are the emblems of the initial materials, one fiery, igneous, represented by the mask of the gorgon and its lightning bolts, the other aqueous and cold, substance passive represented under the aspect of a marine shell, which philosophers call Mervea, from the Greek words delta omega rho and lambda, mother of light. The mutual reaction of these first elements, water and fire, provides the common mercury, of mixed quality, which is this ignited water or this aqueous fire that serves us as a solvent for the preparation of philosophical mercury. Following the eagles, the bucraniums indicate the two mortifications that appear at the beginning of the preliminary works, the first realizes the common mercury and the second the hermetic mercury. These fleshless heads of the solar bowl take the place of human skulls, crossed femurs, scattered bones, complete alphabets of alchemical iconography, they are, like them, qualified as crow's heads. It is the ordinary epithet applied to matters in the process of decomposition and corruption, which are characterized in philosophical labor by the greasy and nauseating aspect, the odor strong and disagreeable, the viscous and adherent quality, the mercurial, blue discoloration, distinct from any other. One notes the cords that tie the horns of these bucraniums, they are remarked for their form resembling a hangman's knot, and indeed, they are crossed in such a way that they seem to tie and tighten on themselves, a little further from the skull. As for the philosophical mercury, whose elaboration is never revealed, not even under the hieroglyphic veil, we find it having an effect on one of the decorative shields adjacent to the acanthus median. Two stars are engraved above the lunar crescent, images of the double mercury or rebus, which the cooking first transforms into white sulfur, semi-fixed and fusible. Under the action of elementary fire, the operation taken up and continued leads to great realizations, represented on the opposite shield by two roses. These, as we know, mark the result of the two magisteries, small and great, white medicine and red stone, whose lily flower, seen beneath them, consecrates the absolute truth. It is the sign of the perfect knowledge, the emblem of wisdom, the crown of the philosopher, the seal of science and faith united to the double power, spiritual and temporal, of the chivalry. The man of the woods mystical herald of Thiers, picturesque sub-prefecture of Puy de Dume, Thiers possesses a remarkable and very elegant specimen of civil architecture from the 16th century. It is the house known as the man of the woods, a construction with half timbering, today reduced to only the first floor, but its extraordinary preservation makes it precious to art lovers, as well as to amateurs of our medieval period, pl. 17. Four closed arch bays, with accolade arches, fluted ribs and toothed, open onto the facade, engaged columns, with capitals topped with grotesque masks and long bearded old men, separate as much as they connect as many figurines of abstruse bodies under light canopies, delicate and openwork. To the superior bays correspond, in the basement, 
panels adorned with parchments, but the chamfered pillars that border them, plumb with the columns, show devouring mouths of dragons by way of capitals. The main subject, which gives a lesson in old logic, is an analogous character to the one we have seen, maneuvering a support on the corner post of the manor of Lisieux. Sculpted in the same place, almost with the same gestures, it seems to claim the same tradition. Nothing is known of him, except that he has completed his fifth century and that the generations always see him, since his creation, leaning against the panel of his old watchtower. This bar-relief on wood, of large size but quite rudimentary, has a design worn by age and the elements, which accuse the bruised character, represents a man of tall stature, hirsute, dressed in skins sewn transversely, and wild on top, head naked, it smiles, enigmatic, a little distant, and a pui sur on long baton termine a son extremity superior, by a face of a VL, hooded, and flat laden with a mass formed of sinuosities. The feet, nude, carry it with an ease that the roughness of execution hardly permits to identify, such as this man of the woods that a local chronicler calls the Sphinx of Thiers. The bitchwords, he says, are not worried about his origins, nor his silence, they only know of him one thing, it is the name that he chose, this is the name that he carries in their memory, the name wild and graceless under which the people speak of him, and which perpetuates his memory across the ages. Foreigners and tourists are more sympathetic and curious. They stop in front of him as they would in front of a valuable object. They leisurely detail the traits of his physiognomy and his anatomy. They invent a history full of local interest and perhaps of general interest. They question their guides. But these guides are as ignorant and almost as mute as the bitwards, the keepers of this loner. And thus the ignorance of some and the foolishness of others keep a secret. One has wondered if this image could not represent a Saint Christopher, in comparison with that of an infant Jesus who would have occupied the opposite panel now empty on the façade. But, as no one keeps any souvenir of the subject which would have always hidden the quarry, assuming that he could have existed, one would have to admit that the pedestal nonetheless carries our hermit represented by the waves. Nothing is less certain than such a hypothesis. How to explain, indeed, his miraculous station on the waters, on these waters whose surface would be convex. The sole absence of Jesus with the spaced-out shoulders suggests the possibility of the colossal Saint Christopher, assuming even that one could recognize Ophorus, the first personality of the giant before his conversion. No reason could be given that is satisfactory due to the simian attire that marks our statue from the particular character. And if the legend assures that the fisherman had to uproot a tree to be able to counter the violence of the current and relieve the burden of his divine load, it does not signal that the inexplicable pedestrian should be equipped with an effigy, a distinctive mark of some kind. Now, we know too well the high conscience, the scrupulous fidelity that the medieval imagiers brought to the transmission of their subjects, to accept too easily the hypothesis also founded. A certain number of authors, for a firm and reflected will, explain the man of the woods, the result of a strong and well-reflected will, necessarily carries a precise idea. We can agree that it is not merely a decorative object, and that, in that spirit, the concern for having been realized and placed there without any secondary intent. In our opinion, this decorative element clearly affirms what the bar-relief from Thiers indicates, that it is the dwelling of an unknown alchemist. It seals the philosophic stone and reveals the mystery. Its undoubted hermetic duality is completed, is further accentuated by the contact with the figurines that escort it. And, if they have not the expressive force of the main subject, these small actors are no less instructive to such an extent that one would encounter the greatest difficulty in solving the enigma, if one were to omit it. It was to compare between these symbolic characters, and especially in the head of the man of the woods, that the true meaning is concentrated, the rustic scepter in the hand of the matron with a horned head, thus appears here, under its plastic form, the version of our full mother. Thus, the people, designate, at the time of the euphoria, such a statue, face to face with the donkey, the high dignitaries and masters of certain secret institutions, the infantry of Dijon mustard, or brotherhood of the full mother, masked initiates under the Rabelaisian exteriors and the mad eccentricities Panagrulian, is the last example. Now, the madman himself, considered in the full extent of his teaching, is none other than the emblematic or the same consciousness engulfed, that he shares with his teacher. And, as this science confers to the one who embraces and cultivates it, integral wisdom, it results that the great fool sculpted on the façade from Tier is in reality a wise man, since he leans on the sapience, dry tree and scepter of the full mother. This simple man, with abundant and poorly combed hair, with an unkempt beard, is by nature that his traditional knowledge bears witness to, dominates the vain frivolity of the poor fools who believe themselves above the high places of men, 
because if he crushes stones that he treads under his feet, it is illuminated, because he has received the light, the illumination spiritual. Behind a mask of indifferent serenity, he keeps his autism and his secret sheltered from vain curiosities, from the sterile activity of the histrios of human comedy. It is he, this silent celestial, who represents for us the ancient mist, from the Greek mu sigma tau eta sigma, chief of the initiates, Greek incarnation of the mystical or mysterious science, mu upsilon sigma tau rho iota omicron nu, secret dogma, esotericism, pl. 18. 1. Shane Baker. Pierre, Puy de Doom, the man of the woods, plate 18. K.O. E.L. 18. L. Champagnes. Pierre, Puy de Doom, L'homme des bois. But, alongside its esoteric function, which shows us what must be the alchemist, a scholar of simple spirit, an attentive scrutineer of nature, who will always seek to imitate, as the monkey imitates man, the man of the woods reveals another. And this one completes that one. For the fool, a humanized emblem of the children of Hermes, evokes Mercury itself, the unique and proper matter of the wise. This is the artifacts in Oper spoken of in the hymn of the Christian church, this craftsman, hidden at the heart of the work, the humble and capable helper of the alchemist. He is therefore the absolute master of the work, the obscure worker who is never idle, the secret and loyal servant of the philosopher. And it is this unceasing collaboration of human foresight and natural activity, this duality of effort combined and directed towards the same goal, which the great symbol of the Thirnoi region expresses. As for the means by which philosophical mercury is made known and may be identified, we will now discover it, in an old almanac, which along with the clavicules of Solomon and the secrets of the great Albert once constituted the clearest part of the peddler's scientific baggage, we find among the plates illustrating the text, a singular woodcut. It represents a skeleton surrounded by images intended to mark planetary correspondences with those parts of the body which have regard and domination. Now, while the sun in this drawing offers us its radiant face, and the moon its profile crowned by the crescent, Mercury appears in the guise of a fool's head. We see it, wearing a pilgrim's hood from which two long ears protrude, like the caps we have pointed out at the base of the figures, terminating in a fool's cap in the form of a marat. In order to impress more deeply, the artist placed a bell at each end of each planet under its own sign. There is therefore indeed a symbolic formula used in the Middle Ages for the esoteric translation of the celestial Mercury and the vif argent of the wise. Moreover, it is enough to remember that the French word fou, formerly fall, comes from the Latin fallus, a bellows used in the action of fire, to evoke the idea of blowing. The derogatory epithet given to the medieval Spadgeris practitioners. Later, in the 17th century, it is rare to find, in the caricatures of the imitators of Jacques Callot, some grotesques executed with the symbolic spirit that we study in the philosophical manifestations of the sophists. We retain the memory of a certain drawing representing a jester sitting, legs crossed in an X, and hiding behind his back a voluminous bellows. Thus, one should not be surprised to find that court jesters, several of whom have remained famous, had a hermetic origin. Their bizarre costume, their strange attire, carried at the belt a purse they called lanterne. They wore as mystifications the proof, as well as that rare privilege of the philosophers, to openly criticize with their jests, their barbs, linking them to the philosophers, from whom they did not hide their truths. Finally, the Mercury, called the foo, fool, of the great work, embodies secrets. Because of its inconstancy and its volatility, sees its significance confirmed in the first blade of the tarot, entitled the fool or the alchemist. Moreover, the marat, which is positively a rattle, Chi Alpha Rho Tau Omicron Lambda Iota Kappa Nu, a toy for very small and the plaything of the first age, does not differ from the caduceus. The two attributes offer between them an evident analogy, although the Marat expresses, in addition, that native simplicity that children possess and that science requires of the wise. Both are similar images. Momus and Hermes carry the same instrument, sign revealer of Mercury. Trace a circle at the upper end of a vertical line, add to the circle two horns, and you will have the graphic secret used by the alchemists of the Middle Ages to designate their mercurial matter. Now, this scheme, which reproduces quite faithfully both the Marat and the Caduceus, was known in antiquity, it was discovered engraved on a Punic stella from Lilibium. In short, the Marat of the Fools appears to be a Caduceus, an esotericism more transparent than the rod with serpents, surmounted by a winged Pitassos. Its name, diminutive of Mara, Little Mother, according to some, or of Marie, the universal mother, according to others, outlines the feminine nature and the virtue of the generatrix of the hermetic Mercury, mother and nurse of our king. 
less evocative is the caduceus, which retains, in the Greek language, the meaning of announcer. The words, Greek words for herald and rooster, both mark the herald or public crier, only their common root, Greek word for rooster, the rooster, because this bird announces the daybreak and light, the dawn, expresses one of the qualities of the secret living silver. That is the reason why the rooster, herald of the sun, was dedicated to the god Mercury and is featured on our church steeples. If nothing in the bar-relief of Thiers reminds us of this bird, one cannot, however, deny that it is hidden under the vocabulary of the caduceus, which our description of the image holds in both hands. Less evocative is the caduceus, which retains, in the Greek language, the sense of announcer. The words kappa eta rho kappa epsilon iota omicron nu, karakayan, and kappa rho upsilon xi, carux, caduceus, both mark the herald or public crier, only their common root, kappa rho upsilon xi, carux, the cock, because this bird announces the break of day and the light, the dawn, expresses one of the qualities of the secret living silver. That is why the cock, herald of the sun, was dedicated to the god Mercury and figures on our church steeples. If nothing, in the bar leaf of Thiers, reminds us of this bird, one cannot deny however that it is hidden under the vocabulary of the caduceus, that our national genius holds in both hands. Less evocative is the caduceus, which retains, in the Greek language, the sense of an announcer. The words kappa eta rho kappa epsilon iota omicron nu, karakayan, and kappa rho upsilon xi, carax, caduceus, both mark the herald or public crier, only, their common root, kappa rho upsilon xi, carax, the rooster, because this bird announces the break of day and the light, dawn, expresses one of the qualities of the living silver secret. That is why the rooster, the herald of the sun, was dedicated to the god Mercury and features on our church steeples. If nothing in the bar-relief of Thiers recalls this bird, one cannot deny however that it is hidden under the vocabulary of the caduceus, which is held in both hands by our national genius. For the staff or scepter that the officers of heraldry called caduceus was the same as Hermes's staff. It is moreover known that the staff attributes to the heralds the power to raise, in sign of victory or happy event, certain erect rods, called joyous mounts, in commemorative ceremonies. These were sorts of simple tumuli or mounds of stones, mounds of joy. The wild man thus appears to us as at the same time the representative of nature, and the mystic herald, the mercurial worker, whose high achievement on the mount of joy, sign revealing his material victory. And if this king of arms, this triumphant figure, prefers the humble fawn's tunic to the opulent dalmatic of the heralds, it is in the design to show to others the right path that he himself has taken, the prudent simplicity that he has observed, the indifference he manifests towards earthly goods and worldly glory. Beside a subject of such grand appearance, the small characters that accompany him have only a very effaced role, one would however be wrong to neglect their study. No detail is superfluous in iconography hermetic, and these humble depositories of arcana, modest images of the Larry's ancestral, deserve to be questioned, examined with care. It is part of their decorative aim, with the charitable intention of enlightening those who see them, that they have been placed there. As far as we are concerned, we have never regretted having devoted too much time and attention to the symbols of this kind. Often, they have brought us the solution of hieroglyphs abstruse and, in the application, the success we were looking for in vain without the help of their teaching. The figurines, carved under their dais and supported by rotting capitals, number five, Four of them wear the philosopher's cloak, which they hold apart to show the different emblems of their charge. The one furthest from the wood man stands in the corner formed by the return angle of a modern niche, Gothic style, which shelters behind its glass a statuette of the Virgin. It is a very hairy man, with a long beard, who holds in his left hand a book and grips in the right the shaft of a spike or a lance. These attributes, very suggestive, formally designate the two materials, active and passive, whose mutual reaction provides, at the end of the philosophical combat, the first substance of the work. Certain authors, Nicolas Flamel and Basile Valentin in particular, have given to these elements the epithet conventional of dragons, the dragon celeste, which they represent winged, characterizes the volatile body, the dragon terrestre, wingless, designates the corporeal. Of these two dragons on the metallic principles, first fixed, of these two dragons I have spoken in the summary on allegory, that the enemy would inflame by his art of air an enemy and that then, if one were careful, one would see by the air of venomous and foul-smelling smoke, two worse by fire and poison than the envenomed head of a serpent and a Babylonian dragon. Generally, and when they speak only of the dragon, it is the volatile that the philosophers envision. It is he whom they recommend to kill, by piercing it with a lance, 
and this operation makes them the subject of numerous fables, of varied allegories. The agent is veiled under different names, of which the most common seems to be Mars, Mart, Marcel, Michel, Georges, etc., and these knights of the sacred art, after an ardent struggle from which they always emerge victorious, open, in the flank of the mythic serpent, a large wound from which flows a black blood, thick and viscous. Such is the secret truth that proclaims, from the height of his wooden chair, the secular herald, inert and mute, nailed to the body of his old logic. The second character is more discreet and more reserved, he lifts a corner of his cape with his hand, but this gesture is of no avail, he holds a large closed book that he presses against his belt. We will talk about it soon. To this one succeeds a knight of energetic attitude, who grips the handle of his estoc, necessary weapon, which he will use to remove life from the terrestrial and flying lion, or griffin, a mercurial hieroglyph that we have studied on the manner of Lisieux. We find here the exposition of an essential operation, that of the fixation of the volatile mercurial emblematic of partial sublimation in fixed sulfur. The red lion blood of Basile Valentine is made of the blood of the green lion, because both are born from the same matter. It is worth noting that there are a few different versions in the parables that serve the authors to describe this work, most, in fact, are used to represent the fight of the knight and the lion, as one can see at the castle of Cousy, tympanum of the gate of the dungeon. Regarding the following figurine, we would not know how to give an exact interpretation. Unfortunately, it is mutilated, and we do not know which emblems it presented in its hands today. Only the symbolic procession of the wood man, this young woman in blue, wide open, haloed, meditative, displays a distinctly religious air, which could probably represent a virgin. In this case, we would lean towards this hypothesis, and nothing allows us to develop the argument further. We will therefore pass over this graceful motif, regretting that it is incomplete, to study the last of the figures, the pilgrim. Our traveler, without a doubt, has traveled a long way, yet, his smile says enough about how joyful and satisfied he is to have fulfilled his vow. For the empty wallet, the staff without a gourd indicate that this good son of the Auvergne no longer has to worry about drinking or eating. Moreover, the shell fixed to the hat, a special sign of the pilgrims of San Jacques, proves that he comes straight from Compostela. It reports that the indefatigable walker, the open book, a book adorned with beautiful images that Flamel could not explain, that mysterious revelation now allows him to translate and put into action. This book, although very common, that everyone can easily acquire, cannot however be opened, that is to say, understood, without prior revelation. God alone, through the intercession of Monsieur Saint Jacques, only grants it to those whom he deems worthy of the indispensable light. It is the book of the Apocalypse, with pages sealed by seven seals, the initiatory book that our ancestors charged with exposing the high truths presents us. Saint James, disciple of the Savior, never leaves it, with the staff and the shell, he possesses the attributes necessary for the pilgrimage. It is the hidden teaching of the pilgrims of the great work. This is the secret, the one that philosophers do not reveal and that they keep under the enigmatic expression of the Chemin de Saint-Jacques. This pilgrimage, all alchemists are obliged to undertake it. At least symbolically, for it is a symbolic journey, and the one who draws real profit can never, even in one instant, leave the laboratory. He must constantly stir the vase, the matter and the fire. He must, day and night, remain on the breach. Compostela, emblematic city, is not situated on Spanish soil, but in the very land of the philosophical subject. A rough, arduous road, full of the unexpected and danger, a long and tiring route but the one by which the potential becomes actual and the occult manifest. It is this preparation that the sages have veiled under the allegory of the pilgrimage of Compostela. Our Mercury, as we believe we have said, is this pilgrim, this traveler to which Michael Meyer has dedicated one of his best treatises. Now, using the dry way, represented by the shaman terrester he follows, from departure, our traveler, by persevering in a work that seemed futile and latent, transforms into activity what was only in power. The operation is completed when an etoile brillante, formed from rays emanating from a single center, prototype of the great roses of our Gothic cathedrals appears on the surface. This is the certain sign that the pilgrim has arrived mystically at the end of his journey. It is the journey, a real benediction here upon the holy term of Saint Jacques, confirmed by the luminous imprint that was said to shine, they say, above the apostle's tomb. The humble and common shell he wore on his skin has turned into a bright star, haloed with light, pure matter, whose hermetic star consecrates perfection. It is now our compost, the blessed water of Compostela, lot, compostum, which has received, post Stella, after the star, the posse des sages, the power of the sages, 
the alabastrum, gr, lambda beta alpha sigma tau rho omicron nu, la, alabastrum, and the bud bursting from the fleur de sapiens, rosa hermetica. From Compostela, the return can be made either by the same route, following a different itinerary, or by the humid or maritime route, the only one that the authors mention in their works. In this case, Trevisan, in the Sange Verde, presents the practice in the traditional form of the transported artisan, during his sleep, on a heavenly land, populated with unknown inhabitants living in the middle of a marvelous fluorescence. Each author chooses the theme that pleases him and develops it according to his fantasy. The cosmopolite takes up the dialogues familiar to the medieval era and is inspired by Jean de Mung. More modern, Siliani conceals the preparation of Mercury under the fiction of a nymph, who guides and directs him in this labor. As for Nicolas Flamel, he deviates from the beaten paths and consecrated fables, more original if not clearer. He prefers to disguise himself under the traits of the subject of the sages and leave to those who will know how to understand it this autobiographical philosophy, revelatory but assumed. All of Flamel's effigies represent him in the porch of the church. Saint Jacques La Boucherie thus is the one on the porch of the church Saint Genevieve des Ardents. It is in the same attire that he had himself painted on the arch of the Cemetery of the Innocents. The Dictionnaire Historique by Louis Murray cites a painted portrait of him by Nicolas Flamel, which was seen on display in the time of Borel, that is to say around 1650, at Mr. de Ardres, doctor. There again, the adept had donned the costume he was particularly fond of. A peculiar detail, his bonnet was of three colors, black, white, red, colors of the three principal phases of the work. By imposing this symbolic formula on the statuaries and painters, Flamel the alchemist disguises the bourgeois personality of Flamel the writer under that of Saint Jacques Le Majeur, hieroglyph of the secret Mercury. These images no longer exist today, but we can have a fairly accurate idea of them by the statues of the Apostle, executed in the same epoch. A masterful work of the 14th century, belonging to the Abbey of Westminster, shows a Saint Jacques dressed in a cloak, the beret on the side, topped with a large hat adorned with the shell. He holds in his left hand a closed book, wrapped in a cover forming a case, alone, the staff, on which he leaned with the right hand, has disappeared, pl. 20. This closed book, a telling symbol of the subject that the alchemists use and that they take with them at the start, is the one with which the second character of the wood man is so preoccupied, it is the book that he holds closed, permitting its recognition, to appreciate its virtue and the object. The famous manuscript of Abraham the Jew, from which Flamel takes an exemplary model, is a work of the same order and of a comparable quality. Thus, the fiction, substituting for reality, takes shape and asserts itself in the journey to Compostela. We know how sparing the adept shows himself with information about his journey. He carries out the journey in a single bound, writes he, thus on this same path, the Montjoie meant to Saint-Jacques, on the road and as far as I arrived, I accomplished my vow. There, yes, without any great deviation, a simple expression. No itinerary, a description reduced to its most laconic expression on the course of the journey, an incident, not the slightest hint about the landscape that he crossed. The English pass over the Manjwa, which the adept avoided, a single cabalistic term, then all the advice of the blessed stage, long awaited, used purposefully. The book is finally open, the joyous mount long hoped for, where the hermetic star shines, the material has undergone a first prime ducal the living astral beef argent has detached itself. No ordinary mercury philosophical, but the vulgar do not learn anything more. The followed route is indeed held secret. The arrival at Compostela implies the acquisition of the star. But the philosophical subject must imperatively acquire the star. Our mercury must rise too impure to undergo maturation. Required purity, through a series of sublimations to the supreme degree of special substance, before being partially consolidated by the aid of a foreign matter. To initiate his reader to these operations, Flamel recounts an adventure on the sands of Boulogne, which we identify with the indispensable mediator. He put him in relation with a Jewish rabbi, Master Canches, a man very learned in sublime sciences. Our three characters thus have their respective roles perfectly established. Flamel, we have said, represents the philosophical Mercury. His very name speaks as a pseudonym expressly chosen. Nicholas, in Greek New Iota Kappa Lambda Alpha Omicron Sigma, signifies conqueror of the stone, from New Kappa Eta, victory, and Lambda Omicron Sigma, stone, rock. Flamel approaches the Latin flama, flame or fire, expressing the igneous and coagulating virtue that the prepared matter possesses, virtue that allows him to fight against the ardor of the fire, to feed on it and to triumph. 
The merchant holds the place of intermediary in the sublimation, which requires a violent fire. In this case, Epsilon Mu Pi Omicron Rho Omicron Sigma, Imporos, Merchant, is set for Lambda Eta, Heil, which is worked through fire. This is our secret fire, called Vulcan by the author of the Ancien Guerre des Chevaliers. Master Canches, whom Flamel presents to us as his initiator, personifies white sulfur, principle of coagulation and desiccation. This name comes from the Greek Xi Eta Rho Sigma, dry, arid, from the root Xi Eta Rho Alpha Nu Omega, to dry, to desiccate, words whose meaning expresses the astringent quality that the ancients attribute to the philosopher sulfur. The esotericism is completed by the Latin word candens, which indicates that which is white, of a pure, bright white, obtained by fire, which is burning and inflamed. One could not better characterize, in a word, the sulfur on the physico-chemical plane, and the initiated or cather in the philosophical domain. Flamel and Master Canches, allied by an unbreakable friendship, will now travel together. The mercury, sublimated, shows its fixed part, and this sulfurous base marks the first stage of coagulation. The intermediary has been abandoned or disappears, it will no longer be questioned henceforth. The three are now reduced to two, sulfur and mercury, which realize what has been agreed to call the philosophical amalgam, a simple chemical combination not yet radical. It is here that the cooking, an operation charged with ensuring at the post, newly formed, the indissoluble and irreducible union of its elements, and their complete transformation into fixed red sulfur, medicine of the first order according to Gaber. The two friends agree to make their return by sea, instead of borrowing the terrestrial route. Flamel does not tell us the reasons for this resolution, he is content to submit it to the assessment of the investigators. Whatever the case may be, the second part of the journey is long, dangerous, uncertain and vain, says an anonymous author, if the slightest error is made. Certainly, in our opinion, the dry route would be preferable, but we do not have the choice. Siliani warns his reader that he does not describe the humid route, full of difficulties and unforeseen events, only by duty. Our adept judge is the same, and we must respect his will. It is well known that a large number of sailors, inexperienced, have been shipwrecked on their first crossing. One must always be vigilant in the orientation of the ship, maneuver with prudence, fear the sudden gusts of wind, anticipate the storm, stay on the alert, avoid the Charybdis whirlpool and the Scylla reef, fight ceaselessly, night and day, against the violence of the flows. It is not such a small task to direct the hermetic ship, and Master Canches, whom we suspect that Master Canches, a sailor of great repute and Flamel's navigator, was to serve as pilot and guide on the rough sea of sulfur, which resists energetically the assaults of the mercurial humidity. It is indeed the argument which finishes, ultimately, by yielding to the blows of the dry route. Thanks to a companion from Orléans, Orléans, the gold is there. Flamel could disembark safe and sound on terra firma, where the symbolic journey of the sea voyage ends at the great vomismets. Master Canches, the guide, unfortunate, was supposed to have led him there. He himself should have been buried there, in the church of Saint Croix and the waters. With his friend, these vomismets were the goal he had sought so much for, death, Mortifications and petrifications of sulfur are the goal and purpose of his desires. Arriving at this phase, the indices of its dissolution, the aspect of a brown liquid that takes, the work takes on the sanguine color, thick and peppered with pepper, the text says, and each day darkens a bit more, the bruising continues. When the black of constancy becomes piteous, then the mercury is putrefied. Once the black reaches its maximum intensity, the appearance of the fixed elements is accomplished and their union realized. Then the vessel becomes firm in its vast scope and up to the moment when the solid mass crumbles and falls apart like charcoal. Then you will see, writes an anonymous author, a remarkable, composite earth, and the entire land dried up, a curious rest arrives, the winds cease and all things enter into the repose. The great shadows of the eclipse of the sun and moon disappear, no light shines on the earth, and the stellar material has vanished. This is why Flamel relates the death of his companion having suffered the dislocation of his parts by a sort of crucifixion, that his burial placed under the invocation and the sign of the Holy Cross. As for us, at least, it's a funereal eulogy, quite paradoxical, that our poor Notre Dame apothecary praises, God, have, mercy on my soul, he cries, for I die a Christian death. Without doubt, it was seen that the fictitious supplication endured by his philosophical companion. These are, studied in the very order of the narrative, the reports, too eloquent to be dismissed as mere coincidences, which have contributed to establishing our conviction. These singular and precise concordances demonstrate that the pilgrimage of Flamel is a pure allegory, 
A very clever and very ingenious fiction of the alchemical labor to which this charitable and learned man had devoted himself. We now have to talk about, despite the imaginary beliefs, the cause behind the creation of the mysterious work, of this Libra which supposedly contains the esoteric truths he is charged with revealing. Despite the opinion of certain bibliophiles, we confess that it has always been impossible for us to believe in the reality of the Libra d'Abra Amla Juif, nor in what its happy owner reports in his Histoire des Figures Hieroglyphics. In our opinion, this avid researcher, as unknown as the sought-after manuscript, was nothing more than an inventive creation of the great adept, destined, like the precedent, to instruct the disciples of Hermes. This is a précy of characters that distinguish the prime matter of the work, as well as the properties it acquires through its preparation. We will enter, for this purpose, into some detailed explanations to justify our thesis which provides useful indications to the amateurs of the sacred art. Faithful to the task that we have imposed on ourselves, we limit ourselves to a brief explanation of important points of practice, taking care to substitute new figures for those we will have unveiled. These are certain things, positive and true teachings, seen by our eyes, touched a thousand times by our hands, sincerely described, in order to return to the simple and natural way that misleads the Iran of Abraham. The legendary work of Abraham is only known to us by the description that Nicholas Flamel left in his famous treatise. It is this sole account, which includes a supposed copy of the title, that our bibliographical documentation is limited to. According to the testimony of Albert Poisson, Cardinal Richelieu would have had in his possession. It is said that he seized the papers of a certain Dubois, hanged after being tortured, who wrongly claimed to be the last descendant of Flamel. However, nothing proves that Dubois inherited the unique manuscript, and even less that Richelieu took possession of it, since the book has never been signaled among the papers of Flamel. Sometimes, far from here, in the depths of the Mercure de Soie distant, one sees copies of the Liber d'Abraham. These, in very small number, present no rapport with each other, and are found scattered in some private libraries. Those we know are only in the reconstruction attempts after Flamel. These reports, when read in French, very much reflect Flamel's style. In the entirety of the hieroglyphic figures, faithfully reproduced, we find the same diversity, the same distance from one another but they serve as a guide to the translation ipso facto of their origin, the hermetic principles that they reveal in clear text, in a sophisticated language, or rather, in the questions that they provoke, written in beautiful and very intelligible Latin, to the point where one wonders how far it is Flamel who excels in precision, refusing to transmit the smallest Latin extract to posterity. Consequently, no correspondence can exist between the original he pretends not to have and the apocryphal copies that we signal. As for the images that illustrate Flamel's work, drawn and painted also from the descriptions of the alchemical French Bible, they currently form part of the French alchemical fund of the Arsenal Library. In summary, both for the text and the figures, one must simply respect what Flamel left. In these attempts at reconstruction, no bibliographer has ever been able to claim pure invention. Finally, as one finds oneself materially unable to discover the original, and one finds oneself faced with the material impossibility of linking the relation of a non-existent and supposed work. The analysis of Nicolas Flamel's text, moreover, reserves other surprises. Here is first the passage of the hieroglyphic figures which I quickly respond to, among alchemists and bibliophiles, in almost certainty of the reality of the said book of Abraham the Jew. I, Nicolas Flamel, writer, as well as after the death of my parents I earned my living in our art of writing, making inventions, drawing up accounts and arresting the expenses of the tutors and minors, it fell into my hands, for the sum of two florins, a book very old and very large, there is not a single page or parchment, like those in the shops, but only made of the finest bark, as it seemed to me, of tender shoots. Its cover was of well-beaten copper, all engraved with letters or strange figures. As for me, I believe they could well be characters of the Greek or some other similar ancient language. As much as I do not know the Greek language and I know very well that we understand a little, as for my Latin letters or Gaulish, because we do not understand them at all. When it comes to the title of the book, it is not found in any known language but in the, in it, its bark leaves were engraved, and of a very large industry, written with an iron point in beautiful and very neat colored Latin letters. It contained three times seven leaflets. Do we need to underline already the strangeness of a work made up of such elements? Its originality borders on the bizarre almost to the point of extravagance, the volume. Very large, thus resembles those albums of Italian form, containing large reproductions of landscapes, architectural etc., commonly presented in our days, it is said, gilded, although its cover is copper, 
which is not clearly explained. Let's move on. The leaflets are of tree bark. Flamel undoubtedly meant to designate papyrus, which would give the book a respectable antiquity. But these barks, instead of being written or painted directly, are engraved with a point before their coloration. We will not make comparisons now. How did he manage to use the iron stylus which should have served Abraham was in iron, rather than wood or ivory? This is an enigma that is as indecipherable as the other. The legendary rabbi writing, in Latin, a treatise dedicated to his co-religionists, Jews like him. Why did he make use of Latin, the common scientific language of the Middle Ages? He could have dispensed with it by using the Hebrew language, less widespread, to defy the anathema and cry maranatha on those who tried to reduce the Jewish faith. Despite the assurance of Flamel, this old manuscript, one could think of everything, was indeed executed when he acquired it. Indeed, Abraham did not want to deliver his text except to come to the aid of the sons of Israel, persecuted at the time where the future adept passed on his text, to the race of Jews, for the love of God dispersed among the Gauls. Hello, cries the Levite, prince, priest and astrologer, at the beginning of this grimoire. Thus, at the beginning of this grimoire, the great master Abraham, doctor and luminary of Israel, if we take literally the writings for an emeritus mystic and his work, fraudulently archaic, devoid of authenticity, as incapable of enduring archaic criticism. But, if we consider that the book and the author have never had any existence except in the fertile imagination of Nicholas Flamel, we must think that all these things, so diverse and so singular, contain a mysterious meaning that is important to discover. Let's begin the analysis by the presumed author of the fictitious grimoire, who is Abraham, the patriarch par excellence, in Greek pi alpha tau rho iota rho chi eta sigma is the first author of the family, from the roots pi alpha tau rho, father, and rho chi, beginning, principle, origin, source, foundation. The Latin name Abraham, which the Bible gives to the venerable ancestor of the Hebrews, signifies father of a multitude. So, he is therefore the first author of created things. The book of Abraham, therefore, is the region of the nature, as this book is dedicated, according to Flamel, to the prince, and science which studies the evolution of mineral bodies, we learn that he treats of the original metallic matter, base and foundation of the sacred art. Flamel bought this book for the sum of two florins, which means that the overall price of the materials and combustibles necessary for the work was estimated at two florins in the 14th century. The raw material in sufficient quantity, was worth ten souls. Philolethes, the true Philolethi, as you will see in 1645, carries the price of three florins per essential, does not exceed the price of three ducats in gold. Moreover, the expense of making the water barely exceeds two crowns per pound. The volume, gilded, very old and very large, does not resemble other ordinary books, without a doubt because it was made and written by the master himself. We will recall its high antiquity and the high antiquity of the hermetic subject. I will say therefore, says an anonymous author, that the matter from which the philosopher's stone was made was as soon made as man, and it is called philosophical earth. But no one knows it, except the true philosophers, who are the children of the art. Although this book, little known, is very common, it contains many things and contains great hidden truths. Flamel is right to say that it is large, in fact, the Latin largus means abundant, rich, copious, derived from the Greek lambda rho gamma omicron sigma, largos, generous, and pi lambda alpha tau sigma, platus, wide, vast. The sense of pi lambda alpha tau sigma, platus, derived from pi lambda alpha tau sigma, wide, has also the sense of spread out, exposed to all eyes. This is how we can better define the universality of the wise men's subject. Following his description, our writer thinks that the book of Abraham was made of the finest barks of tender shoots, at least it seems so. Flamel does not seem very affirmative, and for good reason, he knows very well that, with very rare exceptions, parchment has replaced, for three centuries, papyrus in Egypt. And although we cannot paraphrase this laconic expression, we must recognize that it is precisely where the author speaks most clearly. A shrub is a small tree, just as a mineral is a young metal. The bark or gang, which serves as a wrapper for this mineral, allows man to identify it with certainty, thanks to the external characteristics with which it is coated. We have already insisted on the name that the ancients gave to their material, which they called Liber, the book. Now, this mineral presents a particular configuration. The crystalline blades which form its texture are, as in mica, superimposed in the manner of the leaves of a book. Its exterior appearance has earned it the epithet of leprous, and that of dragon covered with scales, because its gang is, scaly, unpleasant and rough to the touch. A simple piece of advice on this subject, 
Choose preferably the samples whose scales are the largest and the most pronounced. Its cover was of well-beaten copper, all engraved with strange letters or figures. The scales often take on a coloration pale like copper, sometimes red as copper. In all these cases, its scales appear covered with intertwined liniments, having the appearance of bizarre, varied, and ill-defined signs. We have more than once noted the obvious contrast that exists between the gilded book and its copper binding, for there can be no question in this place of its internal structure. It is likely that the adept wants to draw attention, on one hand, to the metallic specification of the substance depicted by his book, and on the other hand, to the fact that this mineral has the ability to partially transmute itself on the surface. This property is indicated by Philolethes, in his commentary on Ripley's epistle addressed to King Edward IV, without employing the transmutatory elixir, he says when speaking of our subject, I know how to easily extract gold and silver, which can be certified by those who have seen it as well as I. This operation is not to be advised, for it deprives it of all value for the work, but we can assure that the philosophical matter truly contains the gold of the wise, or imperfect, white and raw, compared to the precious metal, far superior to gold even if we do not consider the hermetic labor. Despite its humble copper cover with engraved scales, it is therefore truly a gilded book, a book of gold like that of Abraham the Jew, and the famous golden booklet which Bernard of Trebizond speaks of in his Par of All. Moreover, it would seem that Nicolas Flamel understood what confusion could arise, in the reader's mind, from this duality of meaning when he writes in the same treatise, let no one blame me if they do not hear me, for, he will be more blameworthy than I am, as not being initiated into these sacred and secret interpretations, which are the key to unlocking the doors of all sciences, being an agent, which is the key to the more subtle conceptions of philosophers, notwithstanding if he wants to hear only for those who know these very envious principles, which are never found in any book. Finally, the author of the hieroglyphic figures finishes his description by saying, as for the inside, its leaves of bark were engraved with very great industry, written with an iron point. Here, it is not the physical aspect of the preparation that is in question, but the importance of the subject itself. Revealing a secret of this importance would be no small task, as we have seen, but even more so. Also, will we not seek the limits that are imposed on us, to comment in clear language the phrase that we have made so far, a la flamel. We will be content to draw the attention and very allegorical dress of the gen, whose secret property changes the nature on this pointed magnet, separates, orders, purifies, and assembles the elements of our mineral. To succeed in this operation, one must be well acquainted with the sympathies of the bodies, possess a great deal of skill, show proof of great industry, as adept teaches us in the resolution of the difficulty, we will bring some relief to the artist's understanding. But, to remind him, we will point out that in the primitive language of this archaic Greek, all words containing the diphthong phi theta, pH must be considered. Phi theta, pH has remained, in the cabal phonetics, the sonorous expression consecrated to active light, to the incarnated spirit, to the corporeal manifestation whether hidden or revealed. Phi theta, pH contraction of phi omicron sigma, phaus, is the birth of light, spring, and morning, the commencement, the raising of the day, dawn, air, in Greek apostrophe rho, air, is the support, the vehicle of light. It is by the vibration of the air that the dark clouds, the emanations of the sun, become luminous. Ether in the sky alpha theta rho, ether, is the place of pure clarity. Among metallic bodies, the one that takes the strongest proportion of fire, or latent light, is iron sigma delta eta rho omicron sigma, sideros. It is known with what ease one can extract it, by shock or friction, fire from under the form of brilliant sparkles. This is the active fire that promotes the dormant and passive fire, which has the power to modify the cold and sterile complexion, by rendering it productive. This is the one the sages call green lion, wild and fierce lion, cabalistically lambda omega nu phi theta, leon pHTH, which is quite suggestive and spares us from insisting further. We have, in a previous work, indicated the fight against the immutable law, there the bodies are engaged in combat, about a bar-relief we saw at the Notre Dame. De Paris, another translation of the combat is depicted on the facade of a wooden house, built in the 16th century, in La Ferté Bernard, Sartre. There we find, in turn, the man at the vat, the pilgrim, familiar images in the eyes of the common people during the Middle Ages, to the decoration in an applied formula, towards modest houses, and without pretension. We also see more modest lodgings, as well as the siren, emblem of united and pacified natures, the meaning of which is commented on elsewhere. But what interests us most, 
because the subject lends itself to our analysis. Are these two marmosets, grimacing and contorted sculptures carved at the very extremities of the cornice, on the second floor, PL, 21 and 22, too far from one another to reach out their hands, they try to satisfy their native aversion by throwing stones. These grotesques have the same hermetic meaning as the children of the porch of Notre Dame. They are frenetically fighting and trying to stone each other. But the indication of opposite tendencies provided by the city of Paris refers only to the aggressive character of the different sexes among young pugilists. It is only the aggressive nature of different sex that appears on the Sartheois house. Two men, similar in appearance and costume, represent, one the mineral body, the other the metallic body. This external similitude approaches more the fiction of physical reality but resolutely moves away from the operatory esotericism. If the reader wants to understand what we wish to teach, he will find without pain, in the materials these symbolic expressions of the combat of birds, the secret materials whose reciprocal destruction produces the first portion of the work. These bodies are the two dragons of Nicolas Flamel, the eagle and the lion of Basil Valentine, the lover and the steel of Philolethe and Cosmopolite. As for the operation by which the artist inserts into the philosophical subject the fiery agent that is the animator, the ancients described it under the allegory of the combat of the eagle and the lion, or of the two natures, one volatile, the other fixed. The church has veiled it in dogma, all spiritual and rigorously true, of the visitation. At the end of this artifice, the book, open, shows its leaves of engraved bark. It then appears, for the amazement of the eyes and the joy of the soul, clothed with admirable signs that manifest its change of constitution. Prostrate yourselves, magi of the Orient, and you, doctors of the law, bow down, sovereign princes of the Persians, of the Arabs and of the look, adore, and be silent, for you will not comprehend. It is there, the divine work, supernatural, ineffable, into which no mortal shall penetrate the mystery. In the silent nocturnal firmament, shines a single star, an immense, resplendent astral body composed of all the celestial stars, your luminous guide and the beacon of universal wisdom. Behold, the Virgin and Jesus rest, calm and serene, under the palm tree of Egypt. A new sun radiates at the center of the osier cradle, the mystical basket once carried by the Sistophores of Bacchus, the priestesses of Isis, the Ichthus of the Christian catacombs. The ancient prophecy is finally realized. O miracle! God, master of the universe, incarnates for the salvation of the world and is born, on the earth of men, in the frail form of a tiny child.